welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is an action-packed and fear-packed story. Um, quite a long one, guys, so I'm going to do this in two parts. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help build our channel and our community further. It really does help. This is a first story from the brand new author that I'm working with called Wayne Harbinson. A uh, huge thank you, Wayne, for supporting myself and, uh, and contributing to the show as well. And so, without further ado, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Hunters Hunted. Let's get straight into that. Hunt number 16. Hunt Masters, redacted. Number of Hunt Judges, 2. Judges, redacted. Date of Hunt, 1978052629. Memorial Day Weekend. Number of Specimens, 2. Specimens. Delta, Mother, Golf, Yankee, dash 122. Serial. Delta, Mother, Golf Yankee, 1972022215, and Golf Golf Whiskey, dash 127, Serial, Golf Golf Whiskey, dash 2A, 1976-1225, Location of Hunt, Pike County, Kentucky, Purpose of Hunt, to compare and contrast the hunting efforts, effectiveness, and techniques of two different species of cryptid known colloquially as Dogman and Gugwe. Hunt Master's Notes Specimens will be introduced on opposite ends of the lake. Being as this is an open wilderness with few inhabitants, both specimens will be constantly monitored to make sure they don't leave the area surrounding a lake or stray into the few settlements located nearby. Only individuals actually in the forest around the lake will be counted as legitimate kills. Local law enforcement and wildlife management have been distracted by a rescue drill two counties north. May 1978 Jim Grant was a good man and he took his responsibilities for his family and his community seriously. Case in point was the little escape he planned for his son and several of his teammates on the junior high football team. He along with Tanner Lee, the father of another player, were riding a herd of half a dozen boys on the cusp of manhood for a week-long camping trip. Well, it was sort of a camping trip. For part of the time, he and Tanner were teaching the boys about the building techniques of a century past as they constructed a primitive cabin on the shores of the lake in southeastern Kentucky. Even though they were well into the summer at home, the air here, especially the night air, was on the chilly side for the families that were raised on the Gulf Coast of Alabama. Travelling nearby 12 hours across four states with half a dozen rowdy boys in the back of a brand new 1978 model RV had been a challenge, but Jim had to admit that he had enjoyed even that part of the trip, especially since Tanner was more than happy to help with the driving, the last two hours of which had been on barely usable mountain roads deep in the forest surrounding the lake. If they'd gotten stuck, they were a couple of days walk back to the nearest phone. It was a good thing he had an old Willis Jeep towed behind the GMC Swinger for situations like that. He looked after his boys. Stepping out of the RV, he looked around at the pop-up tents the boys were sharing. He was surprised to see the youngest boy, Lance McKnight, was coming up the trail from the lake. A fishing rod in hand and what looked like a stringer full of white bass, already gutted and descowled. Smiling as he looked past the boy and could see the mist rising from the lake and from the verdant mountains on the other side of it, he asked, What you got there, Lance? White bass, sir, the boy said politely. Got up just before sunrise and went down to that outcropping we were swimming in off yesterday. Lots of structure in the water there, so I figured with the water quiet, the fish, would use it for cover. <laughs> Looks like you were right, Jim said, smiling at the boy. He was one of the newer members of the team, having transferred him from a school in the northern portion of the state. He had a rough year last year, managing to fight off an armed robber in his mum's house. 
and two bear attacks at his dad's place. See, shadows on the road not taken for details. But by the end of the season, he had more than proved his worth to the team. The boy had an arm on him like Namath, it was quick and wily as a fox in a pocket, and out of the pocket he could almost lose any defender. What were you using as bait? White rooster towel, sir, the boy replied. Thought we could have some fish along with Mr. Lee's eggs and biscuits. Hmm, sounds good, Jim told him. There's coffee in the pot if you're interested. Thank you, sir, the boy replied, taking a fish to the RV. Shaking his head, he couldn't get past how polite and put together that kid was for a 14-year-old, especially considering his recent ordeals. Then, turning to the tents, he started yelling, Up and at him, boys! Time to get up and police the campground. Breakfast should be ready by the time you're done. Then, we've got to get to work. Today, you learn how to shape a log with a broad axe. The plan was for the boys to help build the cabin with traditional tools during the morning, and then after lunch, the day was theirs to explore the local woods and lake. In the end, he got help with his and Bobby's camping cabin, and the boys got two weeks of vacation in the woods and learned some useful skills. Grumbling, five teenage boys crawled from their tents, stretched, yawned. Then, rubbing their sleep from their eyes, they each found a tree at the edge of the camp and relieved themselves. It didn't take long for six boys to get the place cleaned up and everything ready for the day. Jim noted that the McKnight boy was carrying a mug of steaming coffee around the campsite as he helped his teammates. Where'd you go this morning? Jeff, Jim's son, asked. Fishing, Lance replied. I like to fish. Bobby smiled and said, Man, you never look or act like an expert. I warned you about trying to put people in boxes. Everybody has things that surprise you. That's what makes life interesting, Lance told him. Jim smiled and remembered what Coach Harris had said about the transfer student. Sometimes he sounds a hell of a lot older than he is. The fish for breakfast was a welcome surprise, and Tanner did a good job of fixing them. After clean-up, they all hiked the quarter mile to the cabin and got to work. The logs had already been cut to length and stacked. Jim showed Paul, Jeff and Lance how to use the broad axe to hew the logs and shape two sides into a flat surface to better fit against the logs above and below. After making sure they knew what and how to do it, he turned to the boys that were learning to use the splitting axe to cut some of the logs lengthwise. Before long, they were all working hard, and Jim was surprised that the Hewin team was keeping up with him and Tanner, who were putting the logs into their places. By the time lunch whistle sounded, six boys and two men, all gleaming with summer sweat, called it quits and knocked off for the day. After a lunch of bologna sandwiches, chips and Coca-Colas, the boys headed back to the outcropping of rocks to swim, while Jim and Tanner went back to the working on the cabin. As they reached the end of the trail to where the cabin was located, Tanner looked over to the hewn logs and said, Can't believe those boys got so much done. They had to have worked their little asses off. Jim nodded and picked up the split in maul and told him, It's good to see the boys with solid work ethic. Kind of rare these days. Turning back towards the cabin, a flash of movement in the tree line caught his attention, and for a second, Jim thought it might be a deer, but realised that they would be bedded down somewhere right now to avoid the noonday heat. What? Tanner asked. Jim shrugged. Oh, I thought I saw something. Light must be playing tricks on me. Too much soft living. Tanner teased him as he walked towards the back of the cabin. Let me find a tree and I'll be right back. Oh, now who's getting soft? Jim asked. Disappearing around the back of the thick log wall, Tanner started to say something. but was cut off mid-word. There was a wet thud against the back wall that shook the building. What was that? What'd you say? Tanner? He called. The silence was slowly replaced with the unnerving sound of flesh being torn and squished along with an audible growl. Hefting the maul in his hands, Jim headed in the direction his friend had disappeared. Suddenly, fear rose up from his gut to reach his very soul. It was like nothing he'd ever experienced before. It was pure malice and hatred directed towards him. This isn't funny. Tan? Round in the corner, Jim nearly lost control of his bladder at the sight that awaited him. Poor Tanner looked as if he'd been torn nearly in half. His crushed head was hanging in at an odd angle from his torso, which had been bent backwards and folded over his lower half, forming a horrible moor of organs, bones and flesh as blood spurted from his still beating heart. He was being held by some dark creature 
straight from the bowels of hell. It crouched over, burying its face into the cavern formed by Tanner's ribcage. Its long, bloody teeth tore out organs in long streams of flesh before it slurped them down like bloody oysters. The blood-covered face of the creature was clearly canine in form, not unlike some kind of giant wolf, complete with pointed ears. Amber eyes glowed with malice as it pulled back and saw Jim standing there. Dropping Tanner's body into the blood that had pulled at its feet, the creature stood up to its full height and its head cleared the wall of the cabin. It had a massive black fur-covered chest and thick neck and shoulders. They were like bowling balls and its arms seemed too long for its body and it ended in clawed hands. Yes, hands, not paws, and the claws on those hands were a good two inches long. Its torso was very human-like in shape and formed a neat triangle that dipped into its hips like that of a bodybuilder. Arnold Schwarzer something, the one who played Hercules in that bad movie Jim and Jeff had watched the other night. The legs folded forward and then bent back, as if the knees were turned backwards and it stood on long clawed toes. For a second, Jim stood there, his mind refusing to process what his senses were telling him. The squishing sound of Tanner's body broke Jim from his paralysis. Some part of Jim's brain that was more infra than ultra kicked into play as his body ruled out flight and chose instead to fight. If this thing would do this to Tanner, Jim shuddered to think what it could do to the boys. Screaming incoherently, Jim stepped into the monster, swinging the splitting maul at its head with everything he had in him. Momentarily surprised, the great beast stepped back and twisted its body as the maul missed its head and instead impacted on its side, about foot under its left arm. There was an audible sound of bone being split by the blade of the maul as it sunk into its haft. Howling once into the late afternoon air, the creature's arm dropped to cover the handle so that Jim couldn't get it free to use again. Its other arm lashed out at Jim's face, claws first. Ducking low to avoid the strike to his face, he found to see the clawed hand sweeping down and back, catching him in the shoulder and pulling him close to its body. Jim could feel his face suddenly impact the blood-soaked fur over hard muscle as the claws bit deep into his back and pulled him upward. It stank to high heaven, worse than even a skunk, twisting. In the grip of the creature's good arm, Jim grabbed at the handle with the maul and pulled it free as he felt those horribly massive teeth sink into his side. Fire and pain shot through his body as the dog-like face tore out huge chunks of Jim's flesh and organs. He felt a hard tug that pulled his kidney and part of his bladder from his body. And with the last vestiges of his strength, he let the head of the maul drop and then pulled it back to pendulum. It forward again into the juncture between the creature's legs. He felt the blade sinking deep just before the creature howled again in pain. Suddenly the world went sideways as he slammed into the wall. There was an explosion of light in his skull and the last thing that went through Jim Grant's mind was, who will look after the boys? After Action Judge's report, Judge redacted. Notes. Specimen's first kill full points. Specimen's second kill, 25% for being injured by the use of a splitting maul. Specimen's injuries are concerning as they could be life-threatening. Judge recommends having specimen recall to receive veterinary attention. Judge overruled under protest by Huntmaster. The scream that echoed off the mountains and lake were all too familiar to Lance McKnight. It was the sound he'd remember all of his life, the inhuman cry of the Gwinna, he didn't understand how it could be the same creature whose head he'd sliced off with his transformed arm last autumn. Surely it hadn't come to life again, but maybe it did. Mr Dubois mentioned that his ancestor, Captain Sheridan McNaughton, had raised it from the grave and set it to guard his plantation, Bon Travel, until a worthy heir returned. As the rest of his friends looked around to see from where the whale had come from, Lance had already pinpointed it as coming from the direction of the cabin they'd been helping to build earlier. Looking around to make sure none of the other boys were watching him, he jumped down from the rock they'd been climbing onto to leap off into the lake and hit the ground running towards the cabin. When he was out of sight of the rock, he poured on the speed until he burst from the trail into the clearing where the cabin sat. 
Something dark flashed into the woods to his left, and he turned to track the giant Gwynna as it disappeared into the forest. Making his way carefully around the corner of the cabin, he saw the mutilated bodies of the two men who were supposed to be in charge of this camping trip. He shuddered. The fun vacation he was hoping for had just turned into a mission, whether he liked it or not. And he had no way of contacting anyone at the Office of Arcane Investigations to get help. He turned around and started to head back to where the other boys were. When they came crashing down the trail he'd left. McKnight! What the hell? You took off like a bat out of hell, Bobby Lee said. Looking around, it was clear that the other boy was looking for his dad, or Mr. Grant. Where's dad? He asked. Lance shook his head, and then looked from Bobby over to Jeff. There's no good way to tell you this, and you're going to insist anyway, he said with a sigh. What are you talking about, McKnight? This more of that hippie philosophy crap? Jeff demanded. Lance breathed in deeply and looked to Peter, Paul and Tommy. You three don't have to see this. As a matter of fact, I'd warn you not to. But I know you're going to want to. So be it. He motioned to the back of the cabin with his head. Go ahead. Take a look. Just don't touch anything. That's what I found when I got here. Again, he looked at Peter, Paul and Tommy and said softly, You may want to keep close to Jeff and Bobby. What are you babbling about? Bobby asked, stalking to the back of the cabin. Jeff hot on his heels. The next instant was broken by twin wows of, Dad! The other three followed quickly to see what had happened. There was the sound of a scuffle as the other three boys dragged their friends from the grisly sight of their father's bodies. Lance hated that they had to see it, wished there was some way to protect them from seeing it, but knew that, without visual confirmation, they'd never accept that they were in danger. After Jeff and Tommy unchucked their cokes and bologna sandwiches while Lance kept watch, Jeff glared at him. What happened? I don't know, Lance half lied. This was what I found when I got here just a minute or two before you guys. You didn't see nothing? Jeff demanded. Lance shook his blonde head and told him, Nothing. But we need to get out of here. Go back down to the road and find a phone and uh, call the police. How? Jeff demanded. The jeep, Bobby said. Can anybody drive a jeep? Lance said quietly, I can drive a tractor. It's not that different. Gears are the same place, clutch works the same way. The other boys looked at each other and then at Lance. A mixture of fear, grief and queasiness spread across their faces. Lance realised that they were just moments from a complete breakdown and he didn't know if he had it in him to bring them back together afterward. Okay, let's head back. We can take the jeep that, to that little store about ten miles back we saw when we turned off onto the trail. He watched helplessly as the other boys looked over to the corner of the cabin. We can't leave them like that, Jeff protested. I know, Lance said, picking up a log under each arm and carrying them around the back. What are you doing? Bobby demanded. Covering them so animals can't get to them, Lance said as he built a lean-to against the side of the cabin with the logs, making a shelter for the bodies. It took about ten trips before it was built to his satisfaction. He didn't dare ask for the other boys' help. He would have to live with the images. But they shouldn't. For the first time since his 56-year-old self woke up in a 13-year-old body last year, the older version of Lance's mind was glad for the maturity as he was going to need it to keep them all alive. He was almost glad for it as he was for the witcheries this particular version of his 13-year-old self had. Protecting his family from the Gwynna that had attacked his home had been one thing. It had focused on him and, to a lesser extent, to his little brother Dale. This one had killed the only two legal adults on the trip. The stakes in this encounter had just gone through the roof. Coming from behind the cabin, dusting his hands against each other, he looked at the other five. Okay, we're on a buddy system. Find someone to stick close to and don't lose them. Try to keep everyone in sight as we walk back to camp, he told them as he picked up the broad axe he'd been using earlier to shape the logs. What are you going to do with that? Paul asked. Hopefully, nothing. But if whatever did this comes back, I want something in my hand to use as a weapon. Good idea, Peter said, picking up a pry bar from the worksite. With a general nod from the others, they all picked up something they felt would make a good weapon. Jeff asked, Where's the splitting mall? 
Lance thumbed towards the back of the cabin. Back there. It looks like your dad tried to use it on whatever attacked him. It's probably best to leave it there. Something about what Lance said seemed to comfort the other boys. Taking a deep breath, Lance told them, Jeff, your buddy is Paul. Tommy, yours is Peter. Bobby, you're with me. Try to stay together and not lose sight of each other. Whatever this thing is, it may try to separate us to make us easier to take. You're scary when you start talking like that, Bobby told him as he took his place besides Lance. Just trying to keep us all safe, Lance replied as he pointed down the trail with a broad axe. Camps that way. Lance couldn't help but notice that the forest around the lake had suddenly become unnaturally quiet. It took him back to the first encounter and confrontation with the Gwinner in the forest near the Perdido River. He had a very bad feeling about this. Vasir, I could really use your help right now. He sent a silent plea out to his mentor as they picked their way down the trail, alert for anything. A loud crash followed the sounds of screeching metal suddenly filled the air around them. Lance watched as the other boys froze on the trail. That was not a good sign, as it was among the worst things they could do if the creature were to suddenly appear. In a low voice, he told the others, If that thing suddenly shows up, I want you to scatter with your body. Just head in opposite directions. We'll meet up at camp as soon as we can. Bobby, I want you to go with Jeff and Paul. Why? The other boy asked. What are you going to do? I'm going to try and chop its legs out from under him. Then I tell it after you. That's insane. Lance, Paul protested. It'd kill you. Trust me, I know the danger. But I think I can cut it off at the knees and get out of its way. A couple of good chops and it's not going to want to chase anybody. We stick together, Paul protested. Lance shook his head and projected his will into the command. Just do it. I'll catch up. He watched as the boys were stunned by the force of his will. Paul was the first to come out of it. Okay, but I think you're crazy. He, along with the other four, nodded their heads. Lance was glad for the practice sessions on using his enhancements, or witcheries as Boone Dubois, his teacher called them. After several long moments of sounds, of screeching metal, crashing wood and shattering glass and ripping cloth, the forest, once again, became quiet. I have a very bad feeling about this, Peter warned. I do too, Pete. I do too, Lance told him. What now? Paul whispered. Now, we quietly pick our way back to camp, Lance said. Here, let me and Bobby in front. Jeff and Paul, you get behind us. Tommy and Peter, I want you two to keep to the rear and watch our backs. Slipping forward, Lance began advancing slowly and as silently as he could. Going on soft, silent feet took nearly half an hour to get back to camp. Luckily, they found it empty of the creature, but the place was a wreck. The side door had been ripped off the RV and had been turned over on its side. With a groan of disappointment, Lance noted that the drive shaft had been ripped from the rear axle. The Jeep, on the other hand, it was upside down, and the wheels had been pulled off of the hubs of the driver's side, and the gas tank it had been punctured. The three tents had been ripped to shreds, and their gear was scattered all around the area, and a sharp, musky scent. It was everywhere. It was then that Lance noticed the puddles of yellow liquid at various points in the camp, including the open cooler. Damn thing marked everything in camp. What? Peter asked. It's pissed all over our stuff, Paul told him, picking up a punctured can of coke and making a disgusted face. Jeff, you and Paul put out the campfire, Lance told him. Peter and Tommy, see if you can find any food that hasn't been marked. Bobby, you and I are going to look for something to protect ourselves with, other than just a broad axe and a handful of tools. Dad kept a gun locked in the glove compartment, Jeff said. He said it was for bears. Bears? Lance asked. You never know, Jeff replied with a shrug. I wish he had it with him when they were attacked, Lance said climbing up on top of the cab of the RV. Bobby, keep a close lookout for me. The other boy nodded and said, you got it. There was a tone of anger to his voice. Lance didn't know if it was a good or bad. He didn't want the boy to do something stupid out of anger or grief and get himself killed. The driver's door had been ripped off its hinges and flung aside by the creature, and so 
It wasn't difficult to wriggle his way past large consoles in the middle of the cab and find the glove box. Noting that it was locked, Larch looked around to make sure that others couldn't see him before casually ripping it open and finding a 44 auto mag pistol, three magazines and a box of rounds. Jeff's dad had expensive tastes in handguns, but it could definitely bring down a bear. Lance didn't know about Iguina, but he hoped so. Glancing back into the main cabin of the RV, he noted the deep gashes on the walls, the ripped and torn cushions, and the holes punctured clean through the sides. Mr. Grant must have really put a hurt on it for the thing to take out this anger on the RV like this. Found it, he called out. What'd you find? Peter asked from outside. He ejected the magazine and then the round in the chamber and stuck it down in his waistband as he put the extra magazines and the rounds in his pockets before wiggling his way up and out of the cab. Sticking his head out, he looked around to see Bobby and the others watching him. Looking over at Jeff, he said, Your dad has good taste in handguns. What is it? Peter asked. A 44 auto mag pistol, he told them. Anybody other than me know how to fire it? He watched the other boys shake their heads, giving him a surprisingly honest answer. No, Jeff said. Dad was supposed to teach me on this trip. His voice dripped of grief. Do you mind if I keep it until we get out of this mess? Lance asked gently. No, if you know how to use it then, it's best it stays with you. Looking around, he asked. Okay, let's take stock of what we've got to work with. Each team had found several items that might be of use. Among them was Lance's fishing gear. He smiled at the end and said, If we're heading away from this lake, the fishing gear won't be of much help. But it was a good thought. Definitely like your survival instincts, he told Tommy and Peter. Now what else? Food-wise, we found two loaves of bread and some bologna that hadn't been marked. Also a six-pack of Cokes and some canteens, Paul said. Good. If we're only out a day or so to get to that phone, that should keep us going. Lance told him. And see if you can find some long sleeve shirts or, or jackets. It's getting colder at night here. He had a sneaking suspicion that they weren't going to get too far before the creature came looking for them. If it was smart enough to destroy their food and their escape route, it was smart enough to set up an ambush. The question in Lance's mind was from where it was going to come from. It was much easier for him when he wasn't trying to keep five other boys safe while he fought it off. If it was just him, he had several avenues of escape, but there was no way he was going to go off and leave them unguarded. The best he could hope for is that Boone, or Vasir, heard his mental call for help. Judge's Target Report Judge Redacted Notes Specimen has stranded a group of six boys who were camping with victims one and two near the lake. One boy seems to be in charge and is acting out of character for his age group. So far, he has managed to keep the boys from breaking down or apart and has them focused on getting to safety. They've recovered short-term rations and several means of defence, including one handgun capable of damaging the experimental specimens. Recommend further investigation of one Lance McKnight by research staff. Whose bright idea was it to bring three 15-year-old girls and a 10-year-old boy camping? Geraldine Howard asked herself as she gingerly picked her way along the trail leading from a lake to the campsite near her nitwit husband had picked out. Oh yeah, that's right. It was her nitwit husband, Jack. He made good money as an engineer at Armco and Russell, Kentucky, and they could afford a vacation in Hawaii. They did last year, but this year... It was his choice and he wanted to come out to a mosquito-infested lake in the deepest, darkest, most backward section of Kentucky he could find and go camping. Well, at least the triplets seemed to be enjoying it. She didn't understand why, but Deborah, Denise and Donna took to camping and the outdoors like their father. It wasn't that they were tomboys, far from it. They all three were in the running for freshman homecoming queen last year. But they adored their father and took up whatever activity he suggested with gusto. They played basketball. They were, after all, Kentuckians. Tennis and ran track and field. And it kept them fit. And Geraldine had to admit that it probably kept them out of trouble. They weren't yet allowed to date. That would come next year when all three of them turned 16. So maybe 
It would keep their minds off boys. Hell, even Todd, the youngest, was enjoying himself. But he had run wild through the woods at home before, barefoot and carefree since he was old enough to walk. He learned to swim almost immediately, and after that it was nearly impossible to keep him away from water. And keeping him away from the Ohio was paramount, as the river appeared to be deceptively calm all the while it was unforgiven. People didn't casually swim there. Spying her husband loading the grill with charcoal, she growled at him. Next year, we do the Bahamas. Not enjoying yourself? Her husband asked with a smile. Swatting a mosquito, she said. No, I'm not. I don't like sleeping on the ground, cleaning up after the kids and sweating all day long. She growled with a swatted another mosquito and added. And these damn mosquitoes seem to have it out for me. Jack chuckled and said. Next year, you get to pick the vacation. Looking around, he asked. Where are the kids? She nodded towards the trowel she'd just come up from and said, The girls are trying to ignore Todd, who's making a magnificent pest of himself to them. And that's what little brothers are supposed to do, Jack told her. They keep their sisters honest. What's to be honest about? Geraldine asked. You know, all the little beauty tricks that girls use to make themselves more attractive. By pointing those out, it keeps them from making too much from their looks. And of course... They make life miserable for him in return. That keeps us all happy. Except for me, she growled. Jack smiled and came around from behind the grill and asked, Well, what can I do to make you better? He moved behind her and started rubbing her shoulders. Oh, that's a good start, she told him, as he needed the tension from her neck and back, running a stiff finger along either side of her spine. I'll give you exactly ten hours to stop that. He laughed and said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to end it sooner. Here soon. Four hungry stomachs are going to come up that trowel, wanting to eat. She chuckled as her irritability began to subside. In just a few more minutes, she pleaded. Shoulders. She closed her eyes and let go of her irritability and began to drift off. Suddenly, Jack's hand stopped rubbing and squeezed her shoulder hard. In a level voice that dripped fear, her husband said, Geraldine, whatever you do, don't open your eyes until I tell you to. When I tell you, open them and run like hell for the kids. Do you understand me? What are you talking about? She demanded. For once in your life, don't argue with me about it. Just do it. His voice was harsh and hit her like a truck. Her husband was generally frightened and that scared her. Okay, she told him. Good. He said as he let go of her shoulder with one hand. She could feel him leaning back for something and search without looking. Okay, when I say. Now, take off straight to your left, not towards the trail. He must have found what he was looking for because he stood up about the time a low and dangerous sounding growl came from directly ahead of them. Now, he shouted and nearly dumped her out of the chair in the direction he wanted her to go. Opening her eyes, she took off running. She hadn't got on a dozen feet when she looked over towards the trail and saw the monstrosity standing there. It was close to ten feet tall and covered in dark red fur. It had conical shaped head and what looked like a bear snout that was full of far more sharp teeth than should be there. Its eyes it almost glowed red in the afternoon shadows. Its body was massive, reminding her of that six million dollar man episode with Bigfoot. But this... This was no gentle giant. This thing was clearly made for murder and mayhem. Run, Geraldine, run! Get the kids out of here! Dear sweet Jack yelled at her as he threw himself between the monster and her. His only weapon, a hatchet, used to drive stakes into the ground for the tents. With a guttural growl, it suddenly mimicked Jack's voice. Run, Geraldine! Get the kids! Jack screamed and leapt at the towering monster as he swung the hatchet at its head. Geraldine turned and ran. She couldn't go to the kids. This thing would get to them too. She had led it away to keep it from discovering them down at the lake. Ignoring the small pains as the first floor tore at her bare feet, she raced through the woods towards the road, hoping to find help, hoping against hope that she could lead the thing away from her kids. She nearly made it. She was halfway up the embankment leading to the old gravel road that had come down when a vice clamped down on her ankle, turning she looked back into the blood-smeared face of the creature. Before it lifted her high above its head, 
She noted a gash in the side of its forehead and some small part of her mind hoped that Jack had at least gotten one good blow in. Suddenly, the world flashed by her, her body spasmed in pain as her back was snapped across the knee of whatever this thing was. Then it pulled her up and it opened its maw impossibly wide as it crunched down on her face. The last thoughts of Geraldine Howard was that she didn't know the name of the beast that had killed her. After Action Judge's report, Judge redacted. Notes. Specimen's first kill, full points. Specimen's second kill, full points. Specimen was not seriously injured by first victim's hatchet. Todd Howard heard his father's screams echo off the mountain and lake. Something's wrong with Dad, he told his older sisters. He's just messing with us, Deborah replied, looking at the sun setting behind the mountains. But he's waiting behind the tent or something to scare us. Just go back to swimming. I'll let you know when it's time to go out for dinner. Todd nodded and returned to diving for mussel shells in the lake and soon forgot about the screams he'd heard. It wasn't until the sun was disappearing behind the western mountains in a wild display of purples and oranges that he looked around. Hey dweebs! What? Denise looked up from the book she was reading in the dying light. Is there something missing? He stood in the water, his hands on his hips. What? Deborah asked. Donna looked up the trowel and said, The fire. It's past six o'clock and Dad always has a fire started by now. She uncurled her long legs from under her and stood up, wrapping the towel upon which she had been sitting on. Come on, pest, she said. Let's go see what's cooking. Turning to the others, she said, Why don't you two gather our stuff? Bossy, isn't she? Deborah complained. Yeah, Denise answered. But she's right. Something's wrong. Come on. She said as she waded from the water and slid her feet into the flip-flops she'd left on the bank. The four of them slowly picked their way through the lengthening shadows that fell across the privet lining the edge of the path. Todd was getting worried. He couldn't hear anything coming from camp. The only sounds he could hear was a low buzz coming from up ahead. As they cleared the trail into the campsite, Donna gasped next to him and then quickly tried to cover his eyes. He had already seen the grisly corpse of his father. His face was a mess of black flies buzzing around as brains and blood oozed from his ear. His body looked bent and broken and a small hatchet lay beside his right hand. The rest of the camp had been ransacked. The tents, they were in shreds and the food was scattered everywhere. Todd looked around as panic began to build somewhere in his stomach. Where's mum? He finally asked. Denise and Deborah arrived right behind them. Deborah began to scream and Denise started sobbing. Only Donna seemed to be in control of herself. Todd knew that he was just a few seconds from sobbing too. He reached up and took Donna's hand in his. She squeezed it tightly and looked down at him as he fought back the tears. Emotions he didn't understand started welling up inside of him and he savagely crushed them. Mum was missing. There was time to break down and cry for Dad later. They had to find Mum. He wouldn't let himself contemplate the idea that she was 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 like dad we have to find mum he said fighting back tears donna looked down at him and said i'll go look for her you stay here with these two todd squeezed her hand tighter no we don't separate we stay together until we find mum she'll know what to do he watched as she looked over his head to the sisters i don't know how good an idea it is to go traipsing through the woods in the dark and i need someone to be here to keep deb and then from doing something stupid. He shook his head emphatically. No, we don't split up. We stay together, no matter what. He squeezed her hand harder, refusing to let go. Look, there's the camp lantern over there. We'll light it and all four of us go. Again, she looked down at him. Something she saw in his face convinced her. Okay, we all go. Turning to Deborah, she said, Get the lantern, Denise. Look around and see if there's something here we can use to protect ourselves. You mean like a gun? Denise asked. I mean anything. I don't think Dad brought a gun with us, she said, looking around. What do you think we have to fight off? Todd asked. 
Shrugging, she said, Whatever can do that to Dad? There was a short hitch in her words, as it was clear that she was trying hard as she could to keep it together. Then, with her free hand, she pointed to a huge footprint in the ground. And whatever can leave a footprint like that? Todd shook his head. The first thought that came to his mind was that of Bigfoot. But weren't they supposed to be gentle? Except for the one that Steve Austin fought, that is. But in the end, even that one turned out to be a good guy. The thought of an evil Bigfoot did almost as much to shake the boy's worldview as the sight of his father's mutilated body. Finally, he let go of Donna's hand and walked over to the ripped and torn tent. He then gently lay it over his father's twisted and torn form. Looking up at Donna, he stilled his voice and said, Let's go. Even in the fading light, it didn't take much for them to find the path that had been torn through, the undergrowth by a rapid passage. Todd was worried that they were following the trail of the Bigfoot and not their mother. He could not allow himself to think that they were following both. And finally, the trail ended next to the old gravel road that brought them down to their campsite. At the base of the rise upon which the road was sitting, they found what was left of their mother. His sister suddenly closed ranks around him, trying to block the body's sight from in front of him. That's not mum, Todd screamed. That's not her. He refused to acknowledge the reality of the situation. Yes, it is, Donna said with tears in her own eyes. Yes, it is. No, he screamed as the emotions became more than he could handle. He spun around to run away from the awful scene, from the awful conclusion. His dad and his mum were now gone. They'd been killed by some kind of Bigfoot. He couldn't take it anymore as he lit out past Donna. Deborah grabbed him by the arm and spun him around again. He collapsed to his knees sobbing, not knowing what to do with the feelings that were welling up inside of him. What do we do now? Denise asked between sobs. Next to him, Deb shook her head and said, We follow the road back to the station wagon and get out of here. How? Denise asked. First off, we don't have the keys. Secondly, our driving is not the best in the world. And third, I have no idea how to get out of here. We're so far back in the mountains that Mum says Lightning has to get into second gear just to get here. Take one step at a time, Donna told them. First we get back to the car. Then two of us go to get keys from Dad's pocket while the others stay with Todd. Then we'll try to backtrack out of here. Sounds like a plan, Deborah agreed. We stay together, Todd sniffed from the ground. We don't separate. Okay, we stay together, Donna agreed. We need to mark this place so we can find it again, Denise suggested as they climbed up the embankment. Let me... Todd said as he scrambled to the top and wiped the tears from his eyes. Turn around, he told his sisters. Why? Just do it, Todd told them. What are you going to do? Donna asked as the three girls turned around, pointing the backs of their long, blonde hair towards him. Just stay turned around until I tell you it's okay, he said as he shucked off his cut-off shorts and underwear. Quickly pulling his cut-offs back on, he walked over to the side of the road and tied his white briefs to one of the bushes. There. Turning back around, his sisters looked at him, and then his solution to the problem. Deborah shook her head and said, Brilliant, Todd. He shrugged and said, It was the only thing I could think of that would stand out. Donna nodded and said, Let's go. Which way? Todd asked. This way, she said, nodding her head to the left. Only Todd caught the quiet, I hope she said under her breath. Judge's target report. Judge redacted. Notes. It is my recommendation that the four surviving children be removed from the area. The specimen will attack them and they stand no chance of surviving. The value of their kills would be negligible. However, the hunt master has chosen to override my suggestion and so they stay. The Hunters Hunted. Let's get straight into that. Lance understood the middle of the afternoon was not the best time to start out on a walk to find help, but also realised that they had no choice. They had no shelter at all, much less the steel doors and the solid concrete walls he had to protect his family last year against the Gwinner. 
He and his friends were exposed and vulnerable, and he was sure that the creature would be coming after them when night fell. So, they walked as quickly as they could. Teenage boys have a lot of energy, but right now, a lot of it was being used up by fear, a natural fear of being hunted. And Lance suspected that some of it was the supernatural fear and malice that Gwynna projected. As the sun began to sink low behind the mountains, they stopped for a rest. Guys, we need to figure out what we're going to do for the night. Do we stop, make camp, and try to get some rest? Maybe with a couple of people and watch for the night, or do we keep stumbling along in the dark? He asked. I say we keep going, Bobby said as he squatted on a fallen log next to the road. How long do you think the batteries and our flashlights will last? Pete asked. A couple of hours at most. Lance told them. Then we're stumbling around in the dark. Plus, the lights will give away our position to the creature. Lance didn't tell them he could see in the dark perfectly well. That would require more explanations than he was comfortable giving. Tommy asked, What if we only use one flashlight at a time? We might make it through the night, but then all of our flashlights will be out. We'll have to make the rest of the walk by daylight, and I hope we can get to a phone before dark. Lance said. And we'll be making that walk after walking all night too. What do you think, Lance? Paul finally asked. I think we should find ourselves a spot on the side of the road that we can defend and make a camp with a small fire and set watches, he told them. Where did you learn all this? Bobby asked. Lance shrugged and said, I told you, I have a lot of interests. Then, showing an insight he hadn't expected, Pete said, That attack on your dad's wasn't a bear, was it? Every head turned to face him at the question. That's what the game warden said it was. But it wasn't, Pete pressed. Finally sighing, Lance said, No, it was some kind of werewolf creature. I don't think it was a man who becomes a wolf, but something in between the two that is the creature all the time. Do you think it's the same creature? There was almost a tone of accusation in Jeff's voice. I don't think so, Lance said. Why not? Jeff demanded. Because I cut the damn thing's head clean of its body. With what? Bobby asked. Lance picked up the broad axe and lied. With an axe? It fits, Tommy said. He's good with an axe, we all know that. Lance chuckled and said, <laughs> Anything else? Why was it after you? Why is this one after us? Tommy demanded. Supposedly, the one that attacked me was under the same kind of curse. My grandfather used to warn us kids not to go out in the night or the Gwinner would get us. Is that what that thing is? A Gwinner? Bobby asked. I don't know. I don't know if the one that attacked me was a Gwinner. I know it looked like a wolf who could walk on its back legs and has arms and hands instead of front paws. It turned over my stepmom's car and smashed it to pieces. So it's strong. It also gives off this aura of sheer hatred and malice that cuts right to your gut and nearly paralyzes you with fear. He gave them as much information as he could. Bobby started laughing at some thought. What? Paul demanded. That explains why he hangs around with those two weirdos, Diane and Ted. He has lived through what they fantasize about. Bobby showed a lot more intuitive thinking than Lance expected, even if it was wrong. Shaking his head, he told them, No, I made friends with them before the subject of the paranormal came up. Lance smiled and told him, Like I said, they talked to me first, and they were nice to me first. Then, looking up at the others, he asked, So what's it going to be? We find a place off the side of the road to pitch a camp, or do we try to struggle through the night? Both sounded dangerous, Tommy said. But I think a camp sounds the safest. He looked around to the group. Only Lance's witcheries gave him some modicum of relief from the effects of fatigue. But that, that was only with physical exertion. Today had been more emotionally draining than physically, and he was feeling its effects on his mind and not his body. Lance nodded and said, I could build a fire that won't shine in the night. 
We just need to find a place with a good cover. This I gotta see, Tommy said. A decoder fire? Paul asked. Yep, Lance said, nodding his head. What's a decoder fire? Tommy inquired. Watch, Paul told him with a grin. For now, get with your buddy and find us a lot of small firewood. Exactly, Lance said, surprised at his teammates' knowledge and willingness to back him up. This fire is going to burn very hot, so we're going to need a lot of firewood. He hefted the broad axe in his hand and said, Come on, Bobby, let's find a place to dig a couple of holes. The other boy nodded as they scouted around to find a place that was open enough to make camp, but with plenty of cover surrounding it. After several spots panned out, they finally found one in a small gully that had a stream running out of it. Lance took the axe and started cutting the holes he was going to need in the ground, directly under a young oak tree, that would dissipate what little smoke the fire would produce. When he was finished, he had a hole about ten inches across and maybe a foot and a half deep. Next to it, he had a larger hole, which would suck in air from the smaller one at its base and cause the fire to burn quick and hot and not produce much smoke. As the other boys brought their wood, he began to build a small pile of kindling in the larger hole. Then, using the lighter they brought from the wrecked camp, he got it started and began feeding it ever larger pieces of wood into it until he had a good hot fire going. Won't the Gwyneth see it? Pete asked. Lance shook his head and said, We keep the fire low in the ground so it only illuminates the area directly around it. The fire is hot so it'll burn quickly. That's why we need to have lots of firewood. When we break camp tomorrow, we just push the dirt to dug out back in and go on our way. What about dinner? Jeff asked. We got that bread and bologna, Pete said. Good, I'm starved, Jeff replied. Well, while I set up the rest of the camp, why don't you guys help yourselves, Lance said. He had no plans on eating. He knew he could go days without food if necessary and not succumb to hunger. That is, as long as he didn't have to use his witcheries too much. He crossed that bridge when he came to it, though. Mentally, he took stock of their situation. The way he saw things, he had one of three choices. The first was to give up and let the Gwena take them. And that wasn't really an option. The second was to simply come out into the open and not worry about the other boys finding out about his witcheries. That was only a... That was only a little better than the first option, as it would make life nearly unbearable for him when they got back to school. The third was to continue on the path they were on. Keep hiding his abilities and hope he can keep them all safe. He really was stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea, but for now, he and his friends were safe. It was nearly an hour later, when everyone had settled down with something to eat and drink, that Pete came up to him and sat down. You didn't eat anything. Lance smiled at him and lied. If I eat something, it's likely to come up again. I figure it's best not to waste food. Why? Are you sick? Lance frowned and said, No, I'm just scared. Never could tell it by the way you're taking charge. Oh, if I let myself break down, then who's going to keep us all safe? Why is it your responsibility? Pete asked. Because Jeff and Bobby are emotionally compromised. They just lost their dads. I don't know you, Paul, and Tommy enough to make a determination of whether or not I thought you could get us out of here. That's harsh. It's reality, I told him. It's not a slight at you, but to my own distrust in nature. He gave the other boy a wonky smile and said, My stepmom tells me that my caretaker instincts are too strong and that I want to try and fix everything and everybody. Pete nodded and said, hm, I can see that, but there's more. Even as scared as you are, you give off an air of confidence. I don't see it in many grown-ups. It sets you apart from the rest of us. Sometimes, I wonder if you're lonely. That was an observation Lance never expected to hear from his teammate. It showed he had far greater insight than people gave him credit for. He shrugged and said, I can't say that I am. Sometimes it seems like I'm pulled into many situations, directions, but I cope. Thanks for noticing, though. Uh, don't mention it, he said, looking straight ahead. 
what are we going to do about the fire watch? Lance looked down at his watch and was surprised to see that it was nearly 10 o'clock. He figured that with something in their stomachs and them not on the road, that fatigue would soon overcome the other five's fear and they would start dropping off. I'll tell you what, we'll do two hour watches starting at midnight, each of us watching with a buddy. Bobby and I will take the first watch until two. You and Tommy can take the two till four and Paul and Jeff can take the dawn watch. Okay, sounds like a plan. Pete assented. Go and inform the others. If that plan is good with everyone, we'll go with it, Lance said. I suggest that everyone else try and get some sleep between now and their watch. What about you? Pete asked. I'm good, he told his friend. I think your stepmom is right, Pete said as he walked off to tell the others the plan. Half an hour later, the food had been put away and the other five were either sleeping or doing their best to not keep their teammates from it by moving around. And that was good for Lance, because as long as they were still and quiet, he could use his witchkin senses to extend his awareness beyond the small circle of their camp. The first thing he noted was a lack of normal animal noises around the lake. It seemed like everything living, everything natural, was holding its breath. And waiting to see what the hell creature that had descended upon the abode would do. Who or what would die next? Even the cicadas were silent. Slowly, he filtered out the sounds of his companions breathing and their heartbeats as he was hearing extended itself into the forest surrounding them. Next, he filtered out the wind and the lapping of the waves of the lake against the shore caused by that wind. Soon, he could nearly see the whole of the lake in his mind's eye. Suddenly, a horrible cry that was one part big cat, one part human, and two parts something the throats of neither could ever make cut through the night, jarring everyone awake. Being knocked from his state of heightened senses, he almost missed the answering call that was pure Gwynna, designed to send shivers down the spine of anything that hears it. They came from the opposite directions from their camp, and Lance had a sinking feeling that he and his friends were about to be caught in the middle between the two. What was that? Bobby said, jerking awake next to him. Then, realising he'd been asleep, he looked at Lance and demanded, Why didn't you wake me up for the start of our shift? Lance lied. Something he'd become too comfortable doing over the last day. I tried to, but you were so out of it, I thought it was best to let you sleep. The answer seeming to mollify him, he then asked, And what was that? The Gwynna, Lance answered. It sounded like two of them, Pete said, rubbing his eyes. Lance nodded and said, Yep, I think we just went from a frying pan into a fire. Judges, target report two. Judge, redacted. Notes. Observations of the targets continue to warrant more investigations. Subject McKnight has shown superior survival skills to the average male of his age. The fact that two subjects knew how to create a Dakota fire is remarkable enough, but the level of maturity McKnight is showing suggests something else. I reiterate my earlier recommendation that he be investigated further by the Academy. The spear of light that the Coleman Lantern cast flickered and flurried off the trees and bushes on the side of the road making the shadows dance in and out of Donna's vision. The further down if they travelled, the tighter Todd's hand squeezed hers. Denise flanked her and Deborah was on the other side of their little brother. As the roadbed had to follow the natural lay of the land, the trip took longer than the trail that followed to find their mother's body. Donna tried not to think about that as she tried to concentrate on keeping them together, surviving this night and finding help. She practiced breaking down their goals the way their dad had taught them. First get to the car, then get the keys, then come back to the car and then try and drive out of these godforsaken mountains. She had no idea how long they'd been walking when they finally caught sight of their parents' new station wagon, parked in a little clearing beside the road. Seeing the car, Donna mentally ticked off one of the goals from her list. 
They weren't surprised to find it locked. There was no way that her dad would go off and leave the new car unlocked on the side of the road. He was too practical of a man for that kind of thing. Okay, now what? Todd asked. Donna forced herself to smile. Now we go to Dad's car keys. Also look around the camp for something to eat, maybe. And then we head back here. And then we put our lives in Donna's hands as she drives us out of here, Denise added. Do you want to drive? Donna challenged her sister. For just a moment, she thought that Denise was going to take her up on it, but in the end, she backed down. Shaking her head, she said, No, I won't argue with that. You're the best driver of the three of us. Four, Denise said. But I hope it doesn't come to Todd driving. That would mean the rest of us were hurt or worse. Don't think about that, Donna warned. Think about staying alive and our goals. And they are, Denise demanded. First get to the car, then to go get the keys, then get back here, then drive out. Take one thing at a time. Don't let it overwhelm us. It sounds easier when you break it down like that, Todd said and she thought she detected a bit of admiration in his voice. Okay, do we need a rest or do we go from here? Deborah asked. Up to you guys. Donna let them vote. There was no need to push them right now. They knew the goals now, and the other three looked at each other. Get the keys now, Todd said. Now, Denise added. No reason to wait, Deborah said. Donna nodded. As Dad would say, there's nothing to it but to do it. Squeezing Todd's hand a little, she started down the path, leading to their campsite. It only took about ten minutes to pick their way along the trail. The night sounds of the woods were eerily quiet as they stepped out into the wrecked campsite. Looking around in the soft yellow glow of the lantern, the sight was less stark, less intense as much of the blood and gore was lost in the shadows. Todd let go of her hand and walked over to where the torn piece of tent covered her dad's body. She watched as he fought back tears, lifted the now bloodstained cloth. He rummaged around for a couple of moments before standing up, holding the keys out for them all to see. Another one down, he said grimly as he let the cloth cover the dad once again. Donna nodded and gave him a small thumbs up. Then, looking around, she said, Look for anything useful in case something else happens. Then they set about the grim task of looting their own campsite. Luckily the cooler hadn't been touched, nor the food safe where they stored bread and such. Finally, Denise stood up and said, I think this might come in handy. She held up a can of fuel oil. For the lantern. Good thinking, Donna told her. Now let's get back to the car. They all nodded and in grim procession made their way back. This time, it was going to be a bit easier, as they knew the route a little bit better. The dancing shadows were not quite so frightening. So far things had gone well enough, and Donna was beginning to believe they may just actually make it out of this. As she slid into the driver's seat of the station wagon. Forcing her nerves to calm, she reached over and pulled on the seatbelt, like her daddy had showed her. He made all the kids wear the seatbelt, but didn't wear one himself. The thought brought a hitch to her throat. Everybody buckled up? She asked, swallowing it. Getting three nods, she put the Ford LTD into reverse and eased it out of the parking space. The car was huge, and it was like trying to back a truck, but she managed to get out onto the road. Denise looked over from the passenger seat and said, Lights? Huh? Headlights? That is, unless you plan on driving out here in the dark. Donna nodded and pulled the knob to turn on the lights shifted it into drive and gave it a little gas. The instinct to floor it and get them the hell out of there fought with a fear of crashing the car on too tight a turn, or running it off into one steep drop-off that cut too far into the road bend for her comfort. Just calm down, Donna. Denise encouraged her. We're on the last goal, driving out of here. You can do it. Surprised and comforted by the support from her sister, she focused on the road ahead of them. What time do you think it is? She asked. I don't know. I left my watch back at camp, Todd said. It seems like hours since the sun went down. I'd say something near midnight, Deborah said. I... Donna! Todd yelled as a huge form leapt down from a ridge that ran alongside the road and landed directly in front of them. 
Standing up, it screamed into the air, some animalistic call that sent shivers down Donna's spine. It stood nearly nine feet tall and looked like Bigfoot from the six million dollar man. Except his skull was more conical and it had a bare snout. Pinned in the car's headlights, the long claws on its hands and the mouth full of teeth flashed deadly white. The cabin of the station wagon erupted into a cacophony of sound as the other four children panicked around her. And for just a second, Donna started to break the car, but then an idea struck her. She hid the gas and ploughed into the creature, and its knees hitting it with so much force that it swept its feet out from under it, tumbling it across the roof of the wagon and then off to the side. It was a good idea, but it was too much speed. And Donna lost control as she took a turn on the road beyond the creature, too fast, and the car careered into the side of the mountain that had been cut away to make the road bounced back across the road and off the edge. For a sickening moment, the car was suspended in the air as the tyres spun freely and the engine refed before it crashed into the tops of a couple of large oak trees. The sounds of the metal creaking and limbs snapping filled the air as the car tumbled through the trees until it came to a bone-jarring stop at the base of one of the oaks, headlights facing the ground. Suspended by her seatbelt, Donna looked around as her forehead throbbed and was slick with blood, where it had impacted the large green steering wheel. Denise was suspended in her seatbelt, looking scared at the ground below them. Uh, anyone seriously hurt? She asked. I think my arm's broke, Todd said as he fought back tears of pain. I smell gasoline, Deb said. And then she quickly added, her voice becoming more panicked. And smoke! We need to get out of here! Donna said, pulling on the driver's door handle and then kicking it open with her left foot. Deb, can you help Todd get his seatbelt loose? I got him, her sister called. But climbing down isn't going to be easy with a busted arm. You and Denise can hand him down to me, she said, calling out of the door and then lowering herself to the ground from there. It took several minutes to get them all out of the car and to a safe distance away. Donna was surprised when Denise went back into the car for the lantern, which by some miracle was not broken. Setting it and the can of fuel down, she looked at them and said, What happened? I ran it over, Donna replied, but I didn't keep control of the car. You probably saved us, Todd said. Huh? Deborah asked. How so? There was no way that she could stop in time to hit it, even if she did. What would we do? drive backwards down this old road. That thing could have peeled the roof of the car back like a can of sardines. I hadn't thought of it that way, Deborah answered. Boom! Whatever fire that smelled finally hit the gasoline. It was a spectacular fireball that engulfed the body of the two trees and started lapping up the hillside. Donna worried that they started a forest fire and she hoped that the weather had been wet here as it had been at home lately. Come on, uh, let's get out of here. What about Todd's arm? Denise asked. Let me see, she said to her ten-year-old brother, who suddenly looked a lot younger as he fought back a pain and tears. Probing it gently, she couldn't find any jagged punches to his skin or even protrusions or knots under the flesh. If it's broken, I don't think it's that bad. Better splint it and get moving. Splint it? Todd asked. Well, that's what they do on television, Donna told him. Do you know how to make a splint? He asked warily. Uh, two stiff sticks tied along either side of your arm to keep it straight, she said. What are we going to use to tie it off? Deb asked. Todd had already sacrificed his underwear and the rest of the clothing we saved was in a car. We'll have to wait until we get somewhere we can find something to tie it off. In the meantime, be looking for something to use as splints, Donna ordered. Yes, ma'am, Denise said giving her a mock salute. Donna just smiled as they began walking around the gully looking for a place that wasn't too steep for Todd to climb back up the road with a bad arm. In the distance, she heard the creature scream into the night and then another answered it from the opposite direction. This was not good. After Action Judge's report, Judge redacted. Notes both knees of the specimen, as well as the right shoulder injured from impact with a 1978 Ford LTD, weighing over 2 tons and 35 miles an hour. Still, 
The specimen seems to be only angered by its injuries and not much slowed. However, more concerning is that both specimens have challenged and answered one another. The result of the conflict over prey may lead to a valuable data. Lance watched as the others slowly gathered around the fire, eyes and ears alert for any sound in the night. After about five minutes, there was a loud explosion and then two cries of challenge again. What the hell was that? Bobby asked. I'm not sure, Lance told him. But I think I'll climb up the tree and see what I can see in the distance. It sounded like an explosion. If it is, people may need our help. He stood and went to the tree. Lance, when and... If we get out of this situation, I swear, I'm going to nominate you a fucking hero of the year, Pete said. Here we are with limited light, limited defences, and a creature out there who breaks people in half. And you want to go help somebody else too? Then, as if realising he may have gone too far, he looked over at Jeff and Bobby. Sheepishly, he added, Oh, sorry guys. No problem, Jeff replied. Understood. Bobby told him. You gonna turn down somebody in trouble? Lance asked as he scrambled up the poplar tree. Man, we're in trouble, Pete protested. Yes, we are. But we never know what we might get out of combining our resources, Lance said as he looked out from the tree. What he saw was smoke and a fire a couple of miles away. He wasn't sure what caused it, but he was sure it was man-made. Look, if you guys promise to lay low and don't run off, I'll go check on it. Not by yourself, Bobby protested. I'll go with you. Lance shook his head as he climbed down the tree and then dropped to the ground. He pulled the 44 automag from his pants pocket and handed it to Jeff. I'm not going to leave you helpless. If that monster shows up, throw to safety and try to make your shots count. Just be careful where you point it. It'll blow a hole through the three of us. And you're going to need it, Jeff protested. I've got my broad axe. He replied. Now here, let me show you how to use it. He proceeded to show the other boy how to turn off the safety on the hand cannon he was leaving. He showed him how to chamber around and warned him that it would kick like a mule and not to take off the safety unless the creature showed up. Most importantly, don't point it at anything you don't intend to kill and keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to kill it. Be aware of what's behind it. You don't want to kill one of our friends by accident. Finally, he was satisfied that the other boy would at least not hurt someone else with a gun. Hopefully, that is. And hefted the axe and moved out of their makeshift camp. And once he was clear of the camp, he stopped and really listened. He fought the instinct to run his fingers past his hair. Instead, he focused on the sounds, looking for something that sounded human. Can we get him up here? A girl's voice said something in the distance. I think so. Another answered in a voice that sounded nearly identical to the first one. Swinging his head back and forth, he was able to pinpoint their location somewhere ahead of their own encampment. Looking out in that direction, he strained his eyes in the dark. Slowly, he began to see deeper and deeper into the darkness. As his vision shifted into the infrared spectrum, he could see the lake losing its heat to the cool night air. He could see the warm bodies of several animals that were close to him. In the distance, though, he saw a roaring inferno. It looked like part of the forest was on fire. Hefting the axe, he took off in that direction at a ground-devouring pace as he zigzagged along the road to help him pinpoint the girls' voices, catching snippets of their conversation. It sounded like they had someone hurt and they were trying to help him out of a hole somewhere. Travelling at least a couple of miles in a matter of minutes, he started hearing something else. The low grunts and huffs of some kind of animal just beyond them, and it sounded like it was tracking them. The situation was quickly becoming a foot race. He rounded a corner where the mountain road sat on the ledge with a 30-foot cliff rising up on one side and a drop-off about 50 feet on the other. A 30-foot sphere of soft yellow light was bobbing in the distance. He couldn't see beyond them as the light was blocking his vision, but he could hear heavy steps of something closing in with them from the other side. Rushing forward, he burst into the sphere 
of the four walkers. Light and then out of it, along the road. Run! He shouted to them, hoping they would follow his directions. It's right behind you! His sudden appearance and disappearance, along with his warning, had the desired effect. They took off at a dead run in that direction from which he came. He didn't get much time to look at them, but they seemed to be four kids about his age, three girls and a boy. And then they were all dressed in swimming clothes, skidding to a stop in front of the creature, stalking them. He realised that it wasn't another Gwynna. It looked more like a Bigfoot crossed with a bear and given a mouth full of too sharp and too many teeth. He looked like he was favouring his right arm and he walked with an odd gait that suggested his knees hurt him. Hey there, big fella. He hefted an axe in his hand. I really don't want to dance with you, but if you keep after those kids, we're going to fight. A flash of movement caught his attention down in the gully next to the monster. It was a guy with what looked like a high-powered rifle, but he slipped below the rim of the road so that Lance couldn't see any more. He started to call out to the guy when the monster roared and charged him, claws first. The first thing Lance noticed was that its swipes were aimed to catch him from behind and pull him closer. Lance planned on getting closer, but hopefully not caught in one of those nasty looking claws. Holding the axe at the ready, Lance danced, dodged and sidestepped at least two attacks from those claws aimed at his head. The creature was fast, at least as fast as the Gwynna, and it was everything his enhanced reflexes could do to stay out of their reach, which meant that he didn't get an opening to strike. Suddenly the creature leapt backwards nearly 20 feet and stood there bouncing on its feet like a boxer. Then it growled once and screamed as it leapt at him, all four sets of claws pointed in his direction. For an instance Lance found himself so surprised by the tactic that he nearly didn't get away in time. The creature managed to land a couple of claws on him that sliced his shirt in half. With a sense of relief Lance realised that this, his durability, did apply to this one. That fit his theory that the Gwena he fought back in Bon Travel could hurt him so easily because it was a lying curse from his ancestor, Captain Sheridan McNaughton, and therefore tied to his blood. This thing's claws hurt and the kinetic force of the attack sent him spinning, but they only left scratch-like welts along his skin that burned like fire, not the deep flesh parting wounds the Gwena did. As it recovered from its leap, Lance danced in with the broad axe and delivered a powerful overhand strike to the back of the creature's leg. He felt the blade bite deep into the skin and bone, and when he yanked it free, the monster pivoted on its good leg and backhanded him. The blow from the fist the size of his head caught him square in the ribs and slammed him backwards into the side of the mountain. Lance shook his head, trying to clear it of stars and lights as the creature cried once more into the night. Sliding down the wall, he caught his feet just as the monster leapt for him. Feet first, Lance rolled forward between the legs and came up just in time to see the figure in the gully raise a rifle and fire where he'd just been seconds before. Oh crap, now there's somebody shooting at me. Got to end this fast. Coming out of his roll, he leapt forward again right as the shooter stuck his head out to take another shot. Lance lashed out with his hand in mid-air, snagged the rifle from the would-be sniper, then tucked and rolled as he hit an early blooming blackberry patch. As he came to his feet, he heard a scream of rage from the monster, then a scream of fear that ended abruptly with a sound of crushing bone and tearing flesh. He muttered under his breath, missed me. Then he quickly picked his way in a direction the three girls had taken the boy. He got flashes of pain, hatred, hunger off the wounded beast and figured it was going to spend a while devouring its grisly mill. It took him nearly half an hour to catch up with a group of kids. Approaching from behind them, he called into the darkness. I'm coming behind you. I'm not going to attack you. I want to talk. He could see the four teens pick up their pace as they discussed what to do under their breath in voices they evidently hoped Lance couldn't hear. What do we do? The boy asked. I don't know, Deb said. Do you think that monster can mimic human sounds? There's a difference between mimicking and stringing a list of words together to make sense, Lance called out. My name is Lance McKnight and I'm here with another group that was attacked. The creature that attacked us killed the dads of two of my group. 
We're trying to walk out of here without getting killed or eaten. Lanch watched them as they looked at each other. Finally, the boy said, It's your call, Donna. You haven't let us down yet. She crashed a car, one of the girls protested. And if she hadn't, we'd be monster shit tomorrow morning. The boy defended the one named Donna. She, on the other hand, stopped and turned backwards, saying, Okay, come out with your hands over your head. Lance noticed a large cut above her right eye and the bruising that had begun. Raising over his head the rifle and the axe he'd somehow managed to not lose in the fight, he picked up his pace and entered the circle of light of the Coleman Lantern. Like I said, my name's Lance. We heard an explosion. I came to investigate. How many are with you? Donna demanded. Counting me? Six. All boys. Lance answered, honestly. How many guns do you guys have? Todd asked. Counting this one? Two. I took it from some guy who was shooting at me while I was trying to lead that thing chasing you away. Lance lied. He couldn't tell them that he actually fought it. It looks like you tangled with it pretty good, Donna said, seeing through his ruse. What makes you think that? He asked. You've got scratch marks on your chest and side. Your shirt is neatly cut into ribbons and there's, there's blood on the axe. Ah, oh, I snuck up behind it and chopped at its legs and ran, he said. And then this guy started shooting at me, so I led it around to him, snatched his gun and let the beast get him. That distracted him long enough for me to get away and find you guys. The story at least sort of sounded plausible. Suddenly, Lance understood how Steve Austin supposedly felt. So, how far behind you is it? The boy asked. I think we're far enough away that if we hurry, we can get get back to our camp and hide until the sun is up. Somewhere back toward the boys' camp, Lance heard the Gwinner howl out of a challenge. Behind them, the other beasts answered. He watched as the other four shivered at the sound. There are two of them, the boy said. We think so, Lance answered. Now, can I put my hands down? I promise you, I'm not here to hurt you. Well, go ahead, the girl who was evidently named Donna said. Putting his hands down, he got a chance to look at the rifle he'd taken. Damn thing looked like an elephant gun, and if the round stuck in the sling were any indication, he guessed he was right. The rounds in it had to be at least as big a round as his middle finger, and glancing over at the axe, he could see it was coated in a thin slime of dark red blood through which the edge of the axe was gleaming. Looking back down the road, he asked, Do you mind if we keep walking? We're heading toward the camp which is only a couple of miles down that road. What kind of camp? One of the girls asked. Primitive, but we have a Dakota fire. You'll at least be warm. What's a Dakota fire? Todd asked. It's an underground fire that won't give away our position, he answered. We've got some food, but not much. What kind of food? Todd asked. Mainly bologna and bread. It's not much, but it keeps us from going hungry. We had food in the car. Another girl said. Look, can you at least give us some names? I know Todd and Donna. Deborah, one of the girls said. Denise, the other answered. Triplets, I take it? All three nodded as they set off down the road back towards camp. It took just under an hour to cover the distance Lance had covered in a matter of minutes on his own. The whole trip back, he kept his hearing tuned in both directions to see if they were about to be attacked. As they entered a small cove near the camp, a sudden splashing caught his attention. Douse the light, he whispered. What? Denise asked. Douse the lights if you don't want to give away our position, he whispered as the girl turned down the light of the lantern. What is it? Todd asked. Look, out there, in the middle of the cove, he said in a low breath. Turning to look in that direction, he indicated they could see the wolf-like form of the Gwinner wading across the cove in the direction of the other beasts. The half-moon illuminated just enough to make out a general shape, but no details of the werewolf-like creature. What is it? Donna whispered. I don't know what anybody else calls it, but I call it a Gwinner. One attacked my family back in October. What happened to it? Todd asked. I cut its head off with an axe. He told the boy, Now come on, let's get back to camp and you guys can get a little sleep. We'll be heading out in the morning and you're going to need to be fresh. 
would it not come out in the daylight? Denise asked. Then, realising what she'd asked and what had happened to her family, she knew that she'd answered her own question. Shh, he told her as they crept as quietly as they could around Cove. Lance didn't relax at all until there was a corpse of trees between them and the lake. Half an hour later, Lance had led them through the trees until he could hear the sleeping sounds of his teammates, and softly he called out, Jeff, you still awake? Lance? Jeff answered, yeah. We thought that the one on this side was getting closer, and we'd have to run, but it heard that other one scream, and it answered it before it tore off through the woods, like a hound after a rabbit. We're coming up into camp. Don't shoot us. We? He asked. I found somebody who was attacked by the other creature. Lance heard the safety being clicked into place on the automag and relaxed slightly. Come on in. Lance showed the four survivors how to get into the small clearing around the gully in which they'd made the camp and made some quick introductions. Now, I think everyone needs to get some sleep. What about you? Jeff asked. Oh, I'm too wired to sleep right now. I'll sit up with the next watch until the adrenaline starts to die down in my system. What happened? Where did you get that rifle? Oh, long story. But in essence, somebody was shooting at me. I didn't like it, so I pointed the other monster towards them and let it eat its fill. Lance! Jeff protested. Trust me on this, Jeff. This guy, he was out to kill me. All I did was lead the damn thing back to him and take away his gun. Is it another Gwinner? Jeff asked. Lance shook his head as he sat down by the glowing hole in the ground. No. This thing looked like a Bigfoot with a bare snout and too many teeth. We saw the Gwinner crossing the cove in the lake on its way back. I think there's going to be a huge ruckus sometime before dawn and we'll have to deal with what's left. After Action Judge's Report Judge redacted. Notes. Huntmaster, name redacted, was killed in this action. We're still waiting on the Academy to return with information on this Lance McKnight. Pre-strike, the specimen was attacked by a teenage boy named Lance McKnight with an axe. McKnight showed remarkable agility, durability, strength and speed as he managed to shake off at least two direct hits and then nearly severed a specimen's leg at the knees. Huntmaster, name redacted, sought to intervene and fired at McKnight with his Winchester Model 70 African rifle and missed. McKnight then goaded the specimen into attacking and lured him on top of the Huntmaster, name redacted, while still in the Huntmaster's rifle. I cannot be more clear. The Academy must Give us more information on Lance McKnight, or this hunt will be for naught. The data we collected so far is of little value as it's been contaminated by possible Witchkin interference. Recommend eliminating McKnight with extreme prejudice. Specimen 1. The Gwinner, as Lance McKnight called it, or Dogman, as it's known colloquially, waded ashore on the other side of the cove. Its senses told it that there was prey to be had here, and that one of the bear knockers was two. It had been a long time since it had fought a bear knocker. They were big, strong and fast, and with as many weapons of war as it had itself. As it moved along the gully beneath the road, it caught a whiff of the man blood and other more interesting toys and things. It also smelled the bear knocker, and if the kill was the bear knockers, it would be best to wait until it had finished its meal. It would be satiated then, its senses less sharp and its reactions sluggish. Behind it, it could sense its shadow, the manling that followed it, watched it kill and seemed to judge it in some way. The Gwinner had long ago learned to ignore the manling. That, it was not a threat, nor was it going to interfere with its kills? Growling slightly at the brief thought of killing and eating the manling, it turned its attention back to the bear knocker. It sat down on its haunches and waited, picking nits and gnats from its fur. 
The half moon in the sky had already begun to retreat towards the mountains where the bare knocker finished its meal. He could hear it settle in to rest and perhaps lick its own wounds. As the Gwynna realised that some of its blood smell came from the bare knocker, it was wounded as well. The Gwynna nearly growled in anticipation. Full dawn was gleaming across the east when the Gwynna judged that the bare knocker was well asleep and sluggish and slow from its meal. Rising carefully, it stealthily made its way along the gully towards its target. It noted several manling scents on the road above, but they had long since passed. It would have to backtrack when it was finished with the bear knocker and see how many of the manlings were left for a meal. Peering over the tops of the blackberry patch, the Gwynna watched as the bear knocker settled beneath an outcropping of rock at the side of a gully to sleep off its meal. And without its usual cry of defiance, the Gwynna charged through the blackberry bush and thorns and was nearly on top of the bear knocker before it opened its eyes. But the bare knuckle proved to be faster than the Gwynna expected, and it striked at the other creature's throat, which blocked when it ducked its head. It wasn't all for naught, as the Gwynna's claws came away with a large chunk of the bare knuckle's face and parts of its nose. The bare knuckle roared and then rolled to its side to get clear of any other attacks as it shambled to its feet. Pressing its advantage, the Gwynna struck again, this time leaping onto the bare knuckle's back and biting into the heavily muscled neck, trying to break its spine. The blood was dark and sweet, and the Gwynna wanted more as it growled loudly and shook its head, tearing away any chunks of flesh and muscle. Standing, suddenly, the bare knuckle ran backwards into the wall of the gully, pinning the Gwynna against the wet, rocky surface. Then, twisting in place, it wiped the Gwynna from its back and followed through with a powerful swipe of its own claws that caught the other beast in the side of its muzzle, knocking loose several teeth. While the Gwynna was rolled against the rock wall, the bare knocker roared in defiance at it. The Gwynna caught its balance and howled back as the two began to circle each other. The bare knocker was wounded, both by the wound the manling had left and by the Gwynna's claws and teeth as well. The Gwynna was wounded also by the manling and now by the bare knocker's blows, but it was now a contest of grit to see which one of them had the most fight left in them. Matching how for roar, they charged at each other. The clash of their massive bodies against each other was accompanied by a flurry of claws, strikes and bites. Both inhumanly strong, they tore up huge chunks of ground in the gully as their claws sought to purchase to push the other away. Finally, the Gwynna got the claws of its good arm positioned on the lower abdomen of the bear knocker and twisted around behind the beast and with a quick rip upward, it opened the bear knocker's torso from its navel to its sternum. It was a soft plop as the intestines began to slide out of its body. The bare knockers suddenly found itself trying to hold in its own guts and its lifeblood began pouring from its body. It, it toppled forward onto the moist earth as it died a slow and painful death. The Gwynna threw back its head and screamed a howl of victory into the night air. This kill was his. This place was his, and he held it by the most primal of all trials, tooth and claw. After Action Judge's report, Judge redacted. Notes. The question of the most effective combatant has been answered. Both combatants have been injured in previous encounters, but were still in fighting form. Specimen 1 however challenged and killed Specimen 2 in an unscripted fight. Specimen 2 is slated to be removed to Academy Research Site for autopsy. In the meantime, there is a matter of 10 teenagers that must be addressed. It is my recommendation that Specimen 2 be allowed to finish its job. The Gwynna's howls echoed across the valley and lake as the morning sun was just now turning the night sky purple behind the eastern mountains, waking Lance from a light doze. Well, that answers that question, he said softly, standing up where Paul and Jeff were still on their watch. You should get some more sleep, Paul said. You were up and moving a lot last night. I'm fine, Lance said, sitting up. Then, feeling a deep growling in the pit of his stomach, he added, I am, however, hungry. 
Well, there's a sandwich left over from last night, Jeff said. Rudian threw a pack and handed him a somewhat stale and soggy bologna sandwich. Taking it, Lance nodded and said, Thanks. What's the plan for today? Paul asked. Uh, we let them sleep just a little longer. Then we put out the fire and head out of this valley and find a phone. Paul nodded and said, I'll see to fixing some breakfast for everybody. The sooner we can get up and moving, the sooner we can get to that phone. He looked off into the direction of the how, his face reflecting the same worry that Lance had. By the time the sun was up and the sky was visible, Lance's worry became much more acute. As he looked out to the direction from which the Howes and the Howard kids had come from, he could see smoke bellowing up from a growing forest fire. Groaning about general unfairness of the universe, he turned back to the group and said, We've got a new problem. The fire? Donna asked. Yes, and it looks like it's moving in this direction, he told them. We're going to have to hurry so it doesn't catch up with us and block the road out. We're lucky the wind is calm and there's been some rain lately, so it's not spreading too fast. But as more and more of that smoke gets in the air, it's going to be harder for us to breathe. Noting that Todd was still cradling his arm, Lance asked him, How's the arm? I saw. I've got a little knot coming up on the site where it hurts. He looked at Peter and asked, can you rig him a sling and splint? The other boy nodded and said, I think so. He looked over at Todd and said, Come here, let me take a good look. Todd looked over at his sisters and I went back over to Peter so he could look at it and probe. Finally, he said, If it's broken, it's what my mum calls a green stick break. The bone's not completely broken. It's just cracked and probably hurts like thunder. He started looking around the camp. Finding a couple of long sticks, he looked over at Lance and asked, What happened to your shirt? He snuck up behind the thing chasing us and put an axe in its leg, Todd said. Lance was glad that at least one person bought his story. He says that it scratched him. Peter gave Lance a hard look before telling him, In that case, give me the ripped parts of your shirt. Lance finished tearing the strips loose and handed them to the other boy. He smiled as Peter began to make a splint for Todd. He then tied two thin pieces together to make him a sling. Patted in the arm, he said, This should help you. Keep it out of the way. Afterward, they all wolfed down about half the bologna and bread they had left and washed it down with water from the canteens. After refilling the canteens with water from the stream, they set out for the gravel road heading out to the mountains and hoping for the best. The first thing Lance noticed was that there was a lot more movement in the bushes and occasionally he'd get a flash of a white towel or fur-covered antlers. More than once, deer would nearly leap the breadth of the road in front of them or family of raccoons would waddle across. He could sense the fright in their minds as they were fleeing the twin threats of the Gwynna and the fire. He was reminded of an old Bugs Bunny and Tasmanian Devil cartoon. We're seeing a lot of animals all of a sudden, Denise said. I'd say they're trying to get away from the fire, Bobby replied. Lance just nodded as they continued to pick up their way down the mountain roads that were both blessing and a curse. The roads could be steep, steep enough to require the RV to drop to second gear to climb, so they were draining to walk up and then down. At the same time, they put a shield between them and the fire they were fleeing. The air in the valleys was still pure and sweet and gave them a relief from the smoke they had to breathe on the hilltops. Finally, they reached a long valley that a road cut through lengthwise. Tall, old growth, oak and maple trees lined either side of the road. Their buffs forming a green archway above it. Thick bushes of privets, wild azaleas and blackberry created a tangled undergrowth that seemed designed to make a traveller stick to the road. It was near noon when he entered the valley and Lance felt that they made good progress. But something about those buffs, about the way they dappled sunlight, played on the road. About the way they created a deep web of cool shadows set his mind to the first time he saw the Gwynna up close under the canopy of trees growing next to the Peridido River in Bontraville. Whereas the cool air was welcome to the ten weary travellers, Lance found himself on high alert. What well, say we drop back for ten, have some sandwiches and rest for a minute, Donna suggested. Lance started to suggest that they not, but couldn't really find a reason beyond his own paranoia, which he knew came from his experience with these creatures. Let's find a place where we can see both sides of the road then. Why? 
Deborah asked. He smiled at the oldest girl and said, Because I want us to have room to scatter if that thing shows up. Sighing, he stopped a minute and then realised that he had not informed the Howards of their plan of the Gwinner should surprise them. Sounds reasonable, Todd said. As if he'd read Lance's mind, Peter said, I guess we'd forget to cover up some things before we set out. We're on a buddy system. Every one of us has a buddy to stick to and help watch out for. If we get surprised, we're supposed to split up and run in different directions and try to come back together somewhere up the road. Who came up with this idea? Deborah demanded. Lance, Bobby said, but we agreed to it. I'm not saying it's not a good idea, the blonde girl replied, but I want to know where everyone is before I agree to splitting up. It can only follow one group at a time, Lance said. My goal is to keep it busy enough to give the rest of you a chance to get away and then climb a tree until it goes away, frustrated. How do you know it can't come up the tree with you? Todd asked. That's why I've got an axe. You seem to know a lot about these things, Denise said. A faint, accusatory tone echoed in her voice. The one chasing us now? Yes. I killed one last year when it attacked my family. The one that attacked you? I've never seen or heard of before. So these creatures were after you? Denise asked. There it was, out in the open. What Lance had been waiting for. Uh, not that I know of. The one that I killed last year was supposed to be a curse on my family. I don't believe in curses, the girl said flat out. You have that prerogative, Lance told her. But as for me, I didn't. And I bet if I would have asked you before yesterday if you believed in Bigfoots or werewolves, you'd have probably told me the same thing. So you don't think this thing is after you personally? Out of nowhere, Bobby shoved Lance hard to the side. Bam! The sound of a gunshot echoed through the air as a bullet blasted a large hole out of one of the trees on the other side of the road. Looking over, Lance saw a man trying to chamber another round of a gun, like the one he took away from the sniper last night. Dropping to one knee, he took quick aim and fired the rifle he was carrying. Bam! The gunshot roared inside the tunnel of trees as the bullet tore through the man's chest, ripping flesh and internal organs out the back. The recoil was tremendous, almost knocking Lance off his feet. He knew he was going to have a bruise from that kick. The man who had shot at them toppled over, dead before he hit the ground. Before the ringing in the ears died down, the Gwinner came crashing through the bushes up ahead, howling in rage. Much to Lance's surprise, his five teammates stepped between the Gwinner and the girls. Whatever weapons they had handy, Jeff was throwing the safety of the automag and pointing it at the Gwinner. The gun barked in Jeff's hands three times. Bah, bah, bah. The first round slammed into the Gwinner's chest, giving it pause. The second round was high and to the right. The third was into the tree canopy as the gun climbed. The creature screamed once, and from the odour that followed just a few moments later, at least one person lost control of their bladder. Chambering a new round in the Winchester, Lance swung the gun around to take aim. But the Gwinner was on top of him before he could pull the trigger. In a single action, it tried to sweep the gun from his hands, but Lance hung onto it tight and fired once as he was being swung around. The elephant round caught in the hips as it blew out half of what on a human would have been its butt cheek. It howled in pain again as it followed the arc of where it had tossed Lance. He bounced once off a limb high above the road and then landed flat on his back, sliding in the river gravel. For long seconds he lay there, trying to get his breath, unable to focus his thoughts or his will, until the sounds of gunfire and terrified screaming brought him back to his senses. Sitting up, he noticed that the rifle's barrel had been twisted and bent by the Gwyneth's strength. Tossing it aside, he saw his team and the Howard scattering. Poor Bobby had a deep gash in his shoulder and neck, and it was bleeding heavily. Todd was kneeling over one of his sisters who was holding her stomach. Blood erupting from between her fingers. The look on the ten-year-old's face was worrisome. He was about to do something stupid that was going to get himself killed. Gaining to his feet, Lance charged the Gwyneth from behind with everything he had. In a flash, he covered the intervening yards and slammed his shoulder into the Gwyneth's right knee. A referee would call it a clipping, but he figured his coach would forgive him. He was rewarded with a sound of breaking bones as the Gwyneth spun down on its now broken leg. It did manage to get a couple of claws on him that left long, painful scratch marks on his back. 
These were deeper than the other creature's claws, and he could feel blood begin to seep, if not flow, from them. Suddenly, Jeff charged forward with the auto mag. At nearly point-blank range, he fired three shots into its head. Bam, bam, bam! Lance watched as one of the bullets passed through its right eye, into its brain case, and out the back of its skull to kick up some of the gravel. The creature was still squirming on the ground, as if the wound was trying to close up around it and heal. Lance wasn't having any of that. Dancing around to the other side, where his axe lay, Lance grabbed the handle and stepped in and swung a single stroke. Funk! The Gwyneth's head popped off and rolled to the side as the body began to spout hot, sticky blood that coated the head. He looked over to Jeff and said, Gotta be sure. The other boy looked up to him, tears in his eyes, and he said, Gotta be sure. Looking around, he saw Paul scrambling to free the jammed round in a rifle he'd taken from the dead would-be sniper. Peter and Denise were trying to stop the bleeding on Bobby's shoulder, and Toby and Deborah were trying to help Donna. And that, that didn't look good. It was way too much blood. As he walked up to where the girl lay on the ground, he knelt down next to her. She frowned up at him and asked, Did you kill it? It's dead, Lance told her. Jeff shot it in the head, and I cut its head off. She pushed me out of the way and got hit, Deborah said, near in tears. She looked at Lance and demanded, Do something! Save her! Kneeling down next to the injured girl, he peeked under what was left of Tommy's shirt. He could see the wound had cut her deep and saw the blue veins of internal organs. He felt helpless. This girl had put her trust in him. Had put not only her safety, but the safety of her family as well in his hands, and he fouled them. Fouled them all. There's nothing you can do, Donna said seemingly to read his thoughts. The odds were at least one of us was going to die. <laughs> I'm just glad it wasn't Todd or one of my sisters. Just get them out of here safe and sound. She shivered once as her face began to relax. Save her! Deborah screamed at him, pounding his back with her fists. You said you would protect us. We should have never gone with you. After a moment, he felt Tommy pulling her away from him as she broke down sobbing. Until his dying day, Lance would never forget the look on her face as she passed from this world to the next. A glow seemed to fade from her skin. A telltale sign that the vessel that was once Donna was now empty. For just a moment, Lance could have sworn he heard the sound of beating wings as a presence passed between them. He gently crossed her hands over her own wound. And then he looked over to where Bobby was sitting on the ground, wincing, as Peter used what was left of Bobby's own shirt to try and staunch the bleeding. Peter looked over at Lance and said, It went all the way through his shoulder. Claw? Lance asked, standing and going over to the other three. It was Denise who said, Bite. Lance winced and squatted next to Bobby. Bobby was the second or maybe third, depending on how you count them, person who had made friends with him, when he moved to the Gulf City. Looking at the wound, he noted that it seemed to have been a single tooth all the way through his shoulder. What made it let go? Jeff and that hand cannon, Bobby said. If it hadn't been for him pumping that son of a bitch full of lead, I'd have been with my dad now. Lance winced at the reminder of the other deaths. The past few days had been a bloody tragedy that made absolutely no sense. Gwyneth's carnivorous Bigfoots, or was that... Big feats. His mind was a jumble of contradictions, and now snipers. By the way, thanks for saving my butt back there, he told Bobby. That was a freaking elephant gun he was firing. Uh, like you said, it's what friends do. Before Lance could reply, he saw red and white flashing lights atop of a series of fire trucks come barreling down the road towards them. He stood up and told the other teens, Get yourselves and the wounded out of the road picked up the rifle and the other weapons and tossed them aside as he stood in the middle of the road with his hands up. The lead truck came to a slow stop about ten feet away from him. The firefighter in full gear stuck his head out of the window and demanded in a thick Kentucky accent, What are you kids doing out here in the middle of the road? We've got a fire to put out. Trying to stay alive, sir, Lance said. What do you mean? Lance plunged ahead. I got two wounded and one dead. Plus one enemy dead. Dead? Enemy? Wounded? What are you talking about, boy? Who attacked you? 
Lance stepped aside so the man could see the huge Gwynna laying in the road without its head. That thing killed one of the girls, plus four parents. He pointed over to the guy lying face down beside the road. That one tried to shoot us. He missed and I shot him back. The driver grabbed the mic on his radio and called the chief and the paramedics up to find out what he was supposed to do. By the time the afternoon was ending, they were all on life flights to a hospital in Lexington. It took everything that the Office of Arcane Investigation could do to hide exactly what happened. In the end, it took Grandmother Kate threatening several people to let it lie and for the insurance companies to pay out. It seems that a Dubois name carries a lot of weight. The Hunters Hunted Ties of Blood and Shadow A Tale of the Witchkin Let's get straight into that. Colorado, June 1978 The electric cart hummed softly as Buffett Wilson rode it along the maze of tunnels that made up the Colorado Containment Facility. They were nearly half a mile underground, and the facility itself spread out for over a mile in each direction, in a honeycombed warren of white walls and tiled corridors. Each of these corridors was lit with a combination of fluorescent and ultraviolet bulbs. It was hard on the ice, and Buffett thought it was ironic to need sunglasses this far underground. The facility had been usually quiet of late. He suspected that was due to a change in policy that shifted from capturing and studying the arcane to one of neutralising them. It was just as well as far as Buffett was concerned. He'd been on his share of missions before he nearly lost his leg to a fate bonded shark off the coast of Massachusetts. He had scars running from just above his knee all the way down to his ankle where the creature's many rows of sharp teeth had flayed his leg into strips of flesh and skin. The only thing that had saved his leg and possibly his life was the efforts of an arcane agent on a mission. He'd lost his status as an active agent and had landed a nice cushy job here at the containment facility making sure the arcane creatures held here didn't escape. The hours were good, the pay was more than enough and he got to continue to pay into the agency's retirement fund better in his payout when he did finally retire. All he had to do was make sure all the lights were working and all the doors were locked. He knew far better than to try and peer through any of the door's shuttered windows, or to obey anything he heard. Instead, he rode his cart for eight hours a day and collected a paycheck every two weeks. It wasn't a bad living. He was nearly halfway down a tunnel that led to a single cell when a series of loud pops started echoing from a grey haze at the end of his vision. This corridor contained one of a few arcane who had been contained instead of destroyed of late. Brought in about a year ago, and a chained coffin recovered from a mausoleum in South Alabama. It contained some kind of arcane creature that the agency was very interested in. And it took several moments to realise that, with the pops and the grey haze, was approaching faster than his cart speed would indicate. Suddenly, the lights in front of him popped dark and showered the corridor with broken glass and tiny droplets of mercury. He shielded his eyes from the falling glass as the lights behind him continued to pop out. Then he saw her, standing there in the circle of light thrown by the headlamp on his cart. Some part of his mind identified the creature as a she, but there was no visible indication that it was. His mind suddenly went into mission mode as he tried to identify the arcane. She was somewhere between four and five feet tall. Her bony shoulders were stooped over, giving her a chest of a concave appearance, and the simple medical gown she was wearing hid everything to below her knees. Large black featureless eyes peered from behind slug white skin, stretched taut over a hairless skull. Her arms were long and bony, and ended in hands whose fingers were too long. Long, sharp black claws stuck out from the end of the fingers. Her legs were thin, and the dead white skin clung to them. Its knees were knobbly, but her feet were long, wide, and clawed. Quickly, he threw the cart into reverse and hit the accelerator as the whining of his motor suddenly sounded deafening in the halls. The thing cocked its head to the side as if curious about him or the cart. 
She smiled, revealing several sharp teeth and canines that were far too long to be normal in her upper mouth. Looking back into the corridor, he knew there was no way the cart would outrun this thing. There was no way to make it to the general lockdown lever at the end of the corridor. The sudden knowledge that he was going to die tonight and there was nothing he could do about it filled his mind. He looked back at the thing and it seemed to wink out of existence for just a second, only to be replaced by a girl, maybe no more than 14. She was pretty with long champagne coloured hair and bright blue eyes. She was wearing a simple dress that came to her shins. It had a high collar with a large bow that was tied to her throat. The sleeves were long and peaked at the shoulders. She wore dark hose and simple black shoes. She was the epitome of fashion for 80 years ago. Then the girl winked away and was replaced by the thing. It hissed at him. Stay. He fumbled for the emergency lockdown device at the end of the corridor, trapping him in there with the girl. No, the thing. His hands felt like they were numb. His thoughts became fuzzy. The girl winked back and said, Stay, please. I'm scared. Where's Papa? Where's Mama? His thoughts were suddenly filled with the image of a couple with the same colour of the hair as the girl with the same eyes. Next to them was a boy of her age with the same colouring. He could almost feel the love and affection they had for the girl. Thoughts and memories of a Victorian era family swam through his mind and at one point he could feel the hot southern sun beat down on his skin and felt his body began to sweat under it. Shaking his head, he tried to force himself back to here, back to now. For just a moment, the corridor returned to his vision and the thing bearing down on him. Suddenly, his arms were weights pulling him down into the deep, cool waters of oblivion. The snap of his neck barely registered on his mind as he was pulled down farther into the dark depths of the thing's lifeless eyes. Only the walls registered the soft sucking sounds that heralded Buffett's entrance into the realm of the dead. He was not going to need that retirement after all. Thursday evening. We hit the decks running and we spun those guns around. We found that mighty Bismarck and we cut her down. Lance and his dad picked out the last few notes of the song he'd asked his dad to play for him since he was barely able to walk. Learning to play it himself was an accomplishment that Lance would treasure all of his life. You're picking up that geek box fast, Lance. It's clear you've been practicing, his dad told him as he looked over the fading light of the July evening. Thanks, the blonde boy replied. I don't know. It just seems that since I come home from the hospital last year, Certain things have just clicked in my head. Lance wasn't about to tell him that it was because of his witchkin enhancements awakening raw talent in him that he never experienced in his other life. His dad looked around before he slid back the cane back chair he was sitting in on their front deck and gestured out towards the fields that the plantation's foreman had begun to flood before planting the first rice crop. Leave your guitar here. Let's go for a walk. Okay. Lance said surprised by the request. He let his mind reach out to his father's to gauge his mood, if not his thoughts. He could sense some trepidation, but no anger or disappointment. That was at least good as far as Lance was concerned. So far, he and his father had not butted heads even once over the past year, and that was a record he had never set in his old life. As they descended the ten-foot set of stairs that led up to the top deck of the cinder block house, Lance looked out over the lengthening shadows of the late summer light. It had originally been the farm manager's house when the plantation had been rebuilt by Sheridan McNaughton after the Civil War. However, the house had been completely demolished by the Hurricane Camilla back in 69 when the Dubois had rebuilt it. They would rebuilt it out of cinder blocks resting on 10-foot concrete pilings. The doors were solid still, as were the shutters. They had been the only thing that had kept the Guayna at bay last year. For several moments, his eyes and ears strained at the night, picking out the forest sounds across the fields and by the river. What do you want to talk about? He asked his dad. For one thing, that look I just saw in your eyes, his dad said. What look? Lance asked. It's the same look I see sometimes in your Uncle Larry's face since he came back from Nam. You're searching the horizon for danger, his dad said simply. Lance shrugged and said, I'm sorry. I guess it's been a rough year. 
Well, no need to apologize, Lance. I just hate seeing my son's childhood destroyed by things beyond his control. He stopped a minute, pulled the pack of Winston's out of his shirt pocket, took one out, lit it, and put away his lighter. I'm not a stupid man, and I know you know that. I also know that what's been happening to you lately is absolutely crazy. I'm not crazy, he told his dad. I didn't say you were. I said what's been happening to you is crazy, and it's making my 14-year-old son develop habits you're only seeing soldiers with battle fatigue. Lance just nodded at his father, continued to gather his thoughts. I had a long talk with Peter, Paul and Tom. They tell me that you saved their lives, that you made it your personal responsibility to get them out of there safe and alive. Well, we both know that it didn't work out, Lance said bitterly. One girl died, his dad said. Yes, that's a tragedy, but out of 11 kids, you got 10 of them out of that forest alive. He stopped and put an arm on Lance's shoulder. You can't save the world, Lance. No matter how much you try, you can't always save everyone. And that's what put you in hospital in the first place. You need to fix things you had no control over. Lance nodded and fought back tears as the image in his mind of Donna Howard lying on the gravel, her hands crossed over her abdomen and her face pale and void of any life. I had to try. If I'd just done things differently, maybe she wouldn't have died. What could you have done differently? According to your teammates, you shot the man who was shooting at you and then managed to shoot that thing that attacked you. They told me that Donna took her hit while you were bouncing down the road from it, slinging you away from it. And then you got up and tackled it from behind. I don't see what you could have done differently. I knew something was wrong when we stopped. Something about the light on the road was setting off warning bells in my head, but I ignored them, thinking I was just being paranoid, Lance said quietly. I'll say it again, Lance. You can't fix the world. You're only 14. There are going to be things that you will have no control over. Part of becoming an adult is learning to let go of what you can't fix. Otherwise, you're pissing into a hurricane. It doesn't solve anything. And <laughs> you get soaked trying. Lance nodded and said, I understand. He tapped his head and said, Up here. But in my gut it feels wrong. Well... You need to work on that. I'm not saying don't trust your gut, but don't beat yourself up for being wrong sometimes. We all are. Even you? Lance asked, trying to tease his father. Well, I married your mother, didn't I? His dad said, dead seriously. And that's something else you don't need to try and fix. Your mother and my fights are between us. You don't cause them, and you can't stop them. Yes, sir, Lance said. That much he understood. Over the last year, he'd learned to ride out the storm of his parents' ongoing post-divorce spats and not try and make peace between the two. They stopped at the edge of the yard that his family used for their bi-weekly pickings, where they gathered with friends and family, picked out old country and gospel songs, grilled out and relaxed. Now this part, I'm not sure I will like the answer to, but I have to know. We've got a family to take care of here. What part? Lance asked. I saw that creature you killed in the fields here. That was no bear. The one that your teammates told me about wasn't a bear or a mountain lion either. They said the one here came after you because of a curse. You want to explain that to me? I don't know anything about a curse. <laughs> Would you believe me if I said I made it up to keep them from worrying? You're going to lie to me? Is that asked seriously? If you tell me that's the truth, I'll believe it. There was something in his voice that Lance knew was there to give him an out, and to let him walk away with his secrets intact, but at a cost of his integrity. Lance took a deep breath and shook his head. No, no sir, I'm not going to lie to you, but some of it is hard to explain. Some of it I can't explain. Can't or won't. Can't, Lance said. I still don't understand it all myself. But you know how Papa used to warn us all not to go out at night because of the guaina and that it would get us? Mm, yeah, I never could get him to tell me what a guaina was. I think that thing I killed was a guaina. And from what I've researched, it's been haunting our family for over a hundred years. And the thing in the woods? There were two things. The first was like the guaina. The second, I have no idea what it was. It was big, mean, 
and dangerous. His father took a deep breath and said, Lance, since you came to live with us last year, you've done everything I've asked of you, sometimes before I ask it. Your grades have gone through the roof, you watch after your little brother, you even go in so far as to chase one of those things into an old mausoleum to get him back. You've become the star quarterback on your team, even though you've never shown an interest in sports before. And you've also been showing skills and interests you've never shown before. It's starting to scare me. I think it's the curse, Lance tried to explain. It changes you. The more it and I tangled, the more I changed. Changed? You said it yourself. I've got skills and interests that I didn't show before. It made me stronger, faster, harder to hurt and more alert. That's why those men in black suits showed up. There are other people like me out in the world, and the government would rather that the information not get out into the general public. They came in and clean up the messes, like the one here and the one in Kentucky. So why are these things going to keep happening to you? Lance shook his head and said, I honestly don't know. Being aware of a possibility may make it more likely to occur. But when it does, I can't stand by and let people get hurt. That's not the way you raise me. His dad frowned at him for several moments, then taking a long drag of his cigarette, he blew the smoke upward and then said, What do you mean stronger, faster, and harder to hurt? Just that, Lance told him. He didn't want to get into a litany of the changes that had come over him during the past year, nor exactly how much Boone Dubois had helped him learn to use them. For now, he tried to keep it into the basics. I don't like to talk about it because of other people found out that there would be questions I can't explain. I hit the guaina with enough force to break its legs. I got bounced off a water oak branch 15 feet in the air and landed flat on my back 30 feet away. All it did was knock the wind out of me. I should have broken my bones. He sighed. Like I said, I'm faster, I'm harder to hurt, and I'm stronger. Is that why you went out for football? His dad asked. You want to use those skills to make a name for yourself? Maybe play professional ball? Lance chuckled and said, No, football is a means to an end, not the end itself. I'm trying to put the kind of things on my resume that would get me an appointment to Annapolis. Playing sports is one of the things they look for. For long moments his dad stood there in the fading light of a hot July evening and thought about what Lance had said. Finally, he took the last drag from his cigarette and flicked it onto the fire pit. Exhaling, he said. I didn't know you wanted to go into the Navy. Lance smiled and replied, Yeah, it's a goal I've set for myself, and let's face it, even using my enhancements playing for the Navy wouldn't necessarily get me noticed by the NFL. Those guys aren't trying to get drafted. They go into the fleet when they graduate. Tell that to Roger Stoback, his dad told him. Stoback wanted to go to the NFL. I don't. Like I said, Sports are a way of getting where I want to go, not the destination. Boy, sometimes you say the most peculiar things. Sorry, Lance apologised. No, no, I don't mean that it's a bad thing. It's just that you seem more squared away, more mature than 14. Here I am expecting to have a talk to talk with you about not going out and knocking up some girl and find out that you've been having plans laid out for the next 15 years or so. He shook his head. I know grown men who have never got that kind of drive. Lance just shrugged and said, It keeps me from getting bored. After this last year, I'd say you've been too busy to get bored. Lance nodded and told his dad, And I don't think I'm going to get a chance in the future, and that worries me. How? Taking a deep breath, Lance plunged in. Because I'm starting to develop a theory about all this stuff happening. People like me only exist in the cracks of reality. It's the only way we can exist, and that tends to bunch us up together. It sort of makes us a beacon to one another. How? Taking a deep breath, Lance plunged in. Because I'm starting to develop a theory about all of this stuff happening. People like me only exist in the cracks of reality. It's the only way we can exist, and that tends to bunch us up all together. It sort of makes us a beacon to one another. When I'm facing off with one of these things, I can get a feel for them. They give off this vibe that tells me they aren't normal and that I should be wary. I suspect they can do the same with me. What's that supposed to mean? I think that's what's been happening. 
it's going to continue to happen. That my very existence rings the dinner bell for them. That scares me. It scares me too, boy. But it also sounds like good sense to me. But I'm afraid of putting you, Dale or Lucy, in danger. Are you telling me you want to go back and live with your mother? There was a sense of dread in his father's voice. Lance quickly shook his head and said empathetically, No, that would just put her and Roy and my other brothers and sisters in just as much danger. He stopped and thought about it and said, I just thought that you might, you know, should know. Why? His dad asked suspiciously. In case you wanted to send me away, Lance finally said. His father's face contorted into visible shock. He shook his head and said, Boy, I ought to beat your ass for thinking like that. Hell no, I don't want to send you away. Even with that guina and what happened in Kentucky, there is nothing that could make me send you away. Put that kind of thinking out of your head, now. Yes, sir, Lance told his dad. Look, we'll deal with whatever these things are when they come along. You don't have to face them alone. I'll talk to Lucy tonight, but I think we better keep it away from Dale. You know how he likes to talk. Dale had figured it out before you guys. He's known all along and won't talk about it to anyone. I think the Gwyna put the fear of God in him when he took Dale that night. Let's hope so. His dad said, put an arm around Lance's shoulder and guided him back towards the house. Now, tell me more about this plan of yours to get into Annapolis. Unseen by neither conversationalist, black, featureless eyes peered from the darkness beyond. Those eyes were very interested in the conversation the father and son had just shared. It explained so much, the owner had much to think about later, after it had fed and returned to its native soil. Friday night. Working summer Saturday nights at the skating rink was an exercise in endurance, alertness, and most especially, patience. All of which Dawn found herself in short supply of at closing time. This evening had been especially rowdy, and she didn't know why, but on some nights it was harder to keep the kids out of trouble than others. They'd broken up a fight in the conversation pit and chased at least half a dozen young couples from the hall leading to the storage room. Two of the fighters had received a two-week suspension from the rink, and one got a week. It was his first offence. The couples had been given a warning and sent back to face the sniggers of their friends. As for Dawn, she spent half her night keeping a popcorn machine that had seen far better days from either burning up or electrocuting one of the workers. And on top of that, the CO2 tanks had to be changed out at least three times. Hot summer nights meant thirsty skaters, which meant lots of coke. And there had been the strange girl that she kept seeing lurking in the shadows. She dressed like something from the last century, and the hungry look in her eyes gave Dawn the creeps. She reported it to Jim, the owner, but any time he went to look for her, she disappeared. She was nearly exhausted by the time Jim had made sure the last kid had a ride home and locked the front doors. All she had left to do was get the mop from the storage room and mop the redstone tile of the kitchen area, and she was free to leave. She was supposed to meet her best friend, Tanya, up in Gulf City later this evening for the midnight showing of a Rocky Horror Picture Show, but she was seriously considering bailing on her she was simply dog-tired, and from what she had heard about the cult movie, it wasn't the kind of film where she could likely fall asleep in the theatre. She was halfway down the hall to the storage room, when a twin in incandescent lights on the ceiling of the corridor suddenly burst. It plunged the hallway into a deep shadow that was only partially relieved by the red emergency exit light back in the direction from which she had came. Turning to look back, she called, Jim? We got two lights out in the back hall. Hearing no answer, she called out again. Jim, we got lights out in the back hall. Still getting no answer. She turned and headed back toward the kitchen. She was standing under the small circle of light cast by the exit sign when she heard the door to the storeroom open and close quickly. She felt a cold shiver run through her body as she headed towards the office to get a flashlight. Finding the door closed and locked, not unusual for when Jim had to count the day's receipts. There was no answer. Jim? She knocked again and called again. Jim? Still getting no answer. 
She went to the skate storage and got the flashlight that was used to find missing skates and shoes that missed the bins. Finding it under the counter, she made a mental note to put it back or Kate, Jim's wife, would throw a hissy fit when she couldn't find it. The corridor was suddenly cold and she wondered if someone had set the thermostat too low again. Following the beam of yellow light to the end of the corridor where the door to the storage looked like it was standing open. She wondered if this was someone's idea of a prank. If it was, she wasn't going to clean up the mess in the hall. They broke the lights and they could clean them up. Pushing the door open, she reached in and flicked the light up. The 100 watt incandescent bulb flared to life, its light tearing back the shadows of gloom to reveal something hunched over on the far wall, just in front of the electrical panel. For a long moment, her mind refused to register the sight that she was seeing. It seemed to flicker between the girl she'd seen earlier and something white, skeletal and horrifying. Bent over Jim, his head lay in an impossible angle and Dawn could see where his throat was ripped open and the thing or the girl had her face buried in it. Gasping at the sight, she stepped back in shock. The thing suddenly looked up at her and Dawn could see its black lips smeared with blood. Long rivulets of crimson ran down its chin. She hissed at Dawn just before disappearing from her sight to be replaced by the blonde girl in an old-fashioned dress. Dawn recoiled in horror and the girl blinked away to reveal the thing again. Turning on her heels, Dawn sprinted down the hall with everything she had. She knew the emergency exit would give way if she hit it hard and Dawn was more than scared enough to hit that hard. She slid to the stop in front of the door, turned hard and threw herself at it. An impossibly long bony arm with clawed hands that spread out like a rake grabbed her by the shoulder and yanked her back down the hall with enough force to send her sliding on her butt toward the creature. The sheer power and strength in that grip was mind-boggling, but Dawn fought against it with her own strength born of fear and desperation. Somehow, she managed to twist free and scramble down the corridor on her hands and knees through the broken glass, desperate to reach the safety of the door. She was halfway there when her mind registered razor sharp claws sinking deep into her back and shoulders. Irresistible strength reeled her back down the hall, rolling over to try and pull the hooked claws from her flesh. She could see the thing's arm stretching ten feet down the hall to pull her toward what was now a cat-like mass of fur and fangs. Opening its mouth impossibly wide, Dawn was yanked backwards towards the horrible teeth-filled moor. She screamed once as those jaws and teeth closed around the back of her neck in a bone-breaking vice. She heard the bone snap at the base of her head, and then she felt nothing else. The thing had left a far worse mess than broken glass in the hall, but Dawn would not be the one to clean it up. Still Friday night. It was well past three in the morning as Lance slipped between the covers. It had been a long but very enjoyable day. He and his dad had finished taking down a tree for a man on the other side of Gulf City in the Blakely area. It had been a challenging job to take down a water oak that stretched over both the man's house and the Tensor River. The pay had been good though. Lance had an extra $500 to put back. Well, 400 he had taken out a hundred and divided it up to have some walking around money for the summer. After getting home from the job, they would gotten cleaned up and several of their friends and family joined them for a picking out by the fire pit. There had been burgers and dogs, chips, cokes and of course, music. Lance was getting better with his guitar and was able to follow his dad's lead on how to pick out about half the songs and he was able to at least strum the rhythm of the songs he didn't know. It was the first time he'd sat in with the musicians for all the picking, instead of back and forth between looking after the younger kids and singing when he could. As he settled into his bed, he tried to clear his mind, tried to reach that near trance state that made it easier to slide off into sleep. It was something he'd been working on with Boone before the Dubois had been called out of the country. Even Angelique had gone, which considering her undead state was not an easy task. That told Lance that it was something important. Slowly, the tension and the fatigue drained from his body and his mind and he slipped into a deep REM sleep. The dream began as a pleasant walk along the banks of the Perdido River. He was walking with another boy about his age dressed in an off-white linen suit with dark pinstripes 
The suit looked old-fashioned. His hair was the colour of champagne and his eyes as blue as Lance's own. It was a warm early autumn evening and he could hear the cicadas singing along the tree line path as he slowly came to realise that this was not him walking with a boy, but a young woman of about the same age. We shouldn't go too far, the boy said. Mother will be calling us to supper soon. Oh, just a little farther, or fair, he heard the girl's voice, high and melodic. She inhaled deeply, and Lance recognised the rich timber of an early fall air on the gulf. We also recognised that the girl's senses were as enhanced as his own. We've been stuck in the house for days now, and I would like some fresh air. The boy seemed to consider what she was asking, and then nodded. Maybe just a little farther. I would like to see the spot Uncle Theodore mentioned about fishing. The girl smiled, and Lance knew that she counted that as a victory over her twin brother as they continued to stroll down the well-maintained road that eventually led north out of Bontravel. Lance got the impression that the girl was accustomed to getting what she wanted. She was excited about something, but Lance could not fathom what it was. But he knew it was something important, at least to her. As the light continued to fade, the pair was walking close to the riverbank, when suddenly something huge and dark exploded from the water, and with a single blow it sent her brother flying backwards into a nearby tree. He bounced from there and down the road like a doll until finally skidding to a stop, balanced on two feet and one hand. She watched in fascination as her brother began to shift, tearing and ripping his clothes. White fur began to cover his body and face as he exploded out of his clothing taking the form of a giant bipedal cat, its tail lashing back and forth angrily. Opal found herself fascinated by her brother's other form, a witchery that she had yet to express. So mesmerised by the action around her, Opal failed to follow the creature that had knocked him towel over tea kettle until she felt herself caught up in its massive grip and lifted high over its head. All she could see of it was a blur of black fur, amber eyes, old yellow teeth. The cat screamed at it with a yow that was half cry and half roar and a challenge, just before it slammed into the hell thing that had her in its huge claws. She was spun out of its grip and bounced along the embankment until she came to a stop, stunned and half in the water. Shaking her head in anger, she looked down at the new dress her mother had bought her just last week and began to share in the rage her brother was currently unleashing on their attacker. Pulling her skirt to the side, she began to march up and out of the river, where she encountered an ancient old man offering his hand. Come, child, we must be away from here, he said with a smile that revealed a mouthful of yellowed malformed teeth. Taking his offered hand to pull her up the rest of the embankment, she told him, I must get to mother and father. She looked back to see where the white cat and the giant man-like dog were battling each other in a flurry of claws and bites. The girl may have not recognised her attacker, but Lance did. It was the guiner that he'd fought himself. The two beasts were kicking up turf and gravel as they strained against each other, seeking purchase of claw and fang. They will know. Turning back to the man, she never saw the blow that knocked her unconscious. Lance had no idea how long his dream self or the girl was unconscious. He had no idea how long he'd dozed for before the dream reasserted itself in his mind. The girl was lying spread eagle on her back, her wrists and ankles bound in some kind of metal manacles. She was nude and exposed, but still fought like a cat to pull free, until a bolt of fire and force shot through her body that left her dazed and weak. That will be enough of that, I think, the old man's voice came from above her head. Never passing into her field of vision, the voice continued. I must admit that Merlin Holmwood did good work on this building. It took little labour to bring it back to functioning. Ironic, isn't it, Opal? The room that you saw your father express his Therianthrope witcheries is where you will undergo even more radical shifts. Where am I? Who are you? Where is Ophir? She demanded. When my father finds out about this, he'll kill you. The laugh that followed sent chills down the naked girl's spine. <laughs> he already did that once, and I didn't stay that way. Now, it's my turn. He stepped forward so she could see his form. 
He was short, nearly emaciated, and his skin was a leathery patchwork of jaundiced flesh. Long white hair was clipped to the nape of his neck in the fashion of the last century. His teeth were yellowed, and his eyes glowed with such an intense red light that she could make out a few features about them. Long, delicate fingers with thick black claw-like fingernails held a large silver chalice in one hand, and a black obsidian blade in the other. As for where you are, you, you are deep in the swamps of Bon Secure, at the laboratory where Merlin Holmwood tried to cut from your father his therianthropy. I, of course, am Oliver Westhall, third Earl of Cathala. Of course, the title is now extinct since your father managed to kill me just before you were conceived. So, you may call me Lord Westhall. He smiled evilly and added, Of course, once this night is over, you will call me Master. I will do no such thing, Opal fought the manacles. Now, now, he said soothingly, Must I employ Professor Holmwood's most excellent batteries again? He set the blade down next to her and stroked her hair like some beloved pet. What is that for? She demanded, eyeing the blade of black glass. No need to worry, child. This blade will rot part your skin. That would ruin the witchery. What witchery? She demanded. You will see, child, he said, placing the silver chalice on the table to the side. I have filled this vessel with the certain ingredients I need to punish your father. Some of them are quite foul, and just the act of gathering them are so shattering sins. He shook his head again and smiled, saying, But then again, my soul was shattered centuries ago when I was the power behind first Cromwell, then the monarchs that followed, and it wasn't until Dubois and the McNaughtons interfered did I know defeat, and it wasn't until your father that I knew death. Now you will be his punishment. My father will find you first, she screamed at him defiantly. The old man simply chuckled and picked up the blade. Holding his own wrist over the chalice, he sliced deep into it. Opal watched in horror as black ichor, not red blood, spilled out over the blade and into the silver cup beneath it. For long moments, the ichor covered the blade like a black cloth that was sliced into ribbons by the blade before flowing into the chalice. Deeming it full enough, Westall turned his wrist over and licked a long cut in it and then turned it where she could see. Like fabric pulled together by an unseen seamstress, the edges of the cut closed in front of her eyes. See? Fear and revulsion rose up in the girl's mind, and Lance could almost feel her wrist straining against the metal of the manacles. He could feel the metal start to warp from the strength with which the desperation and fear blessed the girl. Father! The girl screamed into the night. Lance could not hear Westhall's reply over the screams of pain that followed as more and more electricity poured into the girl's body. Deep inside her, the fear and desperation began to work its own change in her body. He could feel his bones realign to themselves as her centre of mass changed, and suddenly the current surged stronger and her body shook uncontrollably until she lost consciousness. Again, Lance had no idea how long he was back in his own mind. He did not dream of himself, nor at all, until he once again awoke as the girl, Opal. She was still bound to the table, but her body was racked in a new pain and a foul taste filled her mouth. This pain came from deep inside her. He could feel it warping not only her body, but her mind and soul as well. It was unlike any shift he'd ever felt himself. It was a total body transformation, not the small but the significant changes that Boone had taught him. His skin itched all over. His muscles began to spasm as the colour drained from the world and her bones, and the muscles stretched into a new form. A mad, tittering giggle came from her side, and she turned to see the form of Westhall standing there, his face lost in some madness only his mind knew. Lance felt the girl's mind begin to slip away into a madness of its own. Rage, jealousy and hatred dominated her emotions. And there was another one there too. Devotion. 
a slavish devotion to the man in front of her. One word dominated her mind. Master. Slowly, sanity poured back into Westhall as he released her from her shackles. Come, my dear. It's time for us to go to work. It's time for you to kill your father, your mother, and your brother. The part of the girl that was Lance noted that the question as to her brother's fate was answered. He yet lived for now. Again, the dream released Lance as if the dreamer had no memory of what followed. And for a short period, he knew peace and he slept dreamless. Lance had no idea how much time had passed, either between dreams or between the last memory and the next. He was again the girl. No, not a girl. She was now a monster, and he was along for the ride inside its head. An awareness returned to the dream, and he found himself at night sitting on the outside of Bon Travail. A full moon was overhead, and the glow of the lights from the great house was somehow different. It was softer, less harsh, and there was both a flicker and a warmth to it that reminded him of the Coleman lantern the Howard kids had carried with them. Opal approached the house, but Lance could not ascertain as to how. It seemed like one moment they were a hundred yards away, and then suddenly, the next, they were half that distance. There was another blink in reality, and they were suddenly even closer. After just a few moments, they were under the eaves of the great house. Another blink, and they were on the roof, outside of Ophir's room, peering in. Lance noted that the girl cast no reflection in the old glass of the window. Inside he saw where the other twin was resting quietly in his room. One of his arms was bandaged and in a splint, and there were claw marks across his face. His head was wrapped in another bandage, and despite the warm autumn night, there were quilts on the bed. Across from the bed, a roaring fire was burning in the fireplace, and Lance felt the girl wince at its flames. Next to the fire sat a tall, red-headed man in his late forties. He was dressed in a butler's livery, and he was reading a small blue book. The girl's mind produced a name, Donovan. The girl winked again, and they were in the room. Donovan, seeing them, scrambled to his feet as he swept a Colt SSA peacemaker from inside his coat. He got off a single shot. Lance could feel the round rip through the girl's body, but the girl ignored the pain as she backhanded him across the room and into the wall. He hit his head first and hard before sliding to the floor. She hissed at him, My first kill for the master will not be a servant, no matter how loyal nor how well regarded. Turning to her brother who lay helpless in bed, Lance could feel her turn over the idea of killing him. And finally, she shook her head and said, Not an invalid. My first kill must be worth something. In flashes, the girl winked in and out. From room to room, she searched the house, but could find nobody there, not even the servants. Realization dawned on the girl's mind as it became apparent. Mother and father must be out in the night searching for me. How sweet. There was no sweetness in the girl's thoughts. With the rising of that knowledge in her mind, she swept them out into the night, seemingly unaware of Lance's ride with her, and for hours they hunted the night, looking for her father or mother. There were tantalizing tendrils of scent that sent the girl scouring the forest and swamp, blinking from one place to another. Lance began to realize that whatever Westhall had done to her head had shattered not only her soul, but her mind as well. She could not stay focused on the scent long enough to follow it properly. The sky was turning purple in the east when they finally caught up with her mother at the edge of the property. The pretty blonde woman was buckling on her boots at the edge of the swamp. She looked tired, worried and nigh exhausted. The girl studied her from a distance for several moments as cruel thoughts raced through her mind. In a blink, they were on top of the woman with fingers that had become elongated and rake-like with sharp nails. The woman never stood a chance. The first blow opened her mother's throat, spilling her blood out onto the moist Alabama soil. The second blow became entangled in the back of her mother's hair, and as the girl drew back the strike, she twisted her mother's head sideways hard, and it was rewarded with an audible crack as the woman's neck was snapped. Then, to Lance's horror, Opal's face dashed into the open wound at her mother's throat and began to drink deeply of the blood that flowed from the wound. The deed was so heinous that Lance was once again flung from the girl's mind and he woke and sat straight up in bed, his body covered in a slick sheen of sweat. 
He stumbled to his feet and dashed out of his bedroom door to the toilet between his and Dale's bedroom. Barely making it in time, he threw up a last remnant of the burgers and dogs he'd eaten earlier. Retching was how his dad found him half an hour later, hugging the toilet and sweating profusely in his white briefs. Lancelot, what's wrong? Lance shook his head at the thought of the dream. He knew the dream was real. His mind had synced with another, and it was a terrible creature of the night, even more horrible than the guana. I guess I had one too many hot dogs, Lance lied. His dad stared at him for a moment. Are you sure about that? He asked, clearly not believing him, but willing to give him that benefit of doubt. Just between the food and a bad dream, I lost my dinner. You don't sweat like that from a dream, his dad told him, reaching down. He helped Lance to his feet and said, oh, You're burning up. He guided him towards the tub and shower, and he helped Lance into it and turned on the water. The cold water was bracing, but Lance was too drained to notice. He just stood there shivering until his dad finally got him out of the shower and felt his skin. Well, fever is down. I'm going to put you to bed, and tomorrow, if you're still feeling bad, we're going to go to the hospital. All Lance could do was nod as he slid under the covers. It didn't take him long to fall asleep, but asleep was anything but restful. Before long, he'd slipped back into the fevered dream of the girl named Opal. And this time, she was bound once again in chains of purest silver as she fought the implacable force of her father's strength. Lance could feel the mind of the girl shriek in protest of what was happening. No matter what you have done, I cannot bring myself to kill you, Opal. I can't kill my own flesh and blood, but I can't release you into the world. No, father, the girl shrieked. Don't, I'll be good, she pleaded. Please, no. Her father lay her, chains and all, into a coffin made of rich, dark, mock iron. Please, no, father, no. Lance could see the man's heart breaking at what he was doing. This was the hardest thing that this man had ever done. The tears rolled down his smooth face as the lid came down over the coffin. The thing that had once been Opal began to swear with such sulfurious blasphemy. No girl of that age should know, but somehow she did. Lance could sense those curses with some balm to the man's conviction. His daughter would not know such words. This was Westhall's doing, not his daughter's. As the latch clicked on the coffin, the thing began to laugh. It was a wicked and evil sound that sent Lance's own body into shivers of fear. Not long afterward, the laughing ended as the last chain and lock were laying around the coffin. Then came the sound of the thick oaken door of the mausoleum being opened, and then closed and locked, and finally now shut. As the darkness and silence closed in on the coffin, Lance felt the thing go to sleep, and with that, it released Lance from its memory. As the sweet oblivion of dreamless sleep took him, Lance did not notice his father settled his desk with a book. Neither noticed the slug white face that grimmed maliciously through the window. As it drew away, it thought to itself, This is the usurper. This weak-willed thing was what Ophir's line had produced to stand at the door of Pontraval. It lived in this house on stilts, not the main house. It was truly pitiful and unworthy. Slowly, it pulled back its dream tendrils of shadows and blood and returned to the mausoleum where it had slept for nearly a century. Tomorrow night, it would destroy the usurper and take its rightful place among the McNaughton's. Saturday morning. Lucy McKnight came down the hall to where the boys' rooms were. She peeked in on her son, Dale. She found the boy lying on his stomach, his covers kicked off and one hand hanging on the floor. She noted that Brandy, the boy's pit bull, was not there in her usual spot at the foot of his bed. She vaguely remembered the dog coming into the bedroom and waking her and Kendall after her husband got up. She went back to sleep, expecting him to return later, but he never did. Looking into Lance's room, she found her stepson lying under a quilt as if he was chilled. Brandy was laying on the floor beside the bed, and Kendall was asleep across the room at the boy's desk. An ashtray 
with half a dozen butts in it sat on the desk behind him. In his hand was a copy of the book he and his brother, Larry, were reading. Interview with a werewolf, or something like that. Lucy didn't care for creepy stories, so she wasn't bothering keeping up with it. Dark shadows had been more her speed when it was on. Going over to check her stepson, she found that his temperature was normal, but he was looking a little pale. She glanced over at the book her husband was reading, and for just a second her mind entertained an idea, an impossible idea, before she gently shook him awake. Lance, honey! The boy bolted upright and grabbed her hands, both in a frighteningly strong grip. Please, no! Father! No! His voice sounded way too high, and not like her stepson at all. She never seen her stepson like this, scared. Whatever he'd been dreaming was intense. And she briefly wondered if it had been something to do with what happened a few months ago in Kentucky. Kendall nearly fell out of his seat when Lance yelled, sweeping an ashtray off the desk as he came suddenly awake. The sound of the thick glass ashtray shattering against the concrete floor snapped Lance out of whatever he was dreaming. And for just a moment, her stepson's face reflected a much older man's visage. And as quickly as it was there, it was gone, and he was letting go of her wrists. What? You were dreaming, she said softly. It was some nightmare. Lance shook his head and looked toward the window at the daylight streaming through. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't feel well last night. Didn't feel well? His dad asked with a chuckle. You puked like a drunk prom queen. If I didn't know better, I'd have sworn you'd gotten into a beer last night. Lance shook his head and said, I made my point with that. No need to repeat it. What were you dreaming about? Lucy asked him. Lance shook his head and said, I think I was being buried alive. Lucy shuddered at the thought. That would make me scream too, she agreed. Lance just nodded as Dale came padding into the room, rubbing sleep from his eyes. What's all this racket about? Brandy got up from the floor and licked his hands. Your brother was sick last night, Kendall said. Why don't you let Brandy outside and the rest of us can get out of here and let Lance get dressed? Without even thinking, the boy nodded and turned away, scratching his butt with one hand and heading towards the front door with a dog in tow. Lucy couldn't help but smile. Dale nearly worshipped the ground Lance walked on, but he was never very bright in the morning. He was definitely a slow riser and that didn't really get going until he'd been up for a while. As Dale disappeared down the hall, his dad yelled, while you're out there, get the paper. Lucy followed her husband into the kitchen while Lance got dressed. What was that all about? She asked. Mm, I'm not sure. Lance and I had a long talk to each other the other night and he told me some things that has me a bit worried. I'm not sure how to deal with it. You want to tell me about it? She asked, giving her husband the option of keeping menfolk conversation between them. He shook his head and said, If it gets told, I think it's Lance that needs to do the telling. Is this about what happened in Kentucky, or what happened last year? Kenneth shrugged and said, I really don't know, but what we talked about was, it may just be a 24-hour bug thing that just has some bad timing. Lucy shook her head and said, You didn't hear his voice. See the look on his face earlier. It was like he was another person. Two, actually. Kendall nodded and asked, Think he might be relapsing? I honestly don't know. She answered him. He wasn't with us when he had this breakdown. We don't know what led up to it. And I don't think it's a good idea to ask his mother because she's likely to try and use it to get the courts to give him back to her. She heard the sound of the boy's bathroom door closing and then the shower running. Before Ken could say anything else, they all came running into the house with a paper in his hand, his face full of excitement. Guess what? There were two murders at the skating ring last night. His voice was just a bit too enthusiastic for Lucy's taste as he handed her the paper. Sure enough, the front page had a story about a double murder at the skating rink that Dale had got into a fight at yesterday. She frowned and looked at him and said, Lance is taking a shower. If you need to use the bathroom, use mine and your dad's. Nah, he announced. I peed off the deck before I went to get the paper. Lucy just rolled her eyes at her son. Still, Saturday. From the other rooms, Lance could hear his dad and stepmom talking. He didn't mean to eavesdrop, but after last night's events, he found his body on high alert, even if his mind didn't know why. 
He shook his head as he tried to think of how to alleviate the fears without letting them know he had overheard them. That would just be more explanations that right now he didn't have the energy for. He appreciated his dad's discretion and something told him that Dale's announcement about the skating rink was going to become important to him. Finishing up at the toilet, he went ahead and took a shower before heading back to his room. His body still felt crusty from all the sweating he did while he was asleep. Stepping under a cool water, he felt it wash away the last vestiges of not only his sleep, but of whatever it was that gave him the fever and the upset stomach. By the time he was done and dressed, Lucy was cooking breakfast and Dow was parked off in front of the television with a bowl of cocoa puffs. Lance smiled at his little brother, whose eyes were glued to the secrets of Isis, as he shoved chocolate cereal into his mouth without looking. With a nod to Andrea Thomas, he turned to where Lucy was kneading dough for biscuits. Anything I can help with? She shook her head and told him, Not for me, but you may want to check with your dad. He went out to sharpen her saw before putting her away. Lance nodded and said, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't need a new chain. Mock eye and his murder on them. We must have had to stop four times to resharpen the saws yesterday. She nodded to him and he headed out the front door. Now you sound like your dad. I'll take that as a compliment, he told her as he stepped out on the deck of their house, ten feet above the sandy ground below. It was a pain in the ass to climb that many stairs, but a house was protected from hurricane storm surge this way. He looked out over the rice fields towards the tree line along the river bank and smiled. The gulf sky was clear, but he could already feel both the heat and the humidity begin to climb. He knew they were likely to get a short summer squall around 3 or 4 in the afternoon that would only make the air even stickier. Below, he could hear his dad running the file across the teeth in the saw. Four long strokes with the file, then a click and the chuck of him advancing the chain and the process started over again. He found his dad in a cool shade under the house sharpening the big McCulloch with a 36 inch bar. A glass of iced tea sitting next to him on one side. Uh, Need some help? Um, you can take the parlin, his dad said taking a Winston out of his mouth. And with a nod, Lance grabbed the other chainsaw and two files and sat down across from his dad and began to sharpen the teeth on the chain. For long moments the only sound they made was the rhythm of the files against the metal. Finally, his dad tapped the round file against the thick tread of his work boot and said, How are you feeling this morning? Lance shrugged and said, well, Fever seems to be gone, and the only thing my stomach feels right now is empty. Shaking his head, his dad smiled and said, Teenage boys and their bottomless guts. Then his voice grew serious. Are you sure this is just some short-lived bug, and not something like we were talking about the other day? Lance took a deep breath and said, I honestly don't know. Last night I dreamt of great uncle Ophir and his twin. Ophir's twin died when she was a baby, his dad said. That's what Papa told us, but I'm not so sure. What makes you say that? His dad asked. The dream? Lance nodded his head. Yeah, I dreamt that she got turned into some kind of monster. Her father couldn't bring himself to kill his daughter, so he chained her in a coffin. In the family mausoleum. Huh, sounds like an episode of Dark Shadows, his dad told him. It does, doesn't it? Lance said. After a long moment, he said, When I went into the McNaughton mausoleum to get down after the Gwyna took him, I saw a chained coffin in there. When I went back to check on it a couple of days later, the coffin, chains and all, was gone. Why didn't you say something then? his dad asked. I was still processing what was happening to me then. I mentioned it to those government types who showed up. They all would tell me is that it's been taken care of. Could it be just a bad dream? The elder McKnight asked. I certainly hope so, Lance said. I'd hate to think what that thing could do to people. Lance, his dad warned. Yes, sir. Don't go looking for things to fix. You pushed yourself into a breakdown doing that last year. Trust me, I've seen enough of the inside of hospitals of late. I'm not looking for people or situations to fix. I just want to be ready if the dream was more than just that. What can you do about it? His dad asked. Lance picked up a chainsaw, and so the blade was pointing up at an angle and said, Run it through with a chainsaw? Ken? Lance? Lucy's voice called for them on the porch. Breakfast is on! 
Victuals are ready. Let's go and eat before Dale gets all. Lance smiled and said, Huh, last I saw him, he was loading up on sugary cereal and ices. His dad laughed and said, Good taste in women, if not breakfast. Kendall unfolded himself from where he'd been sitting, his glass of tea in hand. Flicking his dead cigarette butt out in the yard, he said, Let's go. Let's get it before he does. Five minutes later, Lance was settling down to a breakfast of scrambled eggs, bacon, biscuits and gravy, and an iced tea and coffee. What are your plans for the day? Lucy asked. I was supposed to meet some guys at the skating rink today, but based on that headline over there, I suspect that it's not going to happen. Well, if you aren't doing anything, I've got a bushel of beans in the garden that needs to be picked and snap them to get ready for Canaan. I'll make you a deal, Lance offered. I'll pick them if you snap them. She smiled at him and shook her head. Oh no, we all snap beans. He shrugged and said, can't blame a guy for trying. You'll appreciate those beans this winter, she said. Don't you know snapping beans and shelling peas is every country kid's worst nightmare? Lance asked her. We can hardly call you a country kid. You live on a plantation that butts up next to a major city. Two, actually. Lance chuckled and said, Yeah, but we're far enough out in the suburbs that it doesn't feel like it. And we've got a garden. A large one. That's country as far as I'm concerned, and I'm glad for it. Boy, his dad said, shaking his head. Sometimes you say the damnedest things. Just being honest, Dad. Somehow, I don't see you always being a country boy. You told me yourself you want to go into the Navy. Sure, being a country boy won't stop that. President Carter was a country boy who went into the Navy, Lance replied. He didn't, however, tell his dad what he thought of Carter as a president. Instead, he said, Well, if we're going to pick stuff up in the garden, I'm going to get it done before the sun gets unbearable, Lance told him. That's the attitude, his dad replied. Several hours, a bushel of beans and two bushels of tomatoes later, Lance was sitting under the deck with his stepmom and Dale snapping a string in beans. Lance called himself looking south towards the old ruins of Chateau Le Maire and the McNaughton Mausoleum. His mind kept turning over the events of his dreams last night as his nimble fingers snapped beans and pulled the strings out of them without thought. Lance. 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 His stepmom finally prodded him back to here and now. Huh? Your dad is calling you to the phone. He says it's Ted Galliard. Oh. Lance smiled wanely and put down the bowl of beans. I'm sorry. She just smiled and he exited the cool shadow under the house and climbed the stairs to the deck. His dad met him at the door and said, Boy, you got cotton in your ears. I've been calling and calling you. Oh, sorry, he apologised. I guess I was zoned out from snapping beans. His dad just laughed and said, Just go on. Ted seems to be worried about something. Lance picked up the receiver and said, This is Lance. Who else would it be? Ted asked. It could be Dale or my stepmom. Lance countered. And why would I call to talk to either of them? Your dad, maybe, since he's teaching me some new chords on the guitar. But when I call your house, I usually want to talk to you. What's up, Ted? Lance asked with a smile. Look, I was supposed to meet Diane at the skating rink this evening, but it's closed right now. Somebody ripped the throats out of the owner and one of the workers last night. Please tell me you and Diane are not going to try and investigate that, Lance protested. No, Ted asked, confused. Do you think we should? No, Lance said a bit louder than he meant to. His dad turned away from the baseball game on the tube to see what was the matter. No, he repeated in a softer tone. What did you want me to do? Well, neither Diane nor I are supposed to be dating for another two years yet, but we both wanted to go to the movies. The only way we can both go together is to go as a group. I was wondering if maybe you might want to go and see Jaws too. His tone was nearly pleading. What's showing? 7.30? Ted asked. Let me check. Lance put his hand over the mouthpiece of the phone and asked, Dad, is it okay if I go to see the 7.30 showing of Jaws 2 tonight with Ted and Diane? His dad turned to him, smiled and asked, Still can't date, huh? Lance nodded. Something like that. His dad shrugged and asked, You got those pole beans snapped yet? Mostly, Lance told him. Get them snapped and help Lucy with the clean-up, and I'll carry you over to the theatre. What are you doing afterward? Maybe Pizza Hut across the street, he told his dad. 
He looked at the newspaper laying by the phone and checked the times. Looks like the movie will be over about 9.30. We'll go over and get something to eat. I can ask Ted's dad if he can bring me home. His dad nodded and said, Hmm, sounds like a plan. Thanks, Dad. He then turned to the phone and asked, Can your dad bring me home? Let me check. The phone was silent for a few moments until Ted came back. He says, sure. See you about 7.30 then, Lance told him. Bye. Lance hung up on the phone and told his dad, Thanks, Dad. No problem, son. Lance checked his watch and realised it was nearly five in the afternoon. He hurried down the stairs and grabbed his bowl, sat down and began turning on the speed with the beans. His stepmom just shook her head, chuckling, and asked, What was that all about? Oh, I'm going to the movies with Ted and Diane tonight, he said. You chaperoning again? Nah, they can have the back row. I'll just sit a few rows away and give them some privacy, he told her. I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse, she asked. You gonna expect Diane and Ted to do the same for you when you get a girlfriend? I think I'm gonna hold off on the girlfriend thing for a while, longer, he told her. Like I told Dad, I've got plans, and girlfriends are just a complication I can do without. That was the most sensible thing I'd ever heard a teenager say, she told him. But I suspect that, in not too distant future, you may be rethinking that. When you meet the right girl? He shrugged and winked at her. I'm less worried about meeting the right girl than meeting the wrong one. Still, yet Saturday. The thing had emptied one of the other coffins in the mausoleum for a place to rest. But there was no rest and the universe took its payment for forcing its mind into the boys. It was its turn to dream dreams and not its own. It dreamt of a life lived to near fullness that then looped back on itself and joined with another self. The boy was no boy, but a man in a boy's body, reliving a childhood that wasn't the one he remembered. He had his own witcheries that made him nearly as dangerous as it was. Tossing in a fitful sleep, it dreamed of a life lived in mediocrity. As the day passed, it lived through one grey binal day after another. A fate it shuddered at for the sheer boredom. It dreamed of a fouled marriage and a mediocrum of success as a scholar. Then the life ended in a single explosion of fire and force, only to loop back into its youth. Now, at least, he had some witcheries to make interesting. Slowly, the thing came to realise that there was more to the usurper than just banality. He had witcheries of his own, and he was learning to use them. He had twice fought the thing that had nearly killed his brother, or fear, and had walked away. He had forged ties with her own great-grandmother and her great-uncles. He was clearly descended from her brother's line, but was marked far deeper by the Dubois blood than a McNaughton. Some part of the thing's mind balked at the name transformed from McNaughton to McKnight. The sound of the new name rang false in its mind and set its teeth on edge. It would not follow suit after it had killed the usurper and his family, but names were not really important to it anymore. It knew its name once had been Opal, but that meant nothing to it now. It existed to feed, to destroy, and to do its master's bidding. And when came evening, it climbed out of its borrowed coffin and stepped out into the warm autumn air. Some part of its mind registered the name of the owner of the coffin, Erwin McNaughton. It knew that the body that now turned to dust was an ancestress, but it cared not for the fact. The changes wrought on the land were nearly a century of progress made more sense now, thanks to its dreams of the usurper. They had traded dreams, and he had gained the knowledge it needed to navigate this frightening new world that had produced such banality. It moved through the thicket of trees that separated the old McNaughton mausoleum from a nearby park. Reaching its edge, it sat and watched as families packed up their belongings and headed home. Soon, the park was empty of all except a couple of young dark-skinned men, bouncing a ball off the ground and then throwing it through a hoop on a pole. Their bodies were slick with sweat and exertion, and they were obviously enjoying their friendly rivalry and love of the game. The name of the game came to it from the usurper's dreams, Basketball, and from the shadows of the trees it watched and practiced its own witcheries on the men. Slowly, and slipped its thoughts into theirs. They were brothers enjoying this part because one near their home, miles away from here in Spanish Fort, was in an area marked by violence and vice. This game, at this park, was part of their brotherly routine, 
and they both took it very seriously. It started with anger. Anger was easy. Most people tripped over it constantly, making their lives chaotic and miserable. Next came frustration. It was too easy. And anger and frustration led to one another. I looked over at the men playing and could almost feel their friendly rivalry becoming something more intense as they strained against each other, trying to put the ball in the hoop. As the rivalry became more intense, the men became almost frantic as they bobbed and weaved around each other, one trying to move the ball towards the hoop, the other trying to stop it. One final push and it felt something in their minds snap. The older brother, the one with the ball, spun in place and drove an elbow into the side of his brother's temple. There was just enough speed, just enough torque, that the strike shattered bone and severed blood vessels. The one struck spun to the ground, smashing his face against the hard surface. Pain, anger and frustration became rage. And as he scrambled to his feet and tackled his brother, who was coming down from the jump that put the ball in a hoop, both men went smashing into the pole, supporting the goal. The sound of metal rang across the park as the older one hit his head on the pole and sat and watched the two brothers as they struggled against each other, now both lost in red haze of fury that had settled over them. Punching and kicking, they rolled across the grass in the direction of the tree line, where it sat and waited in anticipation of a feast that was to follow. It noted that the younger brother's eye had turned blood red where he had been hit in the temple. And it smiled. Understanding that meant that soon he'd be collapsing as blood filled his brain case. When the two brothers were just a yard from his tree line, it struck. Two preternaturally long arms stretched out. The rake-like fingers sank into their flesh. And in a flash, it yanked the two brothers to her and smashed their heads together. Soon, the only sound coming from the park was the call of the night birds. And if one listened closely, the soft sucking sounds of the feeding on the blood of the two brothers. By the time it was done with a ghastly meal, it felt that the usurper had moved. He was no longer enconced with the thick stone walls of his strange house on stilts, but was now moving away to the north and west. It marvelled at how fast the mortals of this new century could move. The horseless carriage had changed the face of the world. It decided that this new era was going to make hunting fun. With a mind that, although determined, was easily distracted by the thoughts it had stolen from the usurper. It followed the trail that connected them like ribbons of blood. At least twice it became distracted by one encounter or another as it passed through the shadows by squeezing space and letting it spring back into place. Part of it, the part that was tracking the usurper, kept it on a general course towards the prey. That part would not let go of the anger and hatred of a fear taking its place as their father's chosen kept it focused on moving towards the usurper. It was only this focus that saved at least half a dozen young men and women from becoming a bloody feast for its appetite. It landed behind a large building that seemed to serve as a juncture of two lines of buildings connected at 90 degree angles. The term strip mall came to it from the usurper's memories. It could not tell what was meant by strip, but it knew what a mall was and a shop was. This place seemed to gather shops into one place, blinking to the top of the building, it looked out at the city. Now lit in all of its glory, Gulf City was much larger than she remembered, even Mobile, or New Orleans had been. Impossibly tall buildings were cast against the skyline that drowned out the stars themselves in a wash of light. Whatever small part of Opal remained inside the thing cowered back at how small it made it feel. Shaking its head free of such thoughts, it began pacing back and forth along the building's roof considering how to get in. Beneath its feet, it sensed the whole room packed with fear and anticipation. In its mind's eye, it could see fleeting images of giant fish that was devouring people on a strange boat. Again, the images disturbed the thing. It made no sense. Were these people watching others being fed to a shark? Had they become even more depraved than it, who had slain its own mother? It had no idea how long it waited, but it waited tie into the mind of the usurper. That mind was giving it focus, something to draw inexorably to a contest of wills between the two. And strangely, in a mass of fear and anticipation, the usurper's mind was once of calm and sometimes even amusement. It was as if he was immune to whatever was going on inside, and so it waited. 
and had waited while the usurper left the building below and crossed the avenue to the building with a red sign, Pizza Hut. From the shadows atop of this building, it observed its prey. It was young, no older than its own twin of fear when it changed. It was thin, with blonde hair that was parted in the middle and worn shoulder length. His eyes were the same magnet and blue that it saw in her own mirror before the change, and his skin was fair. He was wearing a strange shirt with the sleeves cut off and hemmed at the upper arm. His trousers looked like denim, and he wore no hat. He seemed to be with two others, a boy and a girl, who were obviously courting. Perhaps as some sort of chaperone. In one of its more lucid moments, it decided that it could not fathom what that silly girl saw in her boy her own age. If she were eligible to enter society, she should be set in her hat for an older man who could support her. It wondered if their blood would taste sweet and virginal, unlike that it devoured last night, or even earlier this evening. Finally, the usurper left the pizza hut with the other boy and an adult operating one of those strange horseless carriages that the usurper knew as cars. To her surprise, the girl left with another man in another car and headed into a different direction. For a moment, part of it wanted to follow the girl, only the pull of the usurper held its attention long enough to keep it from following. Keeping its thoughts on the usurper, it began blinking and squeezing space between places to keep up, staying to the shadows, and watched as the car headed back towards Bon Travel. The usurper was heading home, smiling to itself. The thing blinked away the space until it was on the old road that led from the city onto the plantation. Sliding up into the shadows of the tree limbs that lined the side of the road, it waited for the horseless carriage to arrive near the drive to the strange house on stilts. Saturday night. All night long, Lance had felt as if he was being watched. Occasionally, he would get a flash of something reaching out to his mind as if it was double checking to make sure he was there. He tried to shut off the contact the way Vasir had shown him, but it cut through his defences. It left him jumpy and on edge all night, and not very good company to his two friends. But of course, they really were more interested in each other's company than his. He was okay with that. And at dinner, it was a bit different. They were sort of forced to acknowledge him at the table. In a flash of insight, he realised that this was his own fault. It had been him that had pushed the two best friends to become more. It had mainly been a way of deflecting Diane's romantic interest in Lance by putting them where they rightfully belonged. But, as they say, no good deed goes unpunished. So, how are you holding up? Diane asked him as the waitress delivered the pizza. Holding up? Lance asked. I've heard some interesting stories about that trip you took to Kentucky, she said. I don't mean to pry, but... This is the first chance we've had to talk to you since you got back. Lance shook his head and said, We were attacked. Mr. Lee and Mr. Grant were killed. We tried to walk out of the mountains and met a group of kids whose parents were also killed. There was a fire, another attack, and one of those kids got killed. Strangely enough, it was Ted who caught Lance's tone and said, oh, No need to go any further. But I want to know if it was a guiner. Diane protested. Lance looked at her and said, Yeah. It was a guiner, and something else too. What are the chances of you facing two guiners in a year? Diane asked. Lance took a deep breath and said, oh, Something I don't want to think about. Why? Diane demanded. Ted looked nearly stricken. He had been coming to Lance's house for picking since he got back from Kentucky, and hadn't pressured Lance for any information about what happened. All he had to know was that his friend was hurting. He didn't have to talk about it. Because it would mean that I'm a threat for people to be around, Lance told her flatly. It means that just going out in public can get people around me hurt, and that's something I don't want to see. It's like hanging a pork chop around my neck and staking me out for bears. Anybody gets close to me, might get mauled. I'm sorry, she said seemingly to finally get the point. Lance just nodded and took a piece of pizza for himself. Diane pressuring him was probably going to cause a row between the two, but that couldn't be helped. They were, after all, only 14. Trying to change the subject, Ted said. You know you did really good last night. You learned more in a year than I have th in three. He shook his head and said, I just don't get your fascination with country songs that are older than we are. 
Lance smiled and said, Huh, thanks. I was raised on the stuff. I've been doing that with Dad since I was old enough to walk. And you're just picking up a guitar? He smiled and added, Or as your dad says, a geed box? Lance sighed and told him, To be honest, it's only been a last year where a lot of things have clicked in my head. It's like something has flipped a switch. He had no desire to tell his friends the truth about who he is or who he was and how he came to be. It was more than just a little creepy, especially when Vasir encouraged him to explore the physicality of it with other kids his age. You think you can find that switch in my head? Ted said. I mean, you're a star football player, a straight-A student, and now a pretty good guitarist. Want to start a band? Lance asked, half kidding. If we could agree on what to play for sure, Ted told him. You like country, and I like rock. There's always southern rock. Admit it, you love playing Freebird with my dad. Ted nodded and said, yeah, and the Almond Brothers is pretty good too. Lance smiled and said, see, we'll make a country fan of you yet. Please don't, Diane said. I like him just the way he is. Lance just nodded to her and said, as you wish. Then, turning to Teddy, said, The real trick to what you are asking for is focus. Learn to do things right in the first place, and do them the right way every time. Then it becomes habit. You sound like my dad. Diane commented. Okay, I'll shut up, Lance told him. He realised that, at 14, they just knew that they were smarter than adults around them, and that that was a belief that they weren't going to get rid of until they themselves had children. I didn't mean it in that way, Lance. Diane protested, and I didn't take it that way, whatever that way is. So, any word on Bobby and Jeff? Diane asked. Last I heard, Bobby, his mum and his sister, are going to spend the summer in Michigan with her brother. Jeff has gone to live with his older brother in Bayou La Bateur. His mother died two years ago. Man, I can't imagine losing both my parents, Diane said. How do you think the Howard kids feel? He asked. They lost both of their parents at the same time, and then their sister. Lance, Ted said, his voice becoming serious. I know you're beating yourself up about the girl. Don't. From what I've heard, you did everything in your power to protect everyone. You're not Steve Austin. Can we not talk about it? Lance asked. Sure, pal. Ted told him, shooting a hard look to Diane. I think I see my dad, Diane said, grabbing her last piece of pizza and biting into it before hugging both boys. Good night. What was that all about? Lance asked. Diane feels like we've been letting our paranormal investigation slip since we started seeing each other. Ted answered. Smooching getting in the way of ghost hunting? Lance asked with a smile. Ted nodded and said, Yeah, something like that. And she thinks you need a girlfriend. Lance held up his hand and told his friend, No. Why not? Several reasons, actually. Lance told him. Such as? Lance began ticking off the points on his fingers. First, I've got too much on my plate as it is. Football, paranormal investigation, classwork, my chores, my family obligations, and playing the guitar. Secondly, I haven't met anyone I liked enough to call a girlfriend, and I'm not going to put someone on my arm just to have something there. Thirdly, and probably most importantly, there's much too much weird stuff in my life to expose someone to it. You don't have a pork chop around your neck, Lance, Ted said. You just had a run of bad luck. Lance shook his head and said, No, other people have a run of bad luck around me, but it still applies. I don't want anyone else to get hurt. And so please, encourage Diane to drop the issue. You know how Diane gets when she wants something, Ted said. But I'll try. That's all I can ask. Lance replied, looking down at his watch, and Ted's dad walked through the front door. You boys about ready to go? Yes, sir, Lance told him. He looked at Ted and then nodded towards the pizza. You want to take that home? Sure. Let me get a box. Lance stepped outside the restaurant to wait for his friend. Ted's dad followed him. Did they behave themselves? The man asked with a smile. Ted was a perfect gentleman the whole night, Lance told him. <laughs> Would you tell me if he wasn't? Lance chuckled and told the man. <laughs> Probably not. At least not unless it was something egregious. Did a 14-year-old just use the word egregious to me? Lance smiled and lied. It was a vocabulary word last year. At least someone is paying attention in class. I wouldn't go that far, Lance told him. There are a couple of squirrels outside Mrs. Watley's class. That's I'm on a first-name basis with. 
The older man laughed as Ted came out of the restaurant. He then asked, You boys ready? Sure, Ted answered. Ready as I'll ever be, Lance told him. The drive back to Bon Travel was mostly quiet. Lance was caught up in his own thoughts about the thing whose dreams he'd shared last night. He had no idea what Ted and his dad were thinking. As they pulled down the lane leading to both the main house as well as his own, Lance felt something stir in the night. It was evil, and he could sense that it wanted his blood. With a frown, he told Mr. Galliard, If you don't mind, just drop me off at the end of the drive. If Branny hears the car, she'll start barking, and that'll wake up my brother Dale. And we'll never get him back to sleep if we do that. Light sleeper? Mr. Galliard asked. More like sleepwalker, Lance told him. We have to deadbolt the front door to keep him from going outside in the middle of the night. But if something disturbs his sleep, it can set off a nighttime adventure for all of us. You sure? Mr. Galliard asked. I told your dad that I would bring you home. I'm sure. It's only about a quarter mile, and the night's warm. The other man started to protest when Lance told him. It's okay. He put his will behind the command and watched it settle over the man like a warm blanket. Okay, but I want you to be careful. Mr. Galliard said. I always am. Best to be safe, not sorry, Lance replied as the car pulled into the drive and then backed out to turn around on a lane. There you go, Mr. Galliard told him. I'll call your dad tomorrow. Thanks, Lance told him, hopping out and hoping that he'd be able to explain it tomorrow. Last time he felt something like this was when the guiner yanking him through the bedroom window without ever touching him. There was another arcane out there and it was not friendly. He watched the towel lights disappear down the road before turning back towards the house. If he could get to the woodpile, that was where he kept an axe ready. If not, then he'd have to make do, because something told him that he wasn't going to avoid whatever it was that was out there. Walking along the sand of the drive, he began expanding his senses. Concentrating hard, he shifted the shape of his eyes multiplied the number of rods in them and reshaped the cornea and the tape to him. As the colour drained from the world, his eyes picked up more ambient light and he saw the land around him the way a cat does. Turning back to face the tree line and the road, he saw something slide down out of the trees and begin to stalk him. One moment, it appeared to be a gangly white creature with black eyes and bony arms that were too long. It had sickly white skin stretched across its gaunt body. The next instant, it was a girl from his dreams. She seemed to be doing something to the space between them, and was closing fast in what appeared to be short blinks. He stopped and said, You must be Opal. That stopped her. She tilted her head to the side. She hissed with a mouthful of sharp teeth. The usurper knows it. I know what was done to you, he said. What was done does not matter, the thing hissed. Lance noted that it did not try to confuse him with the image of the girl. What matters is what the master wants. You mean West Hall? The Lord West Hall, it protested. Sorry, I'm an American. We don't recognize titles. He told it just to find out how it would react. It began to tremble in front of him. What does West Hall want? Master wants all of the father's line wiped from the face of the earth. And its voice became nearly putulent. Why? Lance asked. Because Captain McNaughton killed him. It doesn't ask why. It only does as it's told. The thing hissed. Lance noticed that his arm started to grow in length. Its hands spread wide, and the fingers grew into something that looked like tines of a rake. You are my great-grandfather's sister. I don't want to fight you, he said. You are family. The only family is master, it spat angrily. Not the usurper. Usurper? What have I taken of yours? He demanded, and it looked around, waving its long black clawed hands to encompass the whole of Bontreval. This. It hissed. This is all should be mine, not yours. I don't want it, Lance told it. The only thing that is mine is in the house behind me. If you want to go there, you have to go through me. It looked confused. 
usurper talks too much, it hissed as it launched a rake-like arm at him from twenty feet away. And ducking and spinning inside to avoid the claws, Lance got in too close for it to bring them to bear. Hopefully, he kicked it dead in the chest with everything he had, making sure to keep his other heel flat on the ground. He was rewarded with a solid crunch as the thing was hurled down the drive and across the road. It lashed its overly long hands and arms out to its side and brought itself to a stop using her limbs and trunks of the trees. It fights like its father! Lance shook his head and said, No, Captain McNaughton wouldn't kill you because you were blood of his blood. I don't care. What I care about is behind me. You are in front of me. I will kill you. The thing that had once been Opal McNaughton hissed incoherently, pulled its arms until they were only slightly out of proportion, and charged. Lance dodged the first wild swing, stepped in and delivered another powerful blow to its hip. It twisted in midair and lashed out with his other clawed hand, and he felt the black nails bite into his left side, his hip and forearm. They burned like fire and then became numb. He looked down in horror as the flesh where he had been hit became black and began to peel back and putrefy, revealing a muscle and bone beneath it. Oh, hell no, he said looking up as the thing bounced down the road, turning over and over like some animated tumbleweed. When it scrambled to recover from its kick, Lance looked down at the wound on his arm and hoped it was something that would heal. He worried because this thing was like the first Gwyner, part of his bloodline and could therefore hurt him. He considered his options and none of them were good. His best bet was to get a weapon to keep this thing at bay. Turning, he raced up the drive to where the axe lay against the woodpile. He could hear the thing close in the distance with him by squelching the space between them. It seemed to have to do this in jumps, so it couldn't be on top of him instantly, and that was good. He could smell its fretted breath on his neck as he reached with one hand for the axe and a piece of firewood with the other. He ducked and rolled backwards as the thing propelled itself over him and smashed into the woodpile. It was a horrific ruckus as the thing tumbled through the hardwood scattering logs all up and under the house, some banging the metal building where his dad kept tools. That was going to wake up the whole entire house, and sure enough, as it picked itself up, the front deck lights went on. What the hell is going on down there? Brandy began barking and growling loudly. For the love of God, Dad! Lance screamed. Stay in the house and keep Lucy and Dale with you. Of course, his dad wasn't going to listen. He saw him turn to someone in the house and say, Get me the rifle. Lance watched the thing turn and look at his dad and gave him a horrible smile. He winked away and appeared halfway up the stairs leading to the deck. Lance launched himself through the air, aiming for the spot halfway between the thing and the front door. He had a theory about how the squints had worked. He'd prefer to gather more data, but he didn't have the luxury. All he could do was a scream and leap and hope he was right. And he was right enough. The thing came out of its blink right where he thought it would. He hit its shoulder first from the back as Brandy launched herself out of the door, teeth bared and aiming through the throat. The force of the two blows carried Lance, Brandy and the emaciated creature high into the air and out over the yard. And for what seemed to be a long moment, the three bodies were suspended in mid-air. Then they began to fall from the good twenty foot up. Lance reached down and grabbed Brandy's collar and pulled the puppy to him as he twisted the monster under them. If he timed it right, he could land on it with the full force of their mass. Much to his horror, the thing winked away just before they hit the ground. Lance used his legs to absorb as much of the shock as he could and then released the dog as he tucked and rolled. It didn't come to a stop until he slammed head first into the side of the stairs leading up to the deck. Rolling away, holding his head and trying to clear his vision of stars, he heard the lever go back on his dad Henry. Then the 4470 barked. His dad chambered another round and the Henry barked again. Lance staggered to his feet and looked across the yard where the thing was moving towards him, dragging one of its arms uselessly behind it. Next to him, Brandy growled low and tried to put herself between him and the thing. Brandy, no, guard Dale. He barked at the dog, putting his will behind the command. The dog stopped dead in its track and bounded up the steps to protect the little boy. Bam, clutch, bam, clutch, bam, clutch, bam. The Henry barked again and again as the thing continued to advance on Lance. 
He could see huge holes blowing through the dead white flesh as black ichor poured from its wounds, and it kept coming. Hefting the axe in his good hand, Lance stepped forward to meet it head on. His left arm and his right were both injured, and so they faced each other squared off, and wailed into the night, not bothering to squinch space, but instead charged him, waving and extending its good arm to take and try and rake him again. The blow went over his head and then twisted low as it snapped back to the thing, trying to rake Lance in, staying low. Lance stepped in and hacked under its ribcage, embedding the axe deep inside its body. Dancing out of the way, he snatched the axe and stood to watch it try and turn toward him. It screamed at him again as his form began to wink back and forth from the thing to opal to the thing. He growled at it. Won't work. I don't give a damn if it killed a thing or if I kill opal. Family, it hissed. You are not my family. Whatever you are, you cease to be family when you murdered my mother. He growled, realizing it was using his own earlier argument against it. Woman, it pleaded, thinking that Lance's hand would be stayed by its gender. Lance shook his head and growled. Not as far as I can tell. He drew back the axe to see what the thing would do next, and it kept summoning the image of Opal, but slowly and surely, Opal was melding into the thing. Stepping forward to finally end it, he heard his father bark, Lance, stay down! The Henry barked several more times, and Lance watched as two forty-four seventy rounds slammed into its head and blew out the back of its skull. Now, cut its head off, his dad yelled. Lance looked back at him, holding an axe in his hand. You think? He stumbled forward and raised the axe. Much to his surprise, the thing was blinking at him. The black ichor on its face looked like tears pleading for mercy. Lance hesitated for just a second. Suddenly a sharp pain pierced his thigh and he looked down to where its good hand was trying to yank him from his feet. He swung the axe with everything he had in his body. In a single blow, he severed the head from the thing's body. The white head rolled away and slowly began to change into that of a girl, Opal. Looking down at the body that held him by the leg, it too slowly became Opal again. Then the years seemed to pile up on the body and it began to quickly decay until only dust remained to be stirred by the cool gulf wind. For long moments, he stood there staring at the dust as it slowly rose into the air and spread itself across the fields of Bon Travel. He shook his head and wondered what was next. His life had been turned upside down since he woke up in that hospital room last year. He'd been attacked three times by creatures out of the most twisted nightmares he could dream. He had survived by the skin of his teeth all three times, saved only by his witcheries and high-caliber rifles. He looked around at the mess. The damage wasn't as bad as it could have been. There was a dent in the metal storage building and the firewood that had got scattered. It could have been far worse. He didn't know how long he'd stood there looking off into the distance when Brandy and Dale came up to him. His brother slipped his hand into his and asked, You gonna keep this up? Keep what up? Killing these things before they can get to the rest of us? I'd like not to have to. Me too, Dow said. By the way, your eyes are freaking cool. How do you do that? Huh? Lance asked. Your eyes. They glow like cats and their shape is kind of funny. How do you do that? Lance groaned and then remembered the changes he'd made to see better. I don't know what you're talking about. He smiled as he turned to face his brother, his eyes looking normal. They all just laughed and said, Come on inside. I'm sure Mum wants to look at those cuts. Lance looked down at the dead flesh around the wound and shuddered. Oh, looks awful. They all sniffed and said, Smells worse. Now go and let Mum do her thing with a mercurochrome. Lance smiled at him and said, I'm not sure I'd rather lose an arm. Up to you. His brother said, You're going to enjoy this, aren't you? Me? Dale asked. What do you think? Huh. I think you're going to enjoy this a little bit too much, Rabbit. And so, without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled A Tale of the Witchkin. The Hunters Hunted, Hounds of the Hunt. 
let's get straight into that. The harvest moon flashed silvery through the trees, giving Tyler Winters a little light to pick his way through the forest north of the city. His gun was unloaded and the breach was exposed as the law required of him an hour after sunset. With the decreased lights, the rich golds and yellows of the trees had faded to ash and the carpet of the leaves on the forest floor had disappeared into a low rising fog. The going was slow and the walk back along the creek towards the old country road where he'd parked his dad's pickup was long. He shivered against the drop in temperature despite the warm gulf autumn. Tyler had been born and raised in the Mobile Bay area and with the exception of a few trips across the gulf to New Orleans with his parents, he'd never been that far from home and he was pretty happy with that idea. He liked the wild beauty of the gulf coast, he even liked the hot summers and warm winters, he liked the food, he liked the people. He liked to hunt and fish and he liked being outdoors and even enjoyed roughing it when he could go camping with friends from school. In the distance, he heard a long, deep howl that sent a shiver down his spine. At first, he thought it might be a coyote. They were, after all, fairly common in the area, usually going after small game like rabbit and squirrel, sometimes a deer. But this howl was deeper, stronger, and there was a challenge to it that made Tyler's blood run cold. Unconsciously, his hand went to the loaded 45 at his side. Most hunters in the area carried a firearm for defensive purposes. At 16, it was technically illegal for Tyler to have it, but he felt better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. And the game warden in the area tended to look the other way, as long as it was carried in the open, and you didn't make a fool of yourself. Over the past few years in the area, there had been several sightings of both wolves and cougars, sometimes called swamp painters. Picking up his pace, he headed towards his dad's pickup while watching the ground. The forest had grown silent, and a palpable power had fallen over the woods as the fog began to thicken. Nearby, a low growl came from below a darkened embankment. A warm wind blew down Tyler's neck, and he thought he caught the scent of something dank and musty. Spinning around, he saw a large form charging towards him with an uneasy gait that was part animal and part human. Tyler felt his bows threaten to give way as he fumbled with a hammer thong for the 45 on his hip, and he bet he got it cleared before the creature was on him. He fired once, bang, point blank into the slavering moor before it bore him to the ground. The rapport of the old colt was like thunder in his face as his vision was suddenly blanketed by a wall of fur, muscle, and claw. Hitting the ground hard, he pulled the gun up tight against his body, pointed it away from him, and emptied the gun into the mass, pinning him to the ground before he was able to roll free and stagger to his feet. Some part of his mind noted that the huge beast's fur was a golden honey colour and was spattered with blood and brains. Looking down at the gun, still in his hands, he began to tremble and then shake. And suddenly, his stomach rebelled and he fell to his knees, emptying its contents all over the ground nearby as the shadows of madness began to close in around his mind. When the heaves became dry and cottony, he wiped his mouth and staggered to his feet towards the road. Not seeing the beast's head had begun to stitch itself back together of its own volition. He was halfway there, still holding the colt in one hand, when he was blindsided, and this time, he never saw the slow stalk of the giant wolf-like creature when it hit him from behind. His vision exploded into a thousand lights, and he tasted the hummus of this warm swamp, just before powerful jaws closed around the back of his neck, severing his spine. Tyler Winter's last thoughts were that he should have left the woods an hour ago. Under the Thursday Night Lights, Silver Hill Junior High. Ladies and gents, this has been a slugfest like the Bay Area hasn't seen in ages. Ten seconds left in the game, and the score is tied at 30 all between the Silver Hill Silver Panthers and the De Belleville Timber Wolves. The Panthers have it on their own 40-yard line. Silver Hill has not won this match up in the last 20 years, but they have a chance to put it away now. 
Remember folks, there is no overtime in regular season play. So this drive either sees a win or a tie for both teams. Coach Harris has his do or die squad on the line against a defence that just about doubles their size. The ball is snapped. McKnight steps back into the pocket and looks downfield. Harry and Lee close around Morrison. Morrison breaks the block and darts downfield at full speed. The pocket collapses and McKnight scrambles to the left. He has two linebackers closing in on him. He steps into the throw and launches it downfield to Morrison. And as he's hit by two massive defenders. Morrison leaps to catch the bullet and as it hits him between the numbers, he wraps it up in time to be hit by the defender. But it knocks him over the goal line. Touchdown Panthers! Panthers win! After 20 years, the Panthers win! The announcer's voice made the game sound like it was the national playoffs and everything was on the line. Lance looked up at the linebacker who had taken him down. Play's over. Either get off me or get me dinner or a movie. He growled, trying to wriggle free of the other boy. Watch your mouth, runt, number six told him. For just a moment, the other player's eyes flashed yellow and Lance felt the vibe that identified another arcane surge through his gut. The smell of sweaty human mixed with wet dog suddenly permeated his senses as the bigger boy leered over him and licked his lips. The fetid odour coming from his breath smelled like a mixture of rotten meat and facial matter. Reaching up, he grabbed the other player by the back of the pads and yanked hard to the side and down. The guy twisted onto his back and then slammed into the hard turf with so much force that the wind should have been knocked from him. Lance scrambled to his feet and told him, plays over and so is the ball game. You lose. He looked at the scoreboard that showed the new score, 36 to 30. For just a moment, Lance thought the guy was going to shift right there on the field as he rolled over and arched his back, growling. What are you? The other player demanded in a voice far deeper and gravely than any college player, much less a junior high kid, should have. In more control of myself than you, Lance growled back and put his will behind it. And I just want to be left alone. The other player stopped halfway from standing up as Lance's command hit him. He growled suddenly and then launched himself at Lance, clawed hands seeking purchase against Lance's flesh, jumping to the side and let the other player hit the turf face first, noting the last name on his jersey with a touch of irony. It read, Wolf. A whistle sounded and then a flag landed at the other boy's feet. Lance wasn't sure what the rules were about unsportsmanlike conduct after the game. Much to his surprise, Tom, Paul, Peter and Bobby were suddenly behind him. Their arms crossed as if daring the Deberville players to start something. Two players from the Deberville leapt in and tried to restrain their teammates who shuddered and shook them off. He spun on Lance and looked at the four other boys behind him and his eyes flashed amber. Suddenly, the whole field erupted as the entire Silver Hill fan section poured out onto the field. Band, cheerleaders, parents and all, swallowing up both teams and sweeping them apart in celebration. It took the officials 15 minutes to clear the field again. And then they decided on offsetting penalties, which pretty much meant the whole thing was a wash. But what did it tell Lance was that there was far more to the Deberville team than met the eye. He wondered if Wolf was the only theory and thrope on their team. After they hit the showers and were getting ready to leave, Coach Harris called Lance over and asked, Exactly what did Wolf say to you or do to you? Lance shook his head and said, The play was over. I was down and Tom was in the end zone and the moron wouldn't get off me, so I tossed him off me. Coach listened to him and said, I can say that I can't blame you, but try to keep it under wraps next time, huh? You wouldn't say that if you smelled his breath, Lance said. Oh, that bad, huh? Coach asked with a chuckle. Ever met someone whose breath smells like a toilet? Lance asked. Harris nodded and said, Usually means poor hygiene or some kind of digestive disorder. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a combination of both, Lance told him, looking back to where Bobby, Tom, Peter and Paul were waiting. He smiled in the thought of his friends having his back, even though he didn't really need it. Go on, you five, get out of here. I understand Mrs. Clark has a test for you guys in civics tomorrow. Yes, sir, Lance said and turned to join the other four. 
Great throw, Lance, Paul told him. Wouldn't have got there if you guys hadn't covered for me. And Tom, so you couldn't get downfield. About that, Tom said. Yeah, Lance asked. The other boy held up his shirt to reveal a nasty bruise right in the middle of his chest. Next time, Paul, or Peter goes downfield. I get more bruises from catching your long passes than I do from being hit by the other team. <laughs> I hope that's a problem we all have, Bobby said with a grin. But I'm not sure we can switch it up. You guys realise that our next three games are on the road, but are going to be pushovers. <laughs> Don't count your chicks before they hatch, because you work until it's done. Lance quoted one of his favourite songs. Yeah, 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 Bobby countered. But our chances are good to go to state this year. Playoffs can be fun, Tom said with a grin. Even with broken ribs. It didn't hit you that hard, Peter teased him. It hit me hard enough to knock me over the goal line. I thought it was their safety, Lance replied. That was what it looked like before the walking dog pile took me down. Tom shook his head and said, No, if he had been able to hold on to me, I would have come down onto the one-yard line. That spiral knocked me out of his hands and across the goal. Lance smiled and said, I'll try to take it easier next time. What do you guys have planned for this weekend? Bobby asked, changing the subject. Not much, Paul replied. Same for me, Peter answered. I've got to go to my sister's recital Saturday, Tom complained. You, Lance? Bobby pressed. Well, my uncle and his family are visiting. They just bought a house over on 6th Street here in Silver Hill. We're supposed to spend Saturday helping them move in. So I'm going to be tied up with family. But there's going to be a picking on Saturday night. You guys are welcome to come. Peter, Bobby and Paul looked at each other. Something seemed to pass between them. And Pete shrugged. Uh, could be fun. What time does it start? Well, the grill gets fired up about six. Again, the boys looked at each other. Then Bobby smiled and said, I've heard about these things. Some of Ted Galliard's cooler friends have mentioned them. They say they sound like fun. I'm looking forward to finding out. A bit surprised that they acknowledged Ted, or that anybody other than Ted and Diane had paid attention to the pickings, Lance smiled and told them, Great. Can't wait to see you guys there. Then, checking his watch, he said, I better get going. My dad is probably waiting on me. Indeed, his dad, his stepmom, and Dale along with his uncle Larry and two people he'd never met before were standing at the gate. One was obviously Larry's new wife. She was tall, shapely blonde, who appeared to be in her mid to late twenties. The other was a girl his own age with the same colouring and build. Both had blue eyes and what his stepmother called a milkmaid complexion. Larry! Lance yelled and broke out into a run to hug his favourite uncle. He was shorter than Lance's dad and about four years younger. He had the same hair, but a stockier build, and he always seemed to have a sly smile in his eyes, as if he knew something you didn't. On his forearm was a tattoo of a bee wearing a sailor's hat and a machine gun in its first two hands, a wrench in the second, and a hammer in the third. And above it were the words, US Navy Seabees, and below it, Can Do. He was by far Lance's favourite uncle, and was the one who had originally inspired Lance to shoot for an appointment to the Naval Academy. In his own history, his Uncle Larry was his own uncle that had not passed on his dad's side. Whoa, Lance, when did you start working out? Lance put the man down on the ground and said, I thought you weren't going to be here until tomorrow. Lance felt his face split with a wide grin. What? I miss a touchdown pass like that? you got to be kidding. You'll be playing for Alabama before it's over. Lance shook his head. No, Navy. Well, at least it's not Auburn. Larry said with a sly smile. My second choice, Lance told him. Oh well, nobody's perfect, Larry replied as he tussled the boy's long blonde hair. I'm sure this all means something to them, the girl next to the woman said. She had a faint French accent. Lance gave her a smile and replied in his best French, only slightly less important than her own right arms, miss. Tu parles français, the girl exclaimed. Lance smiled at her and said in English, poorly and with a bad accent. Where did you learn French? His dad spun on him and demanded in a surprise, Boone, ah, Mr. Dubois has been teaching me. Lance lied. 
He could hardly tell his father that, in his other life, he'd learned to speak it while studying the Lecoq's cave paintings in Montignac, 13 years from now. He had been told his pronunciation was horrible and his accent worse than an Englishman's. He's done a very good job at it, the woman said with a smile. And it's such a pleasant welcome. Lance grinned broadly and playfully told her in French, Then I have done at least one good thing today. He then bowed slightly to her and added, I am told my accent is atrocious. Lance, this is my wife, Macy, and her daughter, Cassandra Whelan. His uncle interjected. Lance smiled and told the lady, It's a pleasure to meet you. You as well, young Lance, the woman said. Perhaps it is diminutive of Lancelot, as in Lancelot du Lac? Yes, ma'am, Lance told her. But when I hear Lancelot instead of Lance, it usually means I'm in trouble. He then turned to the pretty girl he'd first addressed and said, It's a pleasure to meet you too, Cassandra. This one will be charming the birds from the trees, Cassandra said with a smile. Hello. She greeted him before she looked back at the stadium and said, American football is very different from in Europe. We like it, Lance told her. Suddenly, Dow kicked him in the shin. What did you do that for, rabbit? Lance demanded. You owe me a dollar he said, reminding Lance that he was there. What? You bet me that you would beat Debeville by three points. I, I said a touchdown. You owe me a buck. Lance grinned at him and said, I'll pay you when we get home. I don't have my wallet with me. Okay, the 11-year-old said, crossing his arms. And I'll pay you back for kicking me. I can't wait. Dow's voice was suddenly a whole lot less confident. Lance looked over at the bus from Debeville. He saw Wolf climbing on. The other boy stopped and looked towards him. For just a moment, Lance saw him flash yellow eyes. Oh, can we get out of here? Sounds good, his dad told him as they headed towards Lucy's Dodge and his uncle's Ram Charger. As his dad started up the dart, he looked back at Lance and said, You and Dow sleeping in the living room tonight. Larry and Macy are going to take your bed, and Cassandra will sleep in Dale's. Oh, that's cool, Lance told him. I'll take the couch and we can put a pallet on the floor for Dale. The next morning was a bit of a challenge to get Lance and Dale off to school without awakening their guests, but they managed it. For the most part, it was just a normal day, that is, until the last period of sports, when Bobby, Paul, Pete and Tom cornered him in the locker room at the end of the day. As Lance laced up his sneakers, he suddenly found himself surrounded by the rest of Coach Harris's do-or-die squad. He looked up and asked, What's up, guys? We want to talk to you, Bobby said. About? Lance asked, feeling a bit nervous. He let his mind reach out. He could find no animosity, only worry and concern. Well, for one thing, those scars on your arm, hip and side, Bobby said. You didn't get those from the guiner. Lance looked down to where Opal McNaughton's claws had raked him. The scars were indeed nasty, and in some cases, still healing. The mercurochrome Lucy had used on them had burned like fire, even worse than the claws themselves, but it had at least cleansed the wounds and let his own accelerated healing kick in and close them. He suspected that he was going to have them for the rest of his life. Got into a fight with a relative, Lance said. She likes sharp things. Right, Tom said. And that guiner was really a bear. Sarcasm dripped from his voice. Lance smiled and said, oh, Really? She was a relative. What kind of relative? Pete demanded. Look, we know there's some weird crap going on here. We're not going to talk about it outside of the people who were there. But we're worried about how you keep getting targeted. First, it was the Guiner. Then, it was one in Kentucky. And now you're sharp with scars that look like they've been burned into your skin. It's got us worried. Lance smiled wanely. He was genuinely touched by their concern. I appreciate that, Pete. You don't know how much I appreciate it. But, as you say, weird crap keeps happening to me. I don't know why, but it seems like I'm a magnet for them. Could it have something to do with how strong and hard it is to hurt you? Bobby asked. We're not stupid. We know you can outrun us to get to the site where my dad was killed. We know how fast you can be. And you could see and hear things at night that none of the rest of us could. 
When that guana hit you, it left deep scratches, but nothing like it did to Donna. Finally, it tossed you into a limb that was 15 feet above the ground, and you bounced off without anything serious at all. Well, don't worry, we're not going to tell anyone else, Pete quickly interjected. We just want to understand it. Lance just nodded and said, I appreciate that even more, and shrugged and decided that half-truth would be better than the whole thing or a lie. Yes, I'm faster, stronger, more alert and harder to hurt. I'm not exactly sure why, but I have some theories that I don't want to discuss because well, they scare me. But I think that's the reason that I'm this way, why weird stuff keeps happening. Like that defensive guard who looked like he was about to turn into some kind of werewolf on you? Bobby asked. Yeah, like that guy, Lance said. I think that there is something that bunches people like me up with people like him. He sighed and added, But you guys need to know that I do everything I can to keep them away from my friends and family. Paul just snorted and said, We don't give a damn about that. What we are here to talk about is that we want you to know that we've got your back. Anybody starts something, we're going to be right there in the middle of it. He paused a moment and then asked, uh, Do Diane and Ted know? Shaking his head, Lance replied, No. They know that there was a guina and that I killed it, but they don't know how or any of the other stuff. Ted may suspect though. As for having my back, I'm thankful for that. But I'd much rather you run if something shows up. It's safer for you. Nah. -uh. Pete said, shaking his head. You got us out of those mountains alive. You did everything you could do to make sure we all survived. What kind of friends would we be if we ran every time something like this happened? Live ones, for starters, Lance said. We'll take our chances, Paul told him firmly. Then, looking up at the clock, he added, We better get out of here before Coach sends someone looking for us. And with that, they all headed out the door, talking about what they could expect on Saturday night. In nearly 30 years on the force, Sheriff Howard Ledbetter had seen some pretty gruesome sights, from car accident decapitations to bloody bodies shot over 30 times, but this particular scene was one that would haunt him for a long time. Not just because of the ghastliness of it, the fact that this was a kid barely old enough to even drive a car. They'd got the call in last night when the Winters kid had not come home from going hunting after school. It took them until midnight to find the Chevy pickup pulled off Young Neck Road onto a game trail. It wasn't until this morning when they found the body. Poor kid had been nearly torn in half. Most of his organs had been devoured. Worse yet, the old 45 handgun he carried had been emptied. Backtracking his trail, they found another site where there was lots of blood and tissue all over the forest floor and a nearby pile of spent 45 casings, along with evidence that someone had been sick. This was not going to go well. Just last year, there had been a middle school guidance counsellor who'd gone missing. Where they found his body, it looked like a swamp painter had been at him. This site looked about the same, except instead of big cat tracks, it looked like wolf tracks, and damn big they were. This was the kind of thing he was going to need to talk to Mary Beaumere about, and that was never a pleasant proposition. Still, it could not be helped. Beaumere was a force to be reckoned with all across Mobile Bay area, and one who answered to no one but herself. He knew that not to inform her would mean being called on the carpet about it by the mayor, so he resigned himself to the notion. Hell, even Sheriff Withers over in Baldwin County answered to her, looking over at the assistant coroners loading what was left of the body into a van, and said, Have Martin call me when he can give me a cause of death. The two men turned to him with disbelief in their expressions. He frowned slightly and said, I know, I know. I don't need something positive to put in my report. He left out the two Mary Beaumere part, it was understood, if not spoken. He climbed into his cruiser, a 72 Javelin he bought in a special sow to law enforcement only from Highway Patrol a couple of years ago. 
It was the fastest thing south of Hoi Town. He enjoyed driving it, even if it was a bit cramped. He looked up at the dash and realized that it was nearly dark. Been one hell of a day, he mumbled to himself as the engine roared to life. On the way back to the city, he pulled into a rather upscale neighborhood of Westmont and drove until he found the old Georgian structure that had once been the big house to the Antebellum plantation. Better to get this meeting over quickly. He still had a lot of paperwork to fill out before he called it quits for the night. He didn't even have to knock as a tall red-haired butler met him at the door. Is she in, Donaldson? Afternoon, Sheriff, the man said unfazed. The missus is in the library. She said to ask you to join her. He took the sheriff's hat from him. Ledbetter smiled and nodded. Thank you. Donaldson led Ledbetter to the door and knocked upon hearing a query inside. He opened the door and said, Sheriff Ledbetter, madam. The room was large, with a rich maple wainscoting along the walls, and above it was a Prussian blue and gold wallpaper that seemed to absorb shadows. The curtains in front of the French doors leading out to the patio behind a house were pulled into a cascade of gold cloth, and the late evening sun was pouring rich copper light through them to create splashes of colour across the hardwood floor. Mrs. Beaumont was standing in front of the window, looking out at the afternoon sky. Mary Beaumont was one of those women whom age seemed to be frightened. She was tall, with a blonde hair that was only now starting to silver. Her skin was smooth, but not taut like Howard had seen on women with facelifts. She wore only a smidgen of makeup. Her most salient feature, though, were her eyes. And they were a piercing blue that cut to a man's soul like sapphire lasers. You wanted to see me, Sheriff? Howard nodded and said, Yes, ma'am. I know you like to be informed of this kind of thing, so I thought I'd let you know before you read it in the papers. Mm, go on, she said with a smile as she turned to face him. We had a boy go missing last night. He never returned home from hunting out on Young Neck Road. We found him this morning. It looks like he was killed by a large animal, either a dog or a wolf. I see, she replied. Any chance on catching that animal? I don't know yet. First, we have to confirm that was what had killed him, not just what ate him. Mm, could be coyotes, she asked. Mm, I doubt it. The tracks were large. It also looks like he emptied a forty-five caliber handgun into it. Either he's a very bad shot, or it's one hell of a... a heck of a canine. She smiled at him, but he could see concern in her eyes. Thank you for stopping by to let me know. I know it seems strange that I asked to be kept in a loop on this kind of thing, but I really want what's best for the Mobile Bay area. It was a subtle dismissal, but a dismissal nonetheless. Sheriff Ledbetter nodded and said, If you will excuse me, Mrs. Beaumare, I have other cases to follow up on. Of course, Sheriff. She frowned and turned back to the window as Ledbetter left the room and retrieved his hat from Donaldson. As the evening approached and the sun dipped beneath the western horizon, Louvre Chastel slipped from between the covers and began to stir. The early evening light cast shadows onto the wall as she stood and stretched. Her right shoulder was still somewhat stiff and her face more than a little numb. Padded nude across the heavy carpet to the lavatory, she turned on the water and waited for the shower to get hot. After a few moments, and she was satisfied with the temperature. She stepped in and began to soak the shoulder under the heavy stream, working the kinks out of it. When the stiffness began to recede, she turned her face into the water and repeated the process. Finally, she went about her daily toiletries to prepare for the evening. Tracking her prey was easy while on the road, but once they entered certain cities, her senses began to fail her. No, not so much fail as confuse her. Certain cities, and especially this one, gave off such a strong aura of the arcane that a praise aura became lost in a sea of background power. It had been the same back in Salem. Tracking Macy and Cassandra to Salem had been easy, but the area was so steeped in the arcane that she could not pinpoint them. It wasn't until they began to move again that she had left that particular place that she sensed them once again travelling 
and this time towards the south. After dressing, she picked up the phone and dialed a very special number. She listened for a while as it transferred through several receiving stations that would scramble the signal on one side and put it back together on the other. It was best if OAI were not informed of her presence here. They'd just send one of their arcane agents to thwart her mission, and then it would get messy, and apologies would have to be made all round. After a single ring, a voice on the other end answered in a Russian accent with the Academy's recognition catchphrase, Without further ado. Let's get straight into it, she answered. Report! I have arrived in the Mobile Bay area. I have tracked my targets this far, but once again, they are lost in the haze of the area's background arcane aura. Understood, the voice said. Both targets must be eliminated with extreme prejudice. Very well, she replied. Who and where is my local academy contact? Professor Carter Bass of Gulf City University, Department of Social Sciences. A meeting will be arranged. The details come later. In the interim, you are to study the city. The academy has placed a do not approach injunction on the local arcane with ties to the Dubois family. Do not approach, however, does not preclude gathering information for our files. You are to observe one Lancelot Kendall McKnight, age 14, of Bontreval Plantation, and classify as many enhancements he might have to the best of your ability. Is that age correct? Louvray asked. 14 is unusually young for an arcane with DNAS, she asked. It is, her contact told her. He may need to be eliminated at a future date, but his involvement with the Dubois family is problematic. I see, she told him. Certain families could cause more problems for the Academy's research and development programs than even the Office of Arcane Investigations or the Soviet drug oil Slevostrenoi Brayunu. And the Dubois were at the top of that list, right alongside Westhall. I am sure you understand the sensitivity of any surveillance's activities, the man on the other end of the phone said. I understand, she told him. Is this Bontravel a city? No, it is a plantation just south of the Gulf City, opposite the Mobile Bay area. Please include appropriate information on this McKnight subject with a drop. Understood. The voice said before signing off with the Academy's all-clear phrase, Be safe. Not sorry, she answered before hanging up the phone. It would become necessary to begin a grid-like search pattern to find her sister and niece. It was something she'd done in Salem, eventually flushing them out of the city and sending them skittering south. Keeping the bloodline pure was too important to the Academy, to allow for her sister's dalliance to pollute one of the most refined lycanthropic bloodlines this side of Sackenkelberg, Gotha. It would be several hours before a contact could be arranged, much less the information drop defined. In the meantime, she could indulge herself in other pursuits. Grabbing her purse, she left the hotel for a private hunt. Cassandra awoke to the sunrise to the east of the strange house on stilts. Her stepfather had explained that in 1968, a hurricane had devastated the Gulf Coast and the house had been rebuilt to withstand another one. The hosts, her stepfather's brother, wife and children, were very polite in trying to be as quiet as possible as they prepared for their day. Lying quietly in bed, she tried to understand how she had ended up nearly 5,000 miles away from a home in Brittany, to arrive in the Gulf Coast of the United States. She knew that she and her mother were running from her aunt Louvet, a woman her mother feared to a near irrational level. She had her suspicions too. The eight years that spent in Salem had honed not only her majesty of the English language, but also the witcheries she had begun to exhibit a few years ago. Witcheries her mother did not share, but seemed to sense without Cassandra understanding. They were witcheries that her mother had paid good money to more than one tutor to help her master. 
she was being taught. Not the Gardenarian forms of magic, but something much older, much darker, and that actually worked. Recently, she had realized that she was being trained in the basic tenets of Druidism, Saith, Spacecraft, and Gulder. Waiting until it was clear that Lance, Dale, and Mr. McKnight had left for the day, she came out of Dale's room to find Mrs. McKnight sitting at the kitchen table drinking a cup of coffee. Good morning, Cassandra, the strawberry blonde woman said with a smile. Uh, good morning, Mrs. McKnight, she replied. Can I get you something to eat? Lance made biscuits this morning. They're really pretty good. Better than I ever expect a man's to be. We have bacon and sausage. I'll fix you some eggs if you want. Uh, thank you, Mrs. McKnight. That would be nice. Okay. We're going to have to get past this Mrs. McKnight thing. Technically, your mother is now Mrs. McKnight too. And that's going to get confusing. You may call me Aunt Lucy or even Lucy if you prefer. She smiled and said, Yes, ma'am. Good. Now, how would you like your eggs? However you usually prepare them, she answered. Scrambled it is then, the tall, thin woman said, raising from her chair. Then thinking of something, she asked, Do you drink coffee? Yes, ma'am, Cassandra told her. Thought so, the other woman said, getting her a mug down from the cabinet and pouring coffee from an electric percolator. Cream and sugar? Sugar, please, Cassandra told her. Nodding, the woman put a teaspoon of sugar in the mug and handed it to her as she turned back to the cabinets. Now, while I'm fixing you some eggs, why don't you tell me about yourself, and I'll try to answer whatever questions you might have about our family. The woman was open and direct to the point. It was something that Cassandra found refreshing after living in the dual world of the Witchkin in Salem and the regular world. Although Cassandra had sensed definite witcheries on Lance, the rest of the family seemed to be as mundane as most. This woman lived in a single world of cut and dried reality, not the blending of shadow and light of the Witchkin, especially of that of Salem. I'm not sure where to begin, Cassandra told her. Well, why don't we start with the basics? It's obvious that you and your mother are French, especially your mother. You, however, seem to have picked up a more northern accent. Cassandra smiled and said, We moved to Salem after my father died when I was six. Papa was Irish, and we were very happy in Jevaudan. Then he was killed, and mother decided to move us here. Killed? Lucy asked leaving how much to answer or whether to answer at all, up to Cassandra. Yes, ma'am. It was an animal attack. Cassandra immediately felt a change in a woman's demeanor. What kind of animal? Shrugging, Cassandra told her. I don't know much of the details. Mother doesn't like to talk about it, but I think it was a wolf. Oh, sorry, the woman told her with a small frown. And so you moved to Salem. That must have been interesting. It was. It's an old city with lots of history. Not all of it very nice. Hmm. That's what I've heard, Lucy replied. I know you've seen very little of it, but what do you think of the Mobile, Gulf City area? It's warmer, she said. Salem had very cold winters. And very expensive ones, her mother said, coming down the hall, already dressed for the day. Lucy smiled and said, I'm about to fix Cassandra some eggs. Would you like some as well? Thank you, her mother said. Glad to do it, Lucy replied. Cassandra was telling me about living in Salem. Cold is the first word I'd use, her mother replied. How do you think you will like it here? I'm hoping it will be a good change for us, her mother replied, nodding to her. Lucy returned the nod and said, Larry's a good man. I'm glad to see he's found himself a good woman. He deserves it. I've gotten that impression of all the McKnight men that I've met. No, oh, don't let Dale fool you. He's a rapscallion and a half. We have to keep the doors locked at night because he sleepwalks. Although, he seemed to have stopped that since we got Brandy. Your dog? Cassandra asked. Yeah, she has helped a lot in keeping him from wandering. She definitely made Lance's life easier on that front. Lance is not your son? The mother asked. Uh, biologically, no. He's my stepson, but that doesn't mean I don't love him just the same. He's a really good kid who has had a couple of rough years. 
He's a straight-A student, quarterback, and is becoming an excellent guitar player. He's the kind of kid that takes care of his chores without you having to ask him twice. Usually without having to ask him once. He's very focused. And Dow helps him break that focus and reminds him to be a kid again. Rough years? Cassandra asked. Lucy nodded and said with a frown. Uh, you're going to hear about it from the rest of the family anyway, so I might as well tell you what really happened. Not the outlandish stuff the rest of my family is telling. Larry said that he had a nervous breakdown, but has recovered. Lucy nodded her head and said, Yeah, Lance's caretaker instincts are too strong for a boy at that age. He tries to fix everything and everyone. Kendall and his ex. Lance's mother have, shall we say, an unpleasant relationship. Lance kept trying to fix their squabbles and it was finally too much for him. With long practice motions, the woman went about the business of preparing a meal, the whole time continuing the conversation. It sent him into a catatonic state. When he came out of it, Lance chose to come live with us, and not his mother. And if you ask me, it's been damn good for the boy. And there was some kind of animal attack? Her mother asked. Huh, which one? More than one? Lucy nodded her head. The first one was right after we moved here. Officially, it was a bear attack. It wrecked my car, and then one night grabbed Dale and ran off into the woods with him. Lance picked up an axe and chased after the thing until we got his brother back. It attacked one more time, and Lance finally killed it with an axe. Why go after Lance and Dale? Surely there are plenty of animals for the bear to eat around here. Same question I've been asking myself. You said there were other attacks. The mother's voice was gentle but probing. Lucy nodded and said, uh, This past summer, Lance went camping with some boys on the football team. They were pretty far back in the mountains of Kentucky when something killed all of the adults. Uh, this time, they said it was a cougar. But we can't get a clear answer out of anyone. In the end, four adults and one girl about Lance's age were killed. Cassandra listened to the story carefully. She could tell the other woman was leaving something out. As Lucy lay out the breakfast table for Cassandra and her mother, Cassandra briefly wondered if Lucy knew her stepson was a witchkin. I can imagine that has made his state of mind, well, more agitated. Lucy shook her head and said, No, not really. I know he carries some guilt because he thinks he should have saved them all. He stays in touch with the girl's surviving sister and brother. But lately, Lance just is. He's a rock-steady presence in our lives that I sometimes wonder how in the world I ever did without. You clearly take care of him, Cassandra's mother said. Yeah, and Dow loves his brother dearly. Since Lance moved in, a lot of Dow's behaviour issues have gotten better. Like I said, he's steady as a rock. As Cassandra and her mother began to eat, Lucy poured herself a cup of coffee and sat down at the table with them. Any idea what Larry has planned for the day? Not really, her mother replied. We are a day ahead of a schedule, so we're talking about riding around town and finding out where everything is. Well, we're out in the boondocks here, Lucy told them. We have to drive to Silver Hill for most of our shopping. What we can't get out here, we go into Dauphin or sometimes Gulf City for. I can show you where the school and stores are. Oh, that would be very kind of you, Cassandra said before her mother could turn down the offer. Cassandra wanted a chance to talk to this woman some more. There was much more going on with Lance and his attacks than she was saying. I definitely explained to her reaction when Cassandra said her father had been killed in an animal attack. After a very good southern style breakfast, Cassandra got ready for her day. And it turned out to be a very good day, with her and her mother riding with Lucy discovering their new city. Meanwhile, her stepdad worked out at their new house getting it ready for the moving trucks that were scheduled to arrive later this evening. About one, they drove over there to take her stepdad some lunch and see how things were coming along. Cassandra was surprised to see how much work the man had gotten done in such a short time. As they pulled up into the yard of the grey Queen Anne her mother and her stepfather had purchased, he was on a ladder in front of the house. He stripped to the waist and was sweating profusely while he was replacing the screws and the boulder strayed at the edge of the deck on the roof of the front porch. Smiling, he climbed down from the ladder and asked, What time is it? 
Did you forget your watch? Lucy asked. I left it at your place. It's too nice to wear out here working. Well, we brought you some lunch, her mother told him with a smile as she held up a bag from a fast food place called Jack's. Lucy tells me that it's your favourite place to eat. She shook her head and added, We're going to have to work on your culinary tastes. Taking a bag, he said, Honey, I'll eat anything you put in front of me as long as it's not my own cooking. I'll hold you to that, she told him with a smile. Please do, he said, putting a cheeseburger from the bag. You ladies aren't eating? We already dined, her mother said. At some place other than Jack's, Lucy added. I Shawnee, you and Dale must keep the whole franchise running as much as you eat there. Larry just shrugged and told them, huh, It tastes good. It's filling and it's quick. Excuse me, Cassandra asked Lucy. But what does a Shawnee mean? Lucy just chuckled and said, It's southern for a swear without using the swear part. She patted her hand and said, Don't worry. Living down here, you're going to find out that southern English is like nothing you've ever encountered. You may even find a few words of French. After all, Mobile is the original home of Mardi Gras. Cassandra smiled and told her, just something to add to my New England vocabulary. About that? Lucy asked. Yes. Is Lance French any good? It was her mother's turn to chuckle. It's not that bad, really. He has a strong Gascon accent that is common in the south of France. It's a bit unusual as it's not normally taught as standard French. It's sort of considered what you'd call a rural or country accent. Leave it to Lance to figure out how to be country, even in French, Lucy said, laughing. I'm unsure if you are laughing at him or with him, Cassandra asked. Her stepfather chuckled and said, Oh, a little bit of both. Mon petit chéri. I take it back. Your accent is worse. She teased her stepfather, something she was only gradually feeling comfortable doing. Hey, I picked that one up from the Cajun buddy of mine in the Navy, he protested. Cajun French is different, her mother told them. Then, with a smile, she turned back to the original subject. Lance's French is fairly good. Like I said, he has a strong accent, both towards English and towards Gascon, with a little Occitan thrown in. But I'm very impressed he was able to say nice things to us in it. That boy surprises me every day and twice on a Sunday, Lucy said with a smile. You never did tell me the time, Larry pointed out. Her mother checked her wristwatch and said, It's half past one. He smiled and said, Then I better get a hurry. The truck should be here in about two hours. He looked over at Lucy and asked, Speaking of Lance, is he going to be available to help me empty the truck? I'll bring him over myself. And we should join them, her mother said. Cassandra just smiled and said, Of course. Ten-year-old Brian Colley knew that monsters were real. They were all around him. Most of the time, they looked and acted like normal people. And most people couldn't tell the difference. But Brian had learned how to throw his eyes out of focus and then pick out the monsters from the people he met. He learned when to avoid these people because the aura they gave off became more intense. One of his teachers, Mrs. Russell, his language arts teacher, was a monster. He didn't know what kind, but he could tell when the monster was the strongest because her aura would turn blood red and full of angry orange sparkles. Then she'd take a couple of days off and come back looking nearly normal. Mr. Farage and his wife who lived at the edge of the swamp on Tillside Creek were monsters, but their auras never flared in anger. When their monster was close, it turned a deep calm in blue. He wondered about that, but still felt it best to give them a wide berth when he could. He learned to separate people by the color of their monster aura. A blue and dark green aura were friendly and nice. If a monster can be such a thing, but light green was venomous. Red was like Mrs. Russell. They got cranky about once a month, but were okay as long as they didn't get angry. They could flash red very quickly, and that usually caused Brian to look around for some place to hide. Red was bad, but black was the worst. It just seemed to suck the life out of anybody around them. He'd seen a few black auras before, and always at night. 
He'd seen a lot of red at night around his house, where the piney woods met the swamp. And lately, there had been a whole lot more. It was Friday evening, and he was curled up on a nutty old sofa that had seen better days watching Diane Prince use her career as an IADC agent as cover for being Wonder Woman. On the opposite end of the sofa was his little sister, Tara, and their German shepherd, Maximilian, named for the dog on the bionic woman. Their mother was currently in the kitchen baking a cake to take to the grandmother's house tomorrow. Their dad had not yet made it home from the fishing boats he'd worked on, which meant that they probably had a good catch and he should have a little extra cash in the pocket. As the program went to commercial, Brian got up to use the toilet when Max's ears suddenly picked straight up and he growled lowly towards the door. He turned at him and asked, What is it, Max? The dog got up from its place next to his sister and growled again, laying its ears back and baring its teeth. Brian heard several boards squeak on the front porch and then a low, animal-like growl. Swallowing hard, he darted barefooted across the faded linoleum floor, scooped up his sister and made a beeline for the kitchen. Tara nearly leaped into his arms when the front door suddenly exploded inward in a shower of wood and glass. Brian felt something hit him in the back just below his shoulder blades as he crossed the threshold into the kitchen. Behind him, Max's growls and barks became the snarls of a fight. Brian didn't want to look back. He poured on the speed to try and get to the Dubois safety of his mother. Hitting a rug in front of the sink that his mother used to absorb water when the kids washed dishes, it suddenly slid out from under him, sending his legs straight out as he stretched out almost horizontally in mid-air. Hitting the floor, he felt a sharp pain in his back and then his head hit the floor and everything was black. Brian awoke with his upper body feeling cold, but no feeling below his chest. The ceiling of the kitchen kept swiping back and forth like he was on a windshield wiper. Looking to the right, he saw the mutilated bodies of his mother and sister. Looking down, he nearly screamed at the blood-soaked head of a blonde wolf-like beast tearing out his entrails in huge chunks and then gulping them down. He tried to scream, but there was a popping sound in the room and suddenly he couldn't catch his breath. What the hell? His dad's voice came from the direction of the living room. And with a growl and a flash, the beast stood up on its hind legs and charged in that direction. Brian's last thought before death took him was the beast's aura was blood red with angry orange streaks. It was nearly ten in the evening when Lance set the last piece of the furniture from the truck down in Cassandra's bedroom. It was a heavy walnut hutch for the top of a matching dresser. He cheated outrageously while nobody was looking and used his witcheries to get more done than he was normally possible and that left him nearly as tired and sweaty as his dad and uncle. Cassie carried a box into the room and stopped to look at him closely. He knew he wasn't exactly hard on the eyes, but right now he was in need of a long hot shower and wanted to get out of his sweat-soaked tank top, but dared not remove it lest someone ask about the scars again. What bothered him was the hungry expression he saw in the girl's eyes as she gave him a long and appraising look. That look surged through his gut, identifying her as another witchkin. It reminded him of what he told his stepmother. He wasn't so much worried about meeting the right girl as he was the wrong one. Everything in his body and mind told him that this girl was definitely the wrong one. He looked over to her and asked without a hint of embarrassment, Do you need help assembling the bed frame? Cassie followed his gaze to the matching walnut headboard and footboard and said, If you don't mind, I'm not very mechanically orientated. He got to the impression that she was more than capable of doing the job herself. No problem, Lance told her as he looked around the room. Where do you want it? How about right where it is? Are you sure? He asked. If you decide it doesn't work there... It can be a bear to tear down and move, especially if you have to do it by yourself. The headboard is right where I want it, she said. 
shrugging. He pulled the footboard back to the right length. Here, hold this in place. When she was in position, he pulled out the side rails and inserted the hooks in the slots. Then, he lay out the slats before moving the iron springs into place. After that, he wrestled the mattress onto them and then stood up. There. You are stronger than you appear, she said with a smile. And he shrugged and said, uh, Working with Dad and with the weights at school has its advantages. Are all the men in your family like you? She asked. He chuckled wryly. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. She walked over to the door and looked both ways down the hall. Satisfied that nobody could hear them, she replied, Witchkin. She quickly added, Your stepmother told us uh, about you being attacked. It sounded like something that only another witchkin could live through. It was his turn to go look both directions down the hall. Still not satisfied, he let his hearing drift downstairs to find all of the adults evidently sitting around the table talking. Looking back at her, he shook his head and said, It was, and no, as far as I know I'm the only one for the past three generations. Uh, you? She nodded and said, Mother is, so am I. So is my aunt Louvray, mother's twin sister. But we don't talk about Louvray. I think mother is scared of her. Want to tell me about it? He asked, pulling out the stool for all vanity and sitting. She nodded, sat cross-legged on the bed and said, It all happened so fast. First, when I was about six, my father, whose name was Ian, was killed by an animal attack on our farm in Jevaudan. Ian isn't a common French name. Lance pointed out. She smiled and said, He was Irish. She continued her tale. My Aunt Louvray came to live with us to help Mother get settled after Papa died. I knew that my mother was not pleased with Louvray being there. As I said earlier, I think Mother was more than a little bit afraid of her. I know she set off something in my own nerves. It left me thumbing unpleasantly. I later learned that that was a natural reaction to another arcane who was not friendly. <sighs> Sighing, she told Lance. <sighs> I miss my papa terribly. Louvray would go out of her way to insult not only papa but his memory as well. She never used his name but called him that filthy Irishman. It was clear that she hated him. I tried to tell mother that I didn't like the way Aunt Louvray spoke. And mother would only tell me to be patient that Louvray wouldn't be with us forever. At first, I didn't understand what she meant. At least not until she woke me in the middle of the night, holding two bags. She ushered us quietly out of the house and down to the train station, arriving just as the train to Paris pulled in. I could have sworn I heard that same horrible howling as I had on the night Papa was killed. It frightened me, and I was only about six. I clung to Mother for support. With a tone of wonder, she continued. Thinking back on the whole trip, I realise now just how closely Mother had timed things. There was no wait at the train station. Again, we cleared customs at the airport so quickly that my memories of the events are hazy at best. I remember us boarding the Concorde for New York City. I remember Mother saying, twice the speed of sound should give us a good head start. It was a strange journey on which I found myself impossibly sleepy. For nearly a week, my mind was in a haze. And I didn't come out of it until we were in Konsk, in a small house on the outskirts of Salem, Massachusetts. Is that where you realised you were a witchkin? Lance asked. She smiled, and Lance knew this girl was well aware of how to use her sexuality. After a while, Mother started by hiring an English tutor for me. And from there, she found tutors in other areas. Other areas? Magic. She said with a sly grin and coquettish look. You may be a witchkin, but I'm a witch. Lance nodded and thought of Angelique Quintin Ni Dubois, aunt to Grandmother Kate, and the only other actual witch that he knew. And she was, of course, also a vampire. I've had a very little experience with witches. So, what is it that you do? She asked. He just smiled and said, I kill things that attack my family and friends. She gave him a shocked look and said, If you don't want to tell me, that's fine. There is no need to become angry. He laughed. I'm not angry. He asked what I do. Well, 
That's what I do. It seems that I attract other arcane who for some reason go after my family and friends. I usually take an axe to them. He stopped a moment and then added, Come to think about it, almost every arcane creature I've encountered, I've used an axe at some point or another. Why? She asked. He chuckled. Mainly because it's there. I have my own shooters and are never stressed using an axe. But I guess it has a certain psychological advantage. You pick up an axe and start walking around towards someone. It's going to make them pause for a moment. They think. This is going to hurt. A lot. You don't sound like other boys I've met. Cassandra repeated something several girls had told him. That's because I'm not. I have a plan for life. And I'm working very hard to see it through. Plan? Yeah, he told her. My first goal is to get an appointment at the Naval Academy of Annapolis. And after that? She asked. I want to be like Larry, a CB. I just want to be an officer too. Mary Beaumare sat down in one of the more comfortable chairs in her parlour and looked at the gathering of some of the most prominent names in Mobile Bay area, as well as the Witchkin of no mean ability. The names present were York, Darling, Farriage, Galliard, and Russell. Much to her pleasure and surprise was the presence of the Dubois in their midst, in the person of the youngest of the six siblings, Kiernan. She smiled at the man who was forever stuck at sixteen, and with his blonde hair, Dubois blue eyes and good looks. The real irony of this situation was that he looked so much like his extended nephew, Lance, that were they dressed similarly, that a soul would be hard pressed to tell the two apart. Thank you all coming on such short notice, she began. But we have an issue building that I would like us all to deal with before it gets out of hand. You mean the family that was slaughtered down near Bayou La Batre last night? Sonia Russell asked. You know about that? Marie asked, somewhat surprised. Sheriff Ledbetter was supposed to inform her before revealing this kind of information. The tall, dark-haired woman frowned and said, Only because I stopped by there this afternoon to check on one of my students. It's not like Brian to miss school. When I got there, I was quietly informed by the deputy on duty that the family had been attacked and slain by some kind of large animal. That is the second attack in two days. Mary told her. Night before last, there was a young hunter killed just south of Big Creek Lake. Sheriff Ledbetter says that a large dog or wolf. She looked over at Russell and asked, Sonia, I don't mean to point any fingers, but I just want to make sure that this was not something to do with your pack. A perfectly reasonable question, Mary, Sonia replied, obviously feeling that the use of her given name gave her some same privilege. No. Nobody in your pack is responsible for this, although I will tell you that the young man I stopped to check on was on the verge of his own Witchkin endowments coming, active. That's why I was keeping an eye on him. Any idea what kind? Mary asked, troubled by the news. Witchkin endowments were rare enough that finding a sport among the non-Witchkin population was usually the cause of some celebration. No, not really, Sonia replied. Although I think he was starting to show some sensitivity towards seeing Aurus. Uh, how do you know? Jean Galliard asked. Sonia smiled and said, I am his language arts teacher. Earlier this year he wrote a short story with monsters in it. He nailed the Aurus perfectly. Any idea what killed them? I mean, besides a large wolf. Vivian Darlin asked, concern evidence in her voice. She had two children, just a little older than the collie boy. If I may, Kinan Dubois said. You have some information, Kinan? Marie asked. The man nodded and replied. Yes, as you know, most of my family has been called away to deal with other problems in Europe at this time. Most of it is tied up with the Soviets, but it was a particular problem that Loop and I were asked to look into. Both of the Chastel heirs have disappeared from France. Loop is continuing his part of search over there, but I'm following a lead that led first to Salem, and now to here in the bay. Uh, refresh my memory, Victoria York asked. Who are the Chastels? One of the more pure lycanthropic lines in all of the world. They trace their line back to the beast of Gévaudan. 
I thought Chastel was the man who killed the beast. Mary interjected. He was, Kiernan replied. But the beast he killed was his own brother, who had been driven insane by a witch. It was a mercy killing, and nearly shattered the family. The Chastels have always been careful of protecting the purity of their bloodlines, only taking mates from packs who could trace their lineage back to medieval European nobility. But one of their heirs took a common Irish farmer and drew it as a husband. I bet that went over well. The sarcasm in Victoria's voice was clear. Like a skunk at a picnic, Kinnan told her. We believe that one of the heirs killed her brother-in-law and is now chasing her sister and daughter down to finish cleansing the bloodline. They take their bloodlines that seriously? Victoria asked. You have no idea, Sonia said. And from her tone, it was clear that she had had some run-ins with the other shifters over the idea of keeping the bloodlines clean. Mary knew that problem with that idea was that it tended to breed in unwanted traits as well. Those so-called pure bloodlines produced quite a few insanities and even more physical birth defects. Could these attacks be from one of the Chastels? They could, Kinnan replied. It's even probable. Well, it was rather rude of them to come to our city unannounced and bring their conflict with them, Patrick Ferry Arch commented for the first time. I don't think they care, Patrick, Marie told the Sea Folk leader with some surprise that he had even spoke up. The Sea Folk were not known for inserting themselves into other people's conflicts. And what is your plan for dealing with these werewolves? Marie asked Kinan. The one who is killing people? I'm likely to feel so full of silver that next full moon, her body will catch fire. And what if they are all killing people? Jean asked. I'll deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis, but these attacks on the population cannot be allowed to continue. They will expose us all, the blonde replied, his eyes shifting from sky to ice blue. They are too close to a particular treasure we have only recently reclaimed. You mean the McKnight boy? Sonia asked. It was Kiernan's turn to look surprised. How do you know about that? Sonia chuckled and said, <laughs> Nobody kills the guana without the rest of us knowing about it. Add in a thing that was breaking necks and ripping out people's throats, we tend to take notice. Like you said, indiscriminate killings could expose us all. And so we should leave this up to you? Mary asked. I wouldn't go that far, Kiernan said. If you see something and you can deal with the situation. Don't hesitate to defend yourself or the crutches. That is, if you can do so without giving away who and what you are. Understood, Patrick said. I knew Brian Colley. He was a good kid, and his family were hard-working good people too. And of course, nobody was going to correct Dubois on the use of pejorative crunches for non-witchkin. Is there anything else? Sonia asked. Not from me, Mary answered. Anybody else need to bring something to our attention before we close this thing down? When everyone shook their heads, she then said, In that case, let's adjourn to the dining room where Donaldson has prepared an excellent brunch for us. I was hooked at the word brunch, Kiernan said. Why am I not surprised? Patrick commented as he came up to the young man. It is good to see you again, Kiernan. Ah, you too, Patrick. How's Maureen? Ha <laughs> ha, you know Maureen. About this time of year, she gets restless, wants to head to deeper water. Why don't you? Kinnan asked. Ah, uh, because it's not safe right now, the Nixie replied. There have been some incidents out in the Soto Canyon. Many of her people have started to give the bay a wide berth. Well, keep me informed, Kinnan said. If I or one of my brothers or sisters can do anything to help, let us know. Ushering the blonde out of the room, the older man smiled at Kinnan and told him, Ah, the thought is most appreciated. In the movies and pulp novels, these kinds of meetings are portrayed as just an exchange of code phrases and then the two operatives would get down to business. In reality, this meeting required at least an hour of observing and counting small movements, before the first contact was even made. Then, there had to be an exchange of complicated code phrases before they could sit down and discuss the business at hand. 
settling into one of the empty tables at an unused classroom at GCU. She studied her contact. He was in his mid to early thirties with brown hair that he pulled back into a short ponytail. Behind his overly large glasses were a set of magnified brown eyes that gave him an owlish look. He wore a grey leisure suit, a black patent leather boots with platform heels. How can I help you, Miss Chastel? he asked. I've been asked by one of the academy deans to give you as much assistance as I can. Louvrain knew that. Being asked meant ordered, but she saw no need to press the issue. How much has the academy informed you of my mission? she asked. That your primary mission is to end a taint to the Chastel bloodline, and your secondary mission is to gain more information on the one Lancelot McKnight. A succinct answer, Louvray appreciated that. What can you tell me about the arcane side of this city? The man passed her a folder and then leaned back and fell into lecture mode. But this lecture was one that he had never given in class. Technically, this is two cities, forming a great Mobile Bay metropolitan area. On the north side of the bay is Gulf City, and on the northwest side is the city of Mobile. They meet at the Spanish River. I do not need a geography lesson, she snapped at the man. Understood. He replied, not in the least flustered by her comment. However, to understand how deep the arcane is buried in this city, you must understand its history to a certain extent. There are very old and very influential lines of power that run deep into the fabric of both cities. Lines of financial power, governmental power and arcane power. At the center of that web is Mrs. Mary Beaumere. She pretty much knows about everything that goes on in the Witchkin population here, and nothing happens among the Witchkin in which she does not have a say. At least until recently. Recently? Louvray asked. I think recent events are why the Academy asked you to observe McKnight. My initial information suggested he was still a child. Yet you are here to eliminate a child, Bass suggested. He understood the politics of the Academy better than she gave him credit for. Her assessment of him just rose. Yes, he is only a child, if a 14-year-old can be considered a child. But he is powerful enough to defeat two dogmen, one of which was fate-bound to his family, and then a vampiric entity created by Lord Westhall. Louvray gave the man a surprised look. He has fought one of Westhall's creations and managed to live? Yes told her. Any idea of what endowments he may possess? She asked. We're unsure. All we know is that he uses an axe to remove the head of anything that he kills. An axe? She asked, somewhat surprised. Could the axe itself be an arcane object? He shook his head and said, we don't think so. We don't have enough information to make a determination, but we believe the axe he used on the first and last arcane creature was different from the one he used in Kentucky. Kentucky? Nodding, Bass replied. The second incident involved him and several other children caught up in an academy hunt in Kentucky. We lost two hunt masters and both specimens. Nodding, Louvray asked. And this Mary Beaumere did not approve of the contact. From what we can tell, the events caught her completely unaware. Now she's watching the city rather carefully. She doesn't like surprises. Well, I've left her a few more, Livre said. Do you have any information that might be useful in finding Macy or Cassandra? The man shook his head and said, No, not at this time. We're talking about a metropolitan area over a million people that covers three states. Seeming to notice that Louvre was about to protest, he held up a hand and added, But I've got some people working on it right now. They're going through new applicants for utilities. I don't understand, she told him. If she's new to the area, it will be necessary for her to have the utilities turned on. Now, I don't expect her to use her real name, but I have some people who are very good at noticing patterns and who have surprising success rates from hunches. We are also looking at the schools for transfers of students from Salem. Louvre's estimation of the man's competence was again raised. He was looking at details she had not considered. Thank you for that, she told him. It's my pleasure, Miss Chastel, he replied. 
She smiled back at him and then looking at the folder. She opened it to find a map with the important sites marked with color-coded symbols, including the location of Bon Travel. There were a series of phone numbers and color-coded passwords to use for covert contact. Finally, there was a stack of money, a driver's license, and necessary papers. She looked up at Bass and asked, No information or weapon caches? Those are marked in infrared ink, he told her. She growled out a smile and let her eyes shift to that amber of her wolf form and studied the map again. It made all the difference in the world. Now, not only were the places marked, but there was detailed information next to each of the dots. Furthermore, it was written in a rather formal and stilted French, not the standard Parisian taught in schools across the globe. As you wish, Bass told her. If there is nothing else, I am quite satisfied for now, she replied as she rose from the table and offered her hand. In one afternoon, you have been far more helpful than the last six months in Salem. He stood and shook her hand gently. It is my pleasure to assist you in your endeavours, Miss Chastel. It is not often we deep cover operatives get much of a chance to actually aid in an active mission. It is a welcome change. Louvray nodded and studied the man. He did not appear to be either fawning nor starstruck, but seemingly genuinely glad to be of assistance. She decided that she actually respected this man, if not liked him. It was a pleasant change all on its own. Leaving the university, she headed east across the bay towards Bon Traval. Louvray found that she rather liked these twin cities set on the Gulf Coast. Both had a very French feel to them, and many streets and institutional names owned the French explorers who had braved much hardship to see the area settled. Exiting the highway that crossed the bay, known to the locals as the Bay Way, she entered Spanish Fort. She followed the directions on her map down Highway 98 until she reached the city of Dauphin. It was there she pulled off the highway onto the surface streets of Gulf City proper. Traffic was a bit more than she expected, but she was able to find a nice little out-of-the-way bookstore in the Belle Forest district with the unlikely name of La Bibliothèque Magique. Bookstore and coffee shop. Smiling at the name, she entered, ordered a coffee and tart, and sat down to study the map and the file. It was weak on information about McKnight, something that made sense if they were asking her to study him but strong on data about the plantation Bon Traval and its rather sordid history. There was a note that the whole of the estate except for the farm manager's house was held in a trust by the Dubois. The latter was owned by one Kendall McKnight, evidently Lars's father. She briefly wondered what could bring the Dubois to cut up the property. Suggestions that the McKnights were descendants of the Dubois might explain it, but little else would. The map of the estate was actually a photograph taken from either an aircraft or a very good satellite. The main house as well as the manager's house were both labelled along with the rice and cotton fields. She noted that there were small copse of trees, perhaps a hundred metres wide, that ran along the banks of the Peridido River. The copse of trees would be a good place for her to employ her therianthropic senses to study the monk nights. She smiled to herself as the possibility of a hunt began to permeate her being and she was the quintessential hunter at the top of the food chain. This wouldn't be a hunt to kill, not yet at least. This was a hunt for information and a chance to pit her stealth and stalking skills against another witchkin. It was almost as exciting as her other hunt. And so, she waited until nearly sundown. Then she drove her rental to a small park on the south side of the estate and entered the forest there. At one point, she passed through an ancient graveyard, long since abandoned. Something about the old mausoleum, whose door was shattered on the ground, and a replacement far newer than the surrounding stone, bespoke of some recent intrusion. She wondered if this was where the Westhall's creature had hidden itself while it stalked the boy. Slipping past the heavy stone foundation of the old house long since taken by fire, time and the elements, she noted again that there was a sense of great violence being routed upon the land here. And by the time she had made her way past them and into the copse of trees she had seen on the map, the sun was well down. In the darkness, she slipped from her clothes and folded them neatly into the bag she carried. Stowing that into the crook of a tree, she partially released the wolf in her soul. 
It wasn't a complete transformation that a wolf craved, but something far closer to human than wolf, but no less dangerous. And it cost her. It cost her in pain as she held back the beast from making the more radical changes, and that left her sore in her bones. She could feel the forest around her become silent as she stalked the edge of the tree line and watched the strange house on stilts where the boy lived. Currently, there were several cars parked alongside the drive. A fire was burning in a pit, and the smell of cooked meat wafting down from it nearly turned her stomach. Strains of what the Americans called country music could be heard from a group of musicians in a circle around the fire. Louvrea did not care for it. It was the music of peasants and what the Americans called blue-collar workers. It was not fit music for the nobility of the wolf. Four long moments she sat there, Nah. No. For long moments she sat there and watched the people move around the yard, with several going up into the house to bring out food, drink and musical instruments. As the east wind continued to carry the smells from the gathering, she found herself nearly overwhelmed by a surprised rage when two scents hit her like a bull. Macy and her misbegotten brat were here. The wolf inside her became stronger. Much like her, it had been too long denied its prey, and now it would feast on her heart's blood. Tonight, her long quest would finally be over. The brat and her sister would be dead, and the stain on the Chastel bloodline would be erased. A low growl erupted from her throat, as in the distance she saw Macy in a protective embrace of another man. Her sister had now gone entirely too far. The shame could only be wiped away with blood. The blood of her sister, of her niece, and that of Macy's new Pamramor, and of anyone who tried to interfere. She began to stalk back and forth, slipping in and out of the fields, which had already been burnt as part of the post-harvesting process. There was no way she could approach the gathering without being spotted by at least Macy, if not the brat and McKnight. Finally, she gave in to the wolf and let it take its shift to full wolf form. As usual, the pain was horrific as her bones snapped and reformed into a new shape. Her skin split from her body and was absorbed by the emerging fur and muzzle. This would attract far less attention until she could get closer. She and the wolf agreed on that. Ghost Riders in the Sky! Ghost Riders in the Sky! Lance then picked out a few last chords of the song, and looked around to the other pickers and smiled wanely. Damn it, boy! Where the hell did you hear that? His dad asked. I mean, I don't think I've heard that song since you were born. Lance shrugged and said, I think I got it off one of your Marty Robin albums. And you figured how to pick it out just by listening to the record? It took me a while, but like you always say, music is just ABC, one, two, three. He told his dad. You know, I wish somebody like Johnny Cash would do it someday. His dad stopped to think about what he said, and finally replied with a big smile. <laughs> that would be good. Lance looked over at his friend standing next to Cassie, listening to the pig in circle. The only one not surprised was Ted Galliard, who was in a circle with him. The two had been working on the song for about two weeks now, and they thought this would be a good time to perform it. Lance had no idea how prophetic that decision was. If you guys will excuse me, he stood and leaned his second-hand guitar against the inside of the trailer behind them as he headed over to where Bobby, Paul and Pete were standing next to Cassie. Lance got the feeling that his new cousin had already won over a couple of hearts, or at least hormones. That was awesome. Didn't know you could play like that, Bobby said. Lance smiled at him and said, Remind me to play for you the Battle of Ball Run someday, Bobby. Not really my kind of music, but I have to admit that you guys are pretty good, Paul told them. Lance shrugged and said, Ted and I have tossed around the idea of starting a band, but the only place our musical interests meet is Southern Rock, and we need more than just two guitars. He blushed and added, Neither of us have much of a voice. We can stay on key and all, but it's nowhere near what you call smooth. You seem to be doing fine tonight, Cassandra said with a smile. Lance shrugged and said, Only because we've been practicing that song for two weeks. Then looking around, he asked, 
Did you guys get some burgers or dogs? Man, your family really puts on a spread. You do this all the time? Paul asked. About every other weekend, Lance said. I spend the other off weekends with my mum over in Tillman's Corner. Sucks when your parents split up, Pete said. Yeah, Lance told him. I had to learn that the hard way. That it wasn't my fault or my job to fix. Those caretaker instincts your stepmom warned you about, Pete asked. Lance nodded and looked around at the gathering. Beneath the swarms of insects around in the floodlights and the bats dive in to eat them. There were at least ten adults and their children. They were either in small circles talking and eating or listening to the music. There were groups of kids chasing lightning bugs at one edge of the house and his stepmom, Uncle Larry and Macy were sitting on the deck drinking, smoking and talking about the Bay Area. Outside of his friends, everyone here were all family. His dad and Ted had just started trading cords on Freebird again. Suddenly, a familiar urge and surge went through his gut. He watched as Cassandra sniffed next to Paul. From above them, he heard Macy call out, Cassandra? Down here, Mum, Cassandra answered. She looked over at Lance, obviously wanting to ask him something. I felt it too, he answered the unspoken question. What? Bobby asked. Do me a favour, guys. Go get the kids to come back into the light. I want to check something out. What? Bobby demanded, worried. I'm not sure. I've just suddenly got a bad feeling. He paused and added. Like when we were in Kentucky. His three friends suddenly became all business. Where? Pete demanded. Uh, towards the river, he told them. Figures. Everything seems to come from the east around here. We'll get the kids, Pete said. What are you going to do? I'm going to have to have a look. The floodlights and the fire are making it hard to see from here. Why don't you and your friends come up here? Macy called. We're going to collect the younger ones first, Cassandra replied. Good idea, her mum answered as Lance turned toward the tree line to see what was to be seen. Reaching into the edge of the darkness, he stepped into it and the idea came to him. He didn't want anything out there to know he may or may not suspect something, so when he was several yards from the light, he unzipped and proceeded to relieve himself on the ground. As he had done the night he'd fought, Opal, he'd once again shifted his eyes, increasing the number of rods in them, and reshaping his tapetum and cornea so that most of the colour washed out of the world. It did, however, allow him to see quite well as he scanned the tree line. In the distance, he saw a huge dog or wolf moving quietly towards the north side of the house. He felt that surge in his gut again and realised the wolf had spotted him. Willing himself not to act startled, he pretended he saw nothing as he zipped up and turned back to the house. If this was what he thought it was, keeping what he was about to happen a secret was going to be nigh impossible. Making a beeline towards the picking circle, he tapped his dad on the shoulder. When his father turned back to see what he wanted, Lance leaned in and said, We need to get everyone inside, or at least on the deck. What? His dad asked, somewhat confused. There's something out there, and it's heading this way. What Lance was trying to tell him finally sank in to his father's mind. He nodded and said, This fire's getting a bit warm. Why don't we move up onto the deck? It is kind of warm out here, Lance said as he projected his will into the thought. Suddenly, the pickers started to sweat and pull at their collars, the command draped over them. Good idea, Ken, his aunt Bonnie said, picking up the songbook in one hand and the back of a lawn chair in the other. Suddenly, another surge of otherworldly tension shot through the gathering, and they picked up their instruments, chairs and beers, and headed towards the deck. Ted looked at Lance somewhat confused. Would you take my guitar up there for me, Ted? Lance asked. The other boy nodded and asked, What's going on? Lance shook his head and asked, You got your camera? Ted shook his head and said, No. Good, Lance told him. Just go with my dad and the others. Do me a favour. If something funny starts happening, don't let anybody interfere. You're starting to scare me, Lance, Ted said. Good, he replied. I want you to be scared. Scared enough that you don't do something that's going to get you hurt. The Gwiner's back, isn't it? Ted demanded. 
I hope not, Lance told him. Just do as I ask. Ted's eyes became fear bright, and Lance could see his nostrils begin to flare. He nodded, grabbed Lance's guitar, and made a beeline to where everyone else was climbing the stairs. As Ted reached the top, only Paul, Peter and Bobby were left on the ground. What do you want us to do? Suddenly, a howl split the night air, and in the distance Lance could hear bones popping and low grunts and growls. Stay here! Make sure nobody comes after me! Lance told him as he took off at a dead run. Before he made it to the edge of the floodlights, a huge creature covered in honey blonde fur came loping out of the shadows, its yellow canine eyes intent on something on the deck. The damn thing was nearly as big as a guaina and was shaped pretty much the same, with one exception. This one had no tail. Dropping to his shoulder, he launched himself directly into the giant animal's path and with a loud thud, the two went down in a tangle of arms, legs, fur and fangs. The werewolf had more mass, but Lance had more speed when the two collided, and that cancelled out the momentum from both of them. They hit the ground, rolling, until they collided with the tool shed with a loud bang. A flurry of claws tore Lance's shirt to tatters as the wolf straddled his hips and raked him repeatedly. He smelled blood as he twisted under the great beast and heaved it off him. Staggering to his feet, he looked down to see where the werewolf had opened him up a good several places. With some satisfaction, he noted that the wounds were beginning to close. Then, looking up, he saw the beast stare at him and growl low. I don't know what you want, but you're not getting it. The beast looked up to the deck and growled. Who do you want up there? Lance demanded. The creature raised an arm and then with a clawed forefinger, it pointed to where Cassandra was standing at the railing. Something seemed to be off up there. The only people moving was Cassie and her mother. There was no more sound coming from the deck. No conversation, no screams, nothing. He shook his head and said, She's family now. You mess with her, you have to go through me first. Lance could have sworn he saw the beast shrug once, just before it charged him. It leapt at him with arms spread wide, claws deployed. Lance sidestepped the attack and lashed out with his hand, grabbing the beast by one hairy arm. He latched down on the arm, twisted in place and sent it spinning back into the darkness. You got any idea why this thing wants you, Cassie? It's my sister, Macy said with a low growl. I'm sorry you were involved in this, Lance. It was never my intention to put you and your family in danger. Her voice became lower and her words nearly growled out. Mom! Cassandra screamed. No! Again the beast came charging out of the darkness full tilt and leapt high into the air. Suddenly, another blonde creature leapt from the deck. Two hulking beasts met in midair in a collision that bounced them off the cement blocks of the house before they hit the sandy ground where Lance was standing. Growling and snarling, the werewolves tore into each other. Lance had no idea which one was which as they rolled across the ground. Separating at the edge of the light, they began to circle each other, growling and snarling in defiance. I can't tell them apart! Lance looked up to his new cousin. And what he saw on the deck made his blood run cold. Everyone on the deck seemed to be in some kind of trance, struck dumb mid-sentence. Only Peter, Paul and Bobby were moving. Lance noted that Paul had retrieved the axe from the fire pit. Nodding to Lance, the other boy tossed him the axe and said, Thought you might need this. What's going on? Bobby demanded. Lance shook his head and said, I have no idea. That thing wants to hurt Cassie. The other is her mother. You have weird relatives. You know that, Lance. Paul teased. I'm starting to realize that, Lance told him. But I have no idea what happened to everyone. I happened to them, Cassandra said from the stairs as Brandy came bounding out of the house, growling for some reason. The pity seemed to be immune to whatever had frozen everyone else. My aunt has been hunting us down for years. Now it's time we turn the table. Lance didn't like the tone of Cassandra's voice. Louvre, you want to hunt? I'll give you a hunt, she said angrily. Then she started chanting in what sounded to Lance like Gaelic, but he couldn't be sure. There was definitely a lot of aspirated vowels in it. Cassandra, what are you doing? Lance asked, 
suddenly worried as the wind started to raise around them, whipping leaves, embers and her hair in some kind of twisting vortex. Lance's blood ran cold when he heard the name Senonus invoked. This was not going to end well. A sharp pain suddenly shot throughout his body as he felt himself growing and expanding. Blinding pain split his skull as blood began to roll down his eyes. He felt something inside him awaken as his head became heavy. Next to him, Brandy was suddenly growing, becoming massive and black. Her eyes turned fiery green and flames of the same colour began to snort from her nose. She looked back at Lance and nodded as if she knew something he did not. Then, to his horror, Paul, Peter and Bobby began to scream in pain as they too shifted. Their bones began to snap and pop as they broke and reformed into new configurations. He watched them become a huge black version of the two beasts that were fighting in the field, their eyes glowing the same eerie green as Brandy's. And behind him, Cassandra's chanting ended and then, in a voice that dipped in anger and hatred, she said, Now my wild hunt! Run her to the ground! Suddenly, Lance was no longer in control of himself. A new force had entered his mind. An alien power like he'd never experienced before shot through his body and he rose into the air, holding an axe in his hand high above his head. He raised the horn to his lips that appeared in his other hand. The call of the hunter's horn echoed off the bay and the hounds in front of him surged forward. Looking over to where the two werewolves were engaged, he saw the hounds tear them away from each other. And suddenly, one of them looked up in fear and broke into a run as three human-shaped and one dog-shaped hounds tore off after it. Lance felt himself pulled along with the hunt as if he were on a sled or chariot pulled by the hounds. The werewolf turned north and tried to lose them in the concrete canyons that made up Gulf City. The hounds, however, seemed to be able to fly effortlessly over rivers, logs and obstacles that the she-wolf was forced to go around or over. Pelting down the streets, leaping from car roof to car roof, brick wall to lamppost and then back to car roofs, Louvre sought to escape the wild hunt that pursued her for hours. Every now and then and again, someone would glimpse the hunt in a particular manner and suddenly found themselves caught up as one of the hunters being led by the hounds. Lance found that he had little control over the situation as he was pulled across the bay and down the streets of Mobile. He noted with some irony when they passed his mother's house in Tillman's Corner. Then the hunt continued south, eventually to cross the bridge of Dolphin Island. It was here that the hunt ended, with the werewolf frightened and exhausted her back to the sea. She stood defiantly in the sandy beach and howled defiance as the sun began to rise in the east. The hound surged forward and in a god awful melee of claws and fangs, the werewolf was torn to pieces and dragged in opposite directions. The huge beast that had been brandy brought the head of the werewolf and dropped it at Lance's feet. As the head shifted back to human form, Lance felt the spell release all of them. The world suddenly shifted sideways, and he, his friends and Brandy suddenly found themselves back at his house where the hunt had begun. As he returned to his own form, he felt two knots of bone retract into his forehead. In his mind's eye, he could see a well-built man with green hair and with deer antlers coming out from above each eye. In one hand he held a snake, and in the other a golden talk. Well met and good hunt, young Lancelot it said in his mind. Those who have been touched by the hunt and survive are never the same again. The presence was very hesitant to leave him and Lance was forced to call on the other half of his joined soul to push it out. Looking around he saw where Peter, Paul and Bobby were picking themselves up from the sandy ground. Oh, what the hell just happened? Bobby demanded. Lance looked over to where Cassie and her mother were standing a look of trepidation on both of their faces. Is everyone all right? Cassie asked. I'm with Bobby. What the hell just happened? Peter added. We were caught up in a wild hunt, Lance told them. Although it's the wrong time of year for it. 
Then, turning to Cassie, he said in a voice that dripped ice, Don't ever do that again. I'm sorry, Cassandra said, chewing on one finger now, suddenly looking small and vulnerable. Lance chuckled. This girl really did understand how to use her sexuality. He was unsure if it was conscious or not, but she used it well. Just don't ever do something like that again. I thought that thing was going to take up permanent residence. What thing? Peter asked. The master of the hunt. It seemed to like being inside me. It didn't want to leave. I'm sorry, Cassie said again, really pouring on the shrinking violet act. And stop that, Lance told her. You aren't helpless, and after tonight, I say you don't need to be protected. Dropping the act, she looked over at her mother and said, This one really is brighter than most. Shh, Cassandra, Macy said, You're giving away the secrets. What about everyone up there? Bobby asked. They are just now realizing that they've spent a very pleasant evening talking and listening to music, Cassie told them. I'm not sure about giving away Lance's secrets. That much is appreciated, Lance told her. Was it really all that bad? Cassie asked. Yes, four boys answered vehemently and in unison. Wow, wow, absolutely intense, spine-tingling werewolf action there. And as you guys know, I really, really do love and enjoy the werewolf stories the most, the dogman stories the most. Uh, just absolutely heart-pacing and uh, wonderfully written stuff there, Wayne. Thank you so, so much, brother, for all you have done for the show, the input and uh, advice behind the scenes as well. Really, 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 really is appreciated. Guys and girls, you know the drill by now. Please, as ever, do let us know what you thought down below in the comments. Please do share and like. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, we're trying to smash our way through that 30,000 subscriber mark. We can only do that with your help, your pushes of your likes and shares. Remember, if you yourself have a story you'd like to share with us here on the show, whether it's true or fictional piece, you can get that over to me on the website, which is www.dmtforestoffear.com and go to the Submit Report or Story page. I hope you're all well and happy and having a wonderful weekend with friends and family and good food. And as ever, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>